the future. But uh, uh, it's been a strong year in terms of our ability to uh, move these issues forward uh, for the, it, it, by both protecting security and looking out for the interests of the cybersecurity industry at the same time. Um, so uh, I'm supposed to also talk about uh, you. You, what was I supposed to raise? Oh, the trip hazards because we have these cords on the ground. So oh, so I should also say. It's very exciting to be back in person. Last year we did this in person, but it was only with the members of the different organizations. Um, this year we, we reopened to everybody. So um, with that, uh, we, we uh, have, I wanna be able to tell people, you know, we take safety seriously here. So, um, you know, the exit, there are exits, you can go out outside and then come back in if you need to do that. There, there are exits uh, on the sides over here. Um, but you can go out this way or that way, right? Um, the women's room is halfway down the hallway. The men's room is all the way down at the other side. Sorry, guys. Um, and uh, the but watch out for the cords that are in the ground because we try to make it so that you could plug your uh, devices in. And uh, in doing that, uh, we've created some trip hazards. So please be careful as you walk the aisleways here. Um, Okay, with that, uh, I'm gonna pass things, get things started here. Um, I'm gonna hand things off to Mark Bohannon from Red Hat. Uh, Mark uh, it was uh, in, the, in the early companies to join the coalition and, and uh, really has been, you know, one thing that I think marks the coalition has been that it's, while we have staff that works on things, it's the members that really make up uh, and, and set the direction for what we do. And Mark has been extremely active and uh, a really a great member in terms of participation and in helping to guide us uh, along the way. So it's my my pleasure to pass the things on to him for to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Ari. And what Ari didn't tell you is how long we've actually known each other and how far back we go, so we won't share that. Um, I'm, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing our opening keynote speaker, for many of you in the room, and Brie, we're also doing this by video, right? <clears throat> For those of you in the digital world, uh, the internet, um, the, he needs no introduction. He is well known to all of us. Uh, Eric Goldstein is the ex ex uh, Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure, uh, CISA, I'll just say CISA. Uh, it's too early in the morning. Um, he brings an incredible wealth of knowledge, both from prior service in government, from academia, um, and, and from the private sector as well. So Eric is here, um, going to give a few brief remarks, and then I think he's going to lead, take your questions and open it for discussion. Eric, and by the way, he flew overnight from the West Coast just to be here. So please give him credit for showing up looking better than I do. And I only had a 20 minute uh, car ride from across town. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks. We'll be good. Morning folks. Uh, awesome to be here. Uh, I think it is fair to say, you know, I don't want to pick and choose between events, but uh, coalition and CTA events are some of my favorites in part because there are just so many long-standing friends and colleagues and compatriots in this room. And so it really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, as, as Mark noted, I was at our director's cybersecurity uh, advisory council uh, in Cupertino yesterday, uh, landed at Dulles at, at 2 a.m. And here we are. So we are just going to push through uh, as, as, as far and as fast as we can. Um, but the advantage of a transcontinental flight uh, is it did give me time to catch up on all of my cybersecurity reading, including the latest reports uh, from many of the companies in this room. Uh, I really particularly enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the wrong word, was interested in the report from our friends at Palo Alto on Vice Society, right? And I was reading this about the continued targeting of uh, institutions like K-12 education entities uh, by ransomware gangs. And I just sit back in my blissfully open row on my 737 uh, and said, you know, gosh, this problem just isn't getting any better. The trajectory of risk still isn't moving the way that we want it to, right? We still see adversaries too often 
acting with impunity. We still see too many organizations that are critical to our country, to our people, to our way of life, being targeted and suffering serious harm. And so the question for all of us, and the great thing about cybersecurity is we are all unified in this calling about what do we do about it? And, you know, from from our perspective at CISA, and I think this is likely widely shared, you know, we really see three key areas for shared progress, for shared maturation. The first is it remains the case that for too many organizations, it is too difficult to figure out where to invest the next marginal security dollar. So organizations that are, as we call it, target rich, resource poor, or target rich, investment poor, differentiation that I'll get into in a minute, it is too challenging to figure out where do we invest to knock out the most classes of attacks in a way that can make us sure that in a resource constrained environment, we are having the most impact on our security and resilience. And that's why, as I'll get into the work we are doing as a community on our cybersecurity performance goals with great help and support from the ITSEC and the coalition among others uh, is, so, is so critical. The second key piece is it remains the case that too many technology products can't be differentiated based upon their security by design or security by default, which means when organizations are figuring out when to make their next technology investment, they're not able to differentiate based upon the important investments in security that many companies in this room are making in their product security every day, which means, unfortunately, too many products are being deployed across nation's critical infrastructure that are not fit for purpose, that are not secure enough to be deployed for the critical functions that they are supporting. And the third piece is, as we evangelize the most important controls and security measures to be adopted first, as we drive the product market towards more security by design, more security by default, we need to be informed by what adversaries are actually doing. We need to be able to stand up to say, here is what the most effective steps are, and here's how we know. And we know because we see where adversaries are going. And the only way to answer that question is through what we call persistent collaboration. I'll wait for the fire engine to drive by. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to walk through each of these in turn. But but we think that if as a community, we can make progress in each of these areas, help target rich, resource poor organizations, adopt the most important controls first, drive the market both towards more security by design, more security by default, but also more transparency that will help that be a differentiator in the market and keep maturing our model of persistent collaboration so that we understand what adversaries are doing and can move more quickly, not only to stop them as they undertake malicious acts, but also to inform our guidance and direction. We think that is a package of efforts that is going to result in a change in the risk curve over time. So I'll walk through each of these a bit in turn, and then I do want to leave the balance of my time for questions and for a conversation. You know, one thing that I hear when, when I talk to partners across sectors, and I'm sure each of you do as well, is for most organizations, their security budget is extraordinarily finite, right? And if they're going to make improvements, there is going to be a really small number of things that they can do in a given quarter, in a given fiscal year. And so as a, as, as a community, it's so critical that we are able to articulate, if you can only do a few things, do these things now and these things next, because that's what's going to be most effective in decreasing the maximum marginal risk. That's why President Biden uh, asked CISA to develop cybersecurity performance goals, which many of your organizations opined on. And the key thing to note about these performance goals is the performance goals in themselves don't constitute a comprehensive enterprise cybersecurity program, right? Organizations should all be building to an enterprise program built around the NIST cybersecurity framework. What these cybersecurity performance goals answer is if you need to prioritize, if you need to figure out which controls and measures and activities to do now, here's where you can start that's going to have the most impact as you build that enterprise program built around the CSF. And we think that if we can mature that model where we say, you know, even as you progress to that mature CSF-based model, here's some actions you can take now, we will enable both near-term improvement and long-term maturation. Right now, we are working on some important changes 
to the performance goals, including really excitingly, a reorientation of the goals around the NIST cybersecurity framework functions. Uh, and so again, we're really grateful to the ITSEC, to the coalition, other partners for, for bringing us great feedback. I don't know if anybody has visited our performance goal GitHub page, but there is a robust uh, discussion on there where folks from across the country and, and around the world are suggesting new goals, revised goals, and we're now in the process of kicking off the sectoral goal process. And we're going to do this really incrementally and be really stakeholder-led because, of course, one of the key precepts of the goals is that they're voluntary. And so to be voluntary and effective, they have to be useful because if they're not useful, they're not going to be used. And so just like with the cross-sector goals, we are going to do rounds of collaboration, rounds of comment, and each of these sectoral goals are going to be led by their relevant sector risk management agency, SRMA, who of course has the deepest connections and relationships within their relevant sector. And so we're going to start with, with a few sectors in the months to come and then build from there also recognizing that just supporting adoption of the cross-sector goals for many organizations and indeed many sectors is going to add a lot of value in the near term. And so the more that we can get these target-rich, resource-poor organizations to use the performance goals to figure out what to do next, where to invest this quarter, as they mature towards that robust CSF-driven enterprise program, we think that is a way to drive some really near-term improvements in the cybersecurity baseline across the country. And as a brief tangent, I do want to differentiate for a moment between target-rich, resource-poor entities and target-rich investment poor, because we do see both these categories. And what I mean is target-rich resource poor entities are, for example, uh, a K-12 independent school district, a local water utility that's rate capped, where they just don't have the financial resources to build a fully mature, fully modern, fully resourced cybersecurity program. And so they need to figure out other ways to manage their environment. Conversely, we also see organizations that likely have the, the money on the balance sheet to build a, cyber, a strong cybersecurity program, but have made investment decisions to allocate resources in other places. And as we think through our model, we need to account for both, both kinds of organizations. How do we help organizations that are never going to have the resources to adopt a fully mature cybersecurity program? How do we still help them? ensure the security and resilience of their networks, maintain critical functions, and how do we urge organizations that actually could do more to change their investment models, change their risk tolerance so, so that they invest more in their own security and manage the societal risk that occurs with systemic underinvestment in cybersecurity. But we also know that, of course, adopting enterprise controls, adopting mitigations is only part of the challenge, right? Because we know that, unfortunately, many technology products being rolled out today, as I mentioned at the outset, aren't fit for purpose for the uses to which they're being applied, right? And we have, we have a lot of examples of this, whether it is products that simply haven't gone through the right level of rigorous security testing, and so they're rolled off the shelf with vulnerabilities that are exploited by adversaries within days, or products that don't have multi-factor authentication turned on by default or actually included uh, as a cost-added option, which disincentivizes the use of, of course, that critical foundational control. And we know that that leaves organizations even less able to secure their own systems because their very technology environment was set up to fail in meaningful ways. But we also know that a lot of companies, including many in this room, are doing the right thing, are investing tremendous amounts in both security by design, which, which means actually building products with, uh, that are designed to have as few vulnerabilities as possible, are using memory-safe coding languages on down the line, and that have strong controls turned on by default. The challenge today is, if I'm that local water utility, if I'm that school district, if I'm a regional hospital, I don't know. I don't know how to choose between a product that is fit for purpose and can actually protect my infrastructure, my customers, my employees, and one that isn't. And so a key effort for, I think, our community is really to clarify what makes a technology product secure enough to be fit for purpose? How do we drive that radical transparency and actually lift up? those products, those companies, those partners that are doing it right, that are prioritizing security, that are safeguarding our country? And how do we create market incentives to help uh, purchasers, consumers differentiate between those products that are secure, those products that have the right controls, and those products that don't? But the third piece here is equally important, which is how do we come together as a community, even as we make these strategic changes, 
to actually take quicker action against new threats and new vulnerabilities and drive the guidance, the direction that we're producing based upon what adversaries are actually doing. And that's where our persistent collaboration model comes into play. And all that persistent collaboration means is we are not waiting for something to happen before we build a relationship and start working together between government and the private sector and across the private sector. We have that work going 24-7 around the clock. Uh, at CISA, we have we tried to kickstart some of this work over the past year uh, with our efforts around the Russian invasion of Ukraine, around Log4 Shell, around the midterm elections. But we have to scale, right? Because any one of our organizations, as we look at the cyber threat landscape, we're looking at it through a soda straw. And some of our soda straws are a bit bigger, smaller than others, but none of us is seeing the landscape in its inclusivity. None of us have an exhaustive view. And so the more that we can come together, work in shared platforms, work at the operational level continuously, and work together to enrich information with government being a co-equal partner, not in a privileged position, and government acting as a member of the cyber defense community in this context, not as a regulator, uh, not with any compulsory authority. We think that's a way to move more quickly, uh, tighten up our OODA loop as we react against adversaries, but also to make sure that when we stand up and say, these are the most effective controls, these are the aspects of a product that are most effective in preventing intrusions, we can back that up because we can say, here is what we see happening in the wild that supports these assertions of where to invest next. So we think that with these three areas, we're going to make real progress. We are already well on our way as a community, but we have a lot of work to do. CISA is proud to stand next to each and every one of you on this shared journey, and it really is a shared one. None of us are going to do it alone, uh, and certainly CISA is here to be your partner, your peer, as we work through it together. So with that, I'd love to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, I, first of all, before we take the questions, I'd want to say, I really uh, thank you for listening to us. I mean, it was very clear from your, evident from the comments that, that from what you said that you've read what like the comments we wrote <laughs> uh, and uh, in general the back and forth we've had on the performance goals. And we're really excited about where they're headed and and, and look forward to working with you in the next round. So, um, Sean, start with the reporters here. It's happy to see me. Hi, Eric. Thanks for, for being here. Good to, um, good to see you as well. Sean Lingus with CNN. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, you know, you read the, the Unit 42 report. Um, I'll, I'll ask about uh, different recent reporting from industry. In the past week, there's been some reports from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and um, uh, Recorded Future and others on um, Russian espionage uh, aimed at um, U.S. military contractors, um, Ukrainian military contractors, um, Polish ones. Uh, my question is, are you seeing any sort of um, shift or uh, renewal or, or surge in, in uh, Russian cyber activity aimed at collecting insights on, on, on the war as the Russians shift their strategy on the battlefield? There was also the Microsoft report uh, over the weekend. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, obviously they're always active, but is there anything that, that you see in terms of their collection tied to um to battlefield developments thanks thanks Sean. it's a good question you know as as your question noted you know we know that russian malicious cyber actors are always active attempting to compromise us and allied organizations uh we also know uh that as the war enters its winter months uh the risk of malicious cyber activity targeting the us uh, and our allies remains of extraordinarily heightened concern uh, at the moment, we are not seeing any uh, directional changes uh, in the, the prevalence or type of activity, uh, but we do remain uh, deeply concerned about that risk. And that's why certainly the U.S. government, our allies, and we'd encourage every organization to really maintain uh, an environment of heightened diligence in this time. Other questions? Okay. Ken Landfield Trellix, I have a question uh, around um, what is the intent of a lot of the uh, data that's going to be supplied as part of the incident reporting. Um, a few years ago, uh, uh, Phyllis Schneck had this idea of a weather map where you could actually see the data correlated in a, in a uh, operational view. Is that something that you're looking for internally and is that potentially you know, down the road, uh, something like that available to the community who's participating. 
That is a great question. I love when I have to trim my remarks for time, but then a question brings it back in. So thank you for that. Um, so you know, the the cyber incident uh, reporting authority that CISA is now working to implement. And first of all, thanks to everybody who submitted uh, comments through, through the, the recent RFI. Those have been just extraordinarily valuable. And so we are really grateful for them. You know, the intent really is to enable this virtuous cycle of cyber defense that I just described. And really, we have three goals with incident reporting. The first is to offer help to those who need it. And of course, U.S. government's help effort intrusion is solely voluntary, but we do want to make sure that we are able to reach out and offer help to organizations that may request it, whether it is incident response, hunting, remediation, et cetera. Um, the second is to ensure that we are rapidly sharing information that is actionable and grounded in a reliable sample of adversary activity across the country. And so that includes, of course, making sure that we are sharing IOCs and TTPs quickly, but it also means that as we are promulgating mitigations, those mitigations and controls are grounded in how intrusions are actually happening. And so right now, one of the biggest challenges I'd posit facing all of us is, you know, I'm sure every cybersecurity company in this room is offering mitigations uh, to your clients and customers, as is CISA, of course. But we are challenged to stand behind those mitigations and say, we can say authoritatively that these are the most effective mitigations against what adversaries are doing today. Because our sample size of incidents and incidents with real, you know, root cause, kill chain, miter attack framework mapping is incomplete. And so the more that we can see that from incident reporting, we can say, ah, here is how, you know, APT 41 actors are actually executing their intrusions. And we can offer much more targeted guidance and direction to help organizations manage their risk. The third is really taking a step back and saying, let's look at the broader landscape. And as we make recommendations for product security features, the most important controls that should be on by default trends in the landscape, again, grounding that in actual incidents and aggregated trends therein is going to be really impactful for the community in driving investments in the right areas. And so the takeaway there is all of our use cases for incident reporting are purely grounded in national cyber defense, right? Our goal is to use incident reporting to harden the landscape so our adversaries have increased costs before they can execute intrusions on American companies. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, take the last one. All right. Uh, just on that note, then, um, I'm Matt only in Francisco. Um, the time frame for reporting is fairly short. It was originally in 48, 72 hours. How do you expect to get actionable intelligence from these organizations that you can then turn into action in other organizations in such a turnaround time frame when it takes so long to understand what the nature of an event is anyways? Yeah, it's a great question. So we absolutely see mandatory reporting as, as the floor, not the ceiling. And so our hope would be that even when organizations are required to report within the timeframes and with the data elements eventually required in the final rule that will be released in the years to come, uh, that reporting process will then kick off a voluntary collaboration with the government. Uh, and we know that a lot of the aspirational activity that we see to drive collaboration and actually figure out what happened in an incident, you know, that needs to be uh, really a partnership. And so our goal would be that the, uh, the required reporting is not going to be in lieu of robust collaboration. It is going to be just an input into the process. I know we have a, now a bunch of other questions on this topic, but we have another panel that's waiting in the uh, virtual world no for us. Um, so uh, let's stop there and continue the conversation uh, through regular, you know, the regular channels that we've been working with you on. So really appreciate all your, your work and for coming today. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks all. So as I said, our, our next panel is, is actually a virtual one and it's a cyber luminaries one, uh, which we started in the, uh, as a virtual panel, uh, we decided like, let's get people that can't come in to this, uh, on a regular you know that they, they have, would have trouble flying in and get them to do it virtually. People liked it, so we uh, kept it going. We have them up here. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to Sam Curry, who's going to moderate this panel. Uh, yeah, we also have uh, we've had some switchovers in in uh, members of the panels this year, but uh, still really a great group of people. That I'm looking forward to hearing from.
Thank you, Ari. Um, hopefully you can all hear me in, in the room. And thanks for bearing with us as we come in from remote here. Uh, I'm joined by some really great panelists. Sam, we can't hear you yet. So uh, one second, let me see. Yeah. Can you hear me? No, I don't know if it's... I can hear you, Sam. Uh-huh. No, go again, Sam. Can you hear me now, Ari? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Excellent. Well, Josh could hear me, so we were having a, a little conversation there. Um, no, uh, so thank you all for bearing with us as we're remote. Um, we want to make this as interactive as possible, despite not being there with you in Washington. Uh, this is the third year that we're doing this, and we want to make it as interactive as possible in spite of being at a distance here. And I think we've got some great panelists. I'll be moderating, and we'll be asking some, some questions here. Uh, I think Bree and AC are going to be going around the room, and we want to encourage questions. We have I have some prepared questions, and I'm also going to encourage the panelists to talk to each other because I think that's when it gets interesting. Um, and hopefully, uh, this goes. It's not just uh, entertaining and informative. I hope it's uh, it sparks some discussion in the room afterwards. So, uh, the topics that we're going to cover, we're going to go over some. I call them topical subjects. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of the next wave of identity is something we thought we'd look at. Uh, we're going to look at secure supply chain and S-bombs, uh, building cyber talent, a little bit on cyber insurance. And at the end, um, there's a sort of glass half full or glass half empty type of question I have for everyone, uh, something they're either excited about, and I'll, and I'll frame it a little differently at the end, or something that they're concerned about. And so uh, as we go into the questions here, I'm going to give the first one to Jaya. And... Um, Please, each of the panelists, uh, we wanted to have as much time for discussion and answering questions. If you could give a brief introduction of yourself, uh, we thought about putting up a screen with your with, with our bios, but that just wastes some time. I think most people are well known. Uh, but Jaya, when you answer, if you could just give a little bit on your background for people who might not know you in the room. And the first question I'm going to say is, um, in 2022, we saw uh, the cyber cybercrime ecosystem in particular polarize um, and nation states take action around the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, my first question is, what geopolitical events do you think we should be paying attention to in 2023? And what should we be watching carefully? So if you could start with maybe a little intro on yourself and then and address that, that would be great. Sure. Uh, my name is Jaya Blue. Um, I, I'm very lucky to be the third time on this panel. So, you know, there are times of charm, I suppose. Um, I'm the CISO at Avast. And before this, I was the CISO at KPN Telecom in the Netherlands. I'm based out of Europe, um, and I have, a, I suppose now, a sort of mixed Eurocentric American approach to looking at this stuff. Um, and in terms of this answer, I think it's really difficult to prognosticate anything, considering how wrong we got it as an industry with what was supposed to happen, we thought, uh, with the initial uh, you know, cyber stuff around the invasion of Ukraine. Um, what I think is incredibly positive is the amount of support from uh, public-private corporations uh, in terms of you know, folks coming together and trying to see what they can do to help and assist and triage and threaten and tell and give licenses and support on the ground. I think that's great. But I think it actually spells towards the participatory nature of this conflict. Um, what I think is incredibly worrying is that people will log off from their day jobs, go home, and then fight uh, with anonymous or whomever uh, hacking and playing as combatants of war. I think this is a real concern. And I also think we haven't seen the worst of it yet. It's either because of hubris, because the Russians might have thought they would have you know, um, actually succeeded in closing out um, the, the invasion with very little effort and they didn't need to set in any heavy weapons or perhaps it was like what we saw where, uh, it, for example, ransomware groups, you know, like Conti, uh, decided that they weren't going to get politicized so that you know, parts of the folks that they might have um, utilized or mobilized in this effort weren't actually willing to participate in the effort. But whatever the actual rationale is, I suspect that we haven't seen everything yet and we haven't seen the final effort. So what I am concerned about, and again, it's difficult to prognosticate, but what I'm concerned about is we are going to see the use of zero days. We are going to see uh, more uh, efforts to actually, you know, further destabilize, not just physically, but in terms of cyber efforts, uh, the situation in Ukraine. And I also think it's really 
um, wrong of us if we would ignore all of the other things that are happening. I still see, uh, coming from Avast, we still see a lot of campaigns that are coming out of China. We still see campaigns, you know, popping up. We recently reported one um, also in uh, LATM. So I think that there's a lot of other stuff happening globally. And when we solely focus on Russia, I think we might miss China uh, activities. Uh, Josh and Wendy, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves with the unique questions for you in a moment, but do you want to maybe add to anything that J.S. said? Is there anything you would draw attention to, or do you want to reinforce or take issue with anything on, yeah, on the Yeah, sure. On the... Um, yeah, Wendy Nather, I lead the advisory CISO team for Cisco, and um, as a matter of fact, Ed, I, I want to take issue with the word polarization, uh, because just this sure. morning I was reading a great article by Siva Vaidyanathan uh, in the New Republic, where he talked about the situation in the United States not being so much a polarization, it looks that way if you're just mapping red against blue, but it's really, you know, there, there is a, a, a large, you know, diverse group, and then there is a, another very purpose, purposeful focus group that is doing the attacking. And I thought about applying this to, to cyber and thinking that, you know, when we describe a ransomware group uh, as attacking someplace, do we describe it as polarization, as if there were two points of view and they were equal? You know, no, we don't. So um, I, I agree with everything uh, that Jaya just said about, um, you know, that the issues that we're seeing and that they are coming from more than just Russia and we shouldn't get distracted by, um, you know, the, the most, um, uh, the most prominent one in our faces right now, you know, and think about this more in the long term, but that it's interesting how when it comes to cyber, we're pretty clear on attack and defense, and we don't mix it up with polarization the way we do when it when it gets politicized. Wendy, maybe I could follow up uh, with a question because you brought up ransomware there. We've seen it get bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you think that's going to continue for the foreseeable future? Is 2023 a year when maybe it, it turns a corner or is it just going to continue being amplified, do you think? You know, it was interesting. I was talking with a couple of folks yesterday who lived through the 90s, um, both in, in Moscow directly, or lived through the early 90s and in parts of Eastern Europe and uh, also in Baghdad. And they described the era of, you know, of chaos and lawlessness when, um, a, an institution is brought down and, and people are left to fend for themselves and kind of have to pull things back together. And they described this atmosphere where um, in a lot of places, if you needed something, you just took it. And they referred to ransomware as, uh, you know, some uh, country like North Korea going, oh, we need to fund this other thing. Go steal another 20 million from the Americans. And that this was the very same dynamic, and they were not at all surprised by the prevalence of ransomware here. But I do think that probably the the one um, the one factor that most strongly affects the waxing and waning of ransomware activity is the value of crypto, the current value of crypto. When it crashes, you know they sit down and wait until it's actually worth going after it again. So I think that's a, a thing that we should be looking more closely at. We were talking about this in the IST ransomware task force, um, you know, that, that that may be the weak link as opposed to building up defenses, even though that's very important too, but does it make an immediate difference the way that the, the price of crypto does? Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure. Josh, I have a, a question for you here. Can I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Feel free if you want to comment on that before the question. Touch on both. Um, yeah. I thought when he was going to go a different direction, um, I think one of the forecasts for geopolitical is that we have allowed such an exquisite blurring of the lines between what is a state attack, mm -hmm. a state tolerated, a state directed organizational crime attack. Uh, you know, when I was the cyber, the director of the cyber statecraft uh, initiative for the Atlantic Council, I was in Tel Aviv during Cyber Week warning how lucky healthcare globally was with WannaCry, how much worse WannaCry could be. And during my 12 minute keynote, uh, not Petia took out several US hospitals. And luckily all the apparatus of the uh, UN and NATO, including the Russians were there for the cyber, you know, cyber kids. Um, but I, I said at the time, if we aren't deliberate and careful about declaring cyber no fly zones for things like hospitals, you know, even in an active battlefield, we allow 
norms for uh, right of way to International Red Cross for wounded soldiers on a battlefield. And yet we're being very cavalier and reckless with lifeline services like water we drink, like the food we put on our table, like the oil and gas pipelines that fuel our cars, our homes, our supply chains, like timely access to patient care, like the municipalities around towns and cities. Stuff is on fire. And our lack of precision or our tolerance of rampant cyber attacks on designated critical infrastructure because it's not, quote, a nation state, therefore not an act of war, uh, we are regretting it. And that emboldened and brazen collective is doing more each year. Okay. So that's not my question, but it's a... Uh, no, uh, no, you're up. very welcome. I was in I was in Tel Aviv at the same time, coincidentally, and, and I remember that really well. Um, I, I do want to follow up on that, though, because certainly when I remember talking to you not that long ago, when you said we've had the first death now from ransomware and and we've talked about loss of life, we've, you know, and we even had debates, I think, was there such a thing as cyber war at one point, because what's the kind of damage it can do and what does low, moderate, or high damage from cyber war actually mean. Um, but I think we can now say that we've seen death from, from cyber, if you will. And I thought maybe you could share your experience here and what you think uh, has happened here and what it should mean for us collectively. Sure. Uh, and I thought this was supposed to be in, 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 in uh, infotainment information. No, no. Uh, it's also, yeah, it's also some hopefully stuff here. informative. Sure. Yeah. All right, so my short introduction, aside from the site, cyber statecraft, is uh, almost 10 years ago, I started a volunteer group of hackers trying to save lives through security research. It's called IamTheCavalry.org. We're a couple thousand members strong. Uh, you can tell I'm not a real hacker because I'm wearing a hoodie. And Yeah, but you got, you got a Captain America shield, so that, yeah. that counts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but most recently, because of that trust and collaboration we built when the pandemic started, um, Congress passed the CARES Act, hiring authority, and Director Krebs at the time hired me to be the chief strategist for what became the CISA COVID task force. And we assembled a, a team of volunteers and private sector folks and hackers and data scientists and career uh, gubbies to try to protect hospitals during the pandemic, uh, supply chains, operation warp speed and the like, uh, and real significant strains and unprecedented levels of attack on critical infrastructure. So I'm back in the private sector. I'm the VP of cyber safety strategy at Clarity uh, to do ICSOT and public safety human life stuff. But uh, speaking of this question, um, yeah, uh, on the same day, ironically, uh, October 1st of 2021, there was a front page story from the Wall Street Journal uh, claiming the first loss of life of a, of, of a baby post-birth uh, in Alabama from 2019, where the ransom degraded and denied access to a lot of the technologies that modern care depends upon for the patient to nurse ratios or the patient to st uh, doctor ratios. Um, and uh, but for a bunch of communications between staff essentially admitting they shouldn't have admitted the patient, et cetera, this will either settle out of court or become precedent. Uh, but on the very same day, my team published the first statistical proof of loss of life. We were tracking significant strains to U.S. hospitals across the 7,000 hospitals in this country. We could see strong, um, we looked at excess deaths as tracked by the CDC. Uh, these are above and beyond expected deaths by state, by cause, by month. And we could see that when the nation's ICU strain or intensive care unit strain got above 75%, you'd see 18,000 dead Americans in two weeks. If it got to 100, you'd see 80,000 dead Americans in two weeks. And a lot of this was degraded delayed access for time sensitive things like heart, brain, pulmonary, diabetes, things where minutes or hours matter. And armed with this instrument to measure hospital strain and excess deaths at the regional level or national level, uh, we looked at states hit hardest by ransomware with month or longer um, downtime of their technology, who diverted ambulances and patients to other facilities. And in the same state with the same population, adjusting for hospital type and size, we could see that the ransom victims achieved these excess death strain levels sooner and stayed there longer across a five month statistically significant observation period. So we could see min max and most likely and by cause of the impact and additional losses of life um, from this unavailability. So if we know 4.4 minutes can lead to excess deaths for heart attack and one to four hours is the difference between life and death for stroke. Um, what if four weeks of hard downtime for a large geographic region where you may not survive the ambulance ride to the next proximal alternative care? So Senate uh, has been asking about this. White House has been asking about this. And we finally have political will because we can't just say that these are victimless crimes. We used to measure ransoms in record count and fines to HIPAA 
in the cost of the ransom and the cost of the recovery, maybe even in the $67 million of lost revenue for certain you know, people. But now we're measuring it in adverse patient outcomes and even loss of life. So we're not in Kansas anymore. And uh, this is why you see political will to look harder at the things that were voluntary for the last 10 years that maybe for water, food, shelter, safety, emergency medical services, uh, we, we have to be a little better. Thank you for that, Josh. Um, any comments from anybody on, on some of the things he shared? Jay, yes. Yeah, there's one thing I want to say. I mean, it, I think it was an interesting statement, Josh, because you, you talked about it, ransomware being you know perceived as a victimless crime. That is certainly the perspective. Also, when you think about the fact that a lot of um, the companies that actually get hit by ransomware very often can call up their cyber insurer and get them to at least pay for the ransom. I actually think this is something that along with mandatory disclosure, should actually be in, that we don't pay the ransom through the insurance because companies are actually you know trying to figure out which should I balance the actual preventative cost that I need to insure versus let me take the risk roll the dice and then potentially I'll have to pay the ransom but that's what I'll get my cyber insurance for I think this is something that we actually need to be a lot more strict about is we don't pay ransoms with insurers and that insurers are incentivized to provide insurance on the basis of preventative measures, proactive security that is done by their insured party. Uh, just so folks who can't see the chat, Josh just shared a publication from CISA, uh, what he referred to earlier there. Uh, Jay, I'd like to follow up on the cyber insurance subject. You just raised it. Uh, it would seem that premiums keep going up. We've seen insurance companies try to get out of it. In France, we've seen uh, the government say, that insurance has to be paid. Um, there are no sort of hacks of God yet with intelligent opponents. It would seem it's incredibly difficult to get the actuarial tables right and to get the right predictors of loss and to build to build that out correctly. Do you think that it's headed in the right direction? Do you think it's headed towards, um, shall we say, a crisis in insurance? Or uh, can it continue as it is? Or are there steps we should be taking to change it? Frankly, I think it's a really fractured market that I don't have enough view about, but I do see some things that are really good. So I'm seeing companies um, in Western Europe who are um, doing cyber insurance by tacking it on with a monitoring service. And I see that as a good way to go. So there's a company, for example, in the Netherlands, it's called iSecurity. And what they do is they partnered with Aon, I think the, is the insurer. And so they'll provide you insurance, but you also get this monitoring service as well. It's kind of like, you know, part of the kit and caboodle. So you, you need to do both. And I think that's really the kind of positive incentivization you want to see when providing this insurance. Yes, you will be insured for all the things that could go wrong whilst maintaining like a baseline of information security that can be considered reasonable. And I think where it goes really wrong is where there is no reasonable baseline, but they just expect to get insured for the ransom. So... So um, I'm going to shift gears here because I'm conscious of time and the subjects we have to go through. Wendy, I'm going to come to you. Uh, I have to ask you an identity question. I think it's a, it, it's a must. Um, so it's uh, it's 2022 now, and it seems that passwords are still ubiquitous. Um, how do we break free of the tyranny of, of legacy authentication? How do we get to the next sort of uh, identity infrastructure, if you will? What do you think is is coming and, and, and how should we try to achieve it, especially going into a new year? Well, uh, you know, the, the bad news obviously is that we started out decades ago with the idea that um, holding a shared secret inside a fallible organic material uh, was a really bad idea as it turns out. And uh, we're doing something about it. Uh, but I think the somewhat good news, somewhat bad news is what we're actually doing in a lot of cases, if you look at things like um, uh, the WebAuthn protocol, is that we're moving the shared secret to something a lot stronger and something that we're not relying on the fallible user to protect. And that's that's basically how it works. You know, I I have uh, you know I may have a, um, uh, a a cryptographic key pair stored securely in my phone. All I have to do is authenticate to my phone with my with a biometric. And then it does the secret sharing with the website for me. And that is so much easier for everybody else to do. But the problem is that first of all, that only works for websites. Secondly, anything that has to be uh, transformed that completely is gonna take a really long time to do. 
So you will see a lot of this out right now uh, with password lists in a lot of areas, but we still have a lot of, uh, let's not say legacy, let's say heritage uh, infrastructure that um, is, is very expensive to try to migrate to this. And so the question is, can we do this enough to protect the fallible users who are the avenue of attack while not having to overhaul things that will, will be incredibly expensive and maybe not worth it from a business perspective. And so while, while I'm at this, I, I wanna give a shout out to Eric Goldstein and, and the points that he was making in his talk um, about trying to help those organizations that can't necessarily do that. Uh, I call those organizations being under the security poverty line because I feel that there are four factors, uh, two of which Eric mentioned, which is you know just finances. Um, and another is expertise, which is not just training or knowing what to do. Um, it, it's the experience and skills to be able to know what to do with something you've never seen before which is what we do in cybersecurity every day. But there's also capability. And Josh touched on this really well when he described the issues in healthcare. There are some things that you may know that you need to do that conventional wisdom says you should do, or even that data says actually works, and yet you cannot do it because of the constraints in your environment. Uh, you know, I don't care who you are. If you're in a hospital, you're going to throw authentication and identity out the window in the interests of getting to the system in order to save the patient. That's just the way the world works. And so um, I think the next step for us is, first of all, to keep looking at what works in security. And I'll just do a quick plug for the, CIS the third annual Cisco Security Outcomes Report that just came out last night, where we looked at what makes for resilient security outcomes. And um, we, we need to keep looking at the constraints that organizations are under. We can't just throw money at them from a government perspective and say, you're not investing enough, go invest in this. Uh, because we don't know if they even can, we don't know if it will even work for them. And then finally, influence is another factor. As a really large vendor, I can go to a supplier and say, you need to fix this and they will, but smaller organizations can't do that necessarily. So this is another role that I see us playing as a community wielding collective influence to, to fix things uh, in, in the supply chain ecosystem that smaller organizations can't do on their own and we should not be leaving them alone to do that. Wendy, I have to follow up here because I'm 99% sure that you coined the term security poverty. Line. Yeah, I'm not 100% yeah. sure. I'm 99% sure. I cite you on it uh, a lot. Yeah, 10 um, years ago, I did that. Do, do, do you think that line is moving? Is, or is there something that we, because think of, I think of the audience here, is there something that we can or should be doing to either lower that line or to provide and get security to the bottom of that pyramid? Well, I think we don't understand the full scope of the problem yet. I think like regular poverty, there are economic factors, political factors, cultural factors. When I ask about what we owe one another in cybersecurity, uh, which Chris Inglis and, and, uh, uh, and Harry have, and Kresa have addressed very well in their foreign policy article, the, the cyber social contract, when we talk about what we owe owe one another? The answer is different depending on which country you're in and how much they trust their government. So um, I, th I think there are steps that we can do. There may be a limit to what we can do in the U.S. based on our cultural uh, constraints that we have. But in as much as we are improving uh, technology, in as much as we are sharing practices that actually work and uh, are, are sharing information and are building more, uh, more institutions to help these organizations. I think regardless, we're making progress, but I see, I see Josh raising his hand. You did, Josh. I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, this is a, uh, we may come back to this a, a third time, but um, really important here. I think, you know, Wendy's wisdom was immediately obvious 10 years ago when she uttered it. I think one of the reasons we modified the, the verbiage to target rich cyber poor and broke down what cyber poor means is two things can be true. And I think for the longest time, if you look at a pyramid of the Fortune 5000 up top and everybody else below, uh, the attackers and defenders focused on the target rich, uh, cyber yep. rich, yep. right? Yeah, that's right. Why? That's where the money is. But ransomware changed everything. 
because attackers have figured out how to monetize the cyber poor. Because if it's important to you, they can monetize it. And that with that flip, the attackers have figured out how to monetize the cyber poor, the unavailability of what makes them tick, whether it's critical infrastructure or small and medium business, can be monetized and has been. Here's the problem. Defenders have not yet figured out how to monetize the cyber poor. So we have an unmitigated feeding frenzy. And the reason you're seeing two things being true is if uh, people hear the security poverty line historically, and this is not Wendy's fault, they hear that as a reason to justify why they're not invested. And now that this is attacking designated critical infrastructure routinely, it's not acceptable. So we have to grapple with these two competing truths. And that's why you're seeing the pending White House cyber, national cybersecurity strategy really targeting things like water, food, electricity, municipalities, uh, small, medium, rural hospitals, because the fact that they don't have the money or investment or staff is a problem to be uh, addressed and incentivized when I break down target rich cyber poor, I usually say it's insufficient information, insufficient incentives or carrots and sticks, and insufficient resources and talent pool, as Wendy's been talking. And I think um, this is the new challenge ahead of us as we pivot into next year is uh, it's not the size of the organization that matters. It's the size of the harm to national security, public safety, human life. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, but but the uh, you know we're part of an ecosystem and the smallest organization that's affected even one we've never heard of can have widespread effects even on the larger companies who believe that they have their security you know sewn up uh, for example uh, there's an example where Toyota had to shut down its manufacturing lines because of one small supplier that thought that it had a breach just the suspicion of one caused them to have to shut down or the Blackbaud ransomware um, uh, an event which uh, was tracked by Scientia and found that it affected over a thousand organizations at last count, most of which were nonprofits, which are the other critical infrastructure, because if they're down, people don't get fed. Uh, there's, there's no first response. There's, you know, people don't get homes. People are not saved from uh, human trafficking. So we are all affected by these breaches, no matter whether they are small organizations that we've never heard of, or you know the one percent, the the target rich, we're we're all being hit equally now in waves. Uh, with your mention of the supply chain at Toyota issue, uh, Jay, I'd like to bring the next subject over to you. Uh, so S bombs are a thing now, um, uh, but are we using them right? Uh, and what do you think is the right model for them? Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, they're a thing. And I think the thing that we should focus about about this thing is that they're not a silver bullet. Um, I think that we try to apply them kind of uniformly, ubiquitously for all of our supply chain woes. And I think that's a real concern because they don't do that. Let's talk about those smaller organizations that Wendy just mentioned. Most of them, at least most of them in my experience as a former telecom CISO, most of them expect the security to just be built in with the products that they buy. They really do not expect to do like a single ounce of effort on top of it at all. So like the question also with SBOMs is where would you expect this organization to reasonably consume something like that would be effective from an SBOM perspective, whether they're developing or, or just using it from a consumer perspective. I think it's about identifying and making it usable in uh, the ecosystems in which they cohabit. So that would mean from a procurement perspective, from a development perspective, from an incident response and threat hunting perspective, we need to find a way to make sure that the S bombs that are there that are available, or you know, in the case that they're not available, they're created, are, are really being utilized throughout the necessary parts of that food chain. And I think now I'm so much happier than when, you know, when we had like no real ability to use and interact, but I don't think that we're there yet. Uh, I, I would totally agree. Uh, and uh, in fact, there's, um, there's a white paper out on use cases for S-bombs uh, from the Atlantic Council that I contributed to and kind of broke up the use cases into um, areas like pre-procurement where I think that's pretty easy to use an S-bomb if you can agree with your legal team that you will never ever accept or, or use a component from a particular source. That's a very binary question that you can immediately agree on or um, some, we'll never use this particular license for this particular purpose. 
um, that, that's pretty easy. When you start getting into using it for vulnerability management, we already know a lot of lessons that we've learned from other types of, of vulnerability management. A lot of it requires careful negotiation and tracking. Um, if you use it for threat intelligence, if you're looking at the, um, if you're looking at what, um, what sources are being used, whether things are being exploited, again, we have a lot of lessons from threat intelligence sharing today that we can apply to using that for SBOMs. Um, and then uh, finally for forensics, for incident response, trying to find out whether a component was actually used at the time that you believe the breach occurred is very hard to do if you don't have the logs from six months ago or you know whatever the, the time period in question is. So um, there is a concern. I've talked with some organizations that are doing proof of concept now using SBOM and I asked them, what risk decisions are you making based on these SBOMs and who's making them? And I'm not getting a lot of answers yet. So uh, I think that's something that we, we all need to, to collectively keep discussing. Yeah. If I could add to that, I mean, I think, Wendy, but first of all, I haven't even thought about it for using it for forensics. I think that's a really interesting one because, you know, noting, knowing when you have stuff. So I'm, I'm fully dependent on logs from network and system information for forensic stuff. But um, I have to think about past trauma. So the, the trauma that makes me convinced that this is an excellent tool, like during incident response, is only heart bleed and not so long ago log 4j you know that that just that knowing across our vendor stack i mean and again i was CISO of two different organizations at the time and like both time it was just like weeks of sleeplessness with teams trying to figure out is it there what version how you know when is it developed when is there a new uh, patch coming out and like what's the mitigation so just having that a bit more automated a bit would already be such a huge improvement across our stack. So we still have stuff where we still don't know to some extent because it's old, some random thing that we bought once very long ago, but we found a way to mitigate it like at a class. And I think we need to get better at doing that as well. Finding ways to do, if you don't have the SBOM pre-prepared, a ways to do detection that would be like an add-on on top of that. So I have some thoughts on SBOM. Um, I've been working on it for almost 10 years now. And by the way, you put some great stuff in the chat. We have to capture those docs. In I know, I think, uh, I think Venable is gonna capture them. But uh, yeah, I first noticed this with Apache Struts 2 on July 13th, 2013. And I said to my boss at the time, Andy Ellis, I said, the world just changed. Uh, and he's like, how could you possibly know that? And I said, it's open season on open source. Why would you attack a single bespoke website for a bank when you can hit everything they all use? And um, so I started getting really far down the rabbit hole on the software supply chain and the Java ecosystem and ultimately went to Sonatype. But without giving an oral history of this, I did bring it to Congress in January 2014. There was actually a bill introduced later that year, in part because a congressional research study showed a gap in the law that the NIST cybersecurity standards didn't really force you to look at the 95% of your code that was third party and open source. Heartbleed then added political will, the Chamber of Commerce and some of the trade associations killed it with fire instantly because they hated it, the idea of transparency. But ultimately later, especially during my Congressional Task Force for Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity, we saw Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital shut down for a week, which at the time was the first wave of ransomware on hospitals by accident before it became the number one target. And that was a single Java flaw and a single JBoss library and a single device shut down a hospital for a week. So that's where we said all medical technologies need to have a machine generated, machine readable, software bill materials, FDA put it in the pre-market, private sector freaked out again, NTA got involved. So there's a lot that can be done there. And there's a lot of um, Rorschach effect around SBOM where people project into it their wants, needs, and fears, and they call it a silver bullet. And as Alan Friedman likes to say, the SB and SBOM is not for silver bullet. It's an information layer. And most of those target rich cyber will ignore it 99% of the time. But if there's a log for J, they can quickly determine, am I affected? Where am I affected? One of the biggest hospital networks in California 11 months later, still doesn't know if Dog4j is in 90% of her medical equipment. There were vendors who could tell her in 48 hours and she took mitigations and precautions to keep patients alive. There are other vendors that still don't know later. So the act of asking for it and demanding it at a minimum, even if you never look at it and never operationalize it, means your vendor knows what the hell's in their software and they don't. So some of them don't have source code for their own products, don't know what's in their own products. 
they take a look and they're violating licenses. They take a look and they have known exploited vulnerabilities or Kev from CISA they don't want to fix. Transparency is coming. It's an overdue. And even the mere act of being a self-aware as a vendor, even if it's not shared publicly or broadly yet, will be a huge step forward. Hey guys, I just I want to you know talk about the ugliness in the room. I think what Josh brought out is an excellent point. There are still vendors today. Okay, when I ask for a supplier security annex, there are still vendors today that tell me that I do not have a right to audit on that you know code or that uh, system or whatever. And again, I don't want to name and shame because I think I'll get someone in trouble, probably myself. But um, but you know, really, it's so frustrating. It seems like such a middle ages kind of concept that we can no longer test. Everyone is testing your stuff, you know, knowns to you or unknowns to you. So I really find it ridiculous that when you have a commercial relationship, that there's still a certain amount of willful disdain about the need to verify claim. So yeah. All right, I have um I have one more question here, uh, and then we'll do the glass half full, glass half empty. And if there are questions in the room, uh, please feel free to ask them. Even if we run out of time, though, we can ask the questions post event. We all, all of our contact information will be here, and you can ask us anything, even when this is over. So, uh, Wendy, I'm going to come to you for this last question before the the final, because um, we asked it last year and the year before. Um, we talked about the cyber talent gap, and you mentioned it, um, and. Um, my question for you is, is it closing? Are we making a diverse, accepting cyber world or is it becoming less welcoming? And what more should we be doing, do you think? That's a really good question. And I think um, the, uh, the answer depends on whether you're looking at the number of people being brought into a particular definition of cyber talent or whether you've expanded your definition of cyber talent to include a larger population. And I'm happy to say that I think we're doing more of the latter, that uh, th there are a lot of different ways um, that people can enter and work on cybersecurity issues without necessarily having to have a background. I mean, I have a liberal arts background myself. So in as much as uh, organizations that are hiring are expanding their definition of what they're looking for, are willing to bring in talent especially from inside um, and, and bring them up and let them develop their, their skills and potential in cyber rather than insisting on this senior $500,000 a year um, person in their, in their job posting. I think we are getting better, but clearly we still have a long way to go. Jaya, uh, Josh, what do you think? Yeah. I, go first. Yeah. I always find this diversity thing really difficult. I'd really like to, um, I'd like to recognize that there are some amazing people that we have in the field and also, you know, coming up in the ranks um, that are there based on their qualifications, not on their diverse business. Um, I think we could always do a better job at making sure that, you know, we have a diversity of thought as well and the neurodiversity and other types of diversity rather than simply scouting for uh, sex uh, or or color. Um, but that being said, I know we have a uh, place that we came from that's not all that great. And I recognize that we need to improve that. But again, nobody who is diverse wants to be hired or included because solely of their diversity. So I'm kind of in that camp. Um, yeah. Um, there's much to say. One of the most... Uh... The, one of the freshest takes I saw on this in a long time is from uh, Alyssa Miller at RSA Conference 2021, I think, maybe 2020. Um, you know, I think many things, but one thing I'll say right now that comes to my heart is um, we keep looking for five years to 10 years of ex security experience on things that only exist for two or three, and it, which is one of the points Alyssa makes. But when we treat cybersecurity as an outside discipline, it, there's not there's never going to be enough people like what I'm frustrated with is not that there's not enough master's degrees in cybersecurity what I'm frustrated with is there's not enough basic sec uh, secure coding hygiene in most engineering programs in most of the, of the schools in the country I found a cyber terrorism program I think you're a you're a, a guest graduate of one, or yeah. one of those but we don't have um, what is the role for an IT professional for cybersecurity stewardship? What is the role for procurement for cybersecurity? What is the role for this? What you know, the, there needs to be some sort of a recognition that as society increasingly depends on digital infrastructure, it has to be trustworthy, transparent, and reliable. And it's just not right. It's we look at steel and concrete as you know 
trustworthy, dependable, and invisible, and because they are. Well, we're becoming as dependent on software and technology, but it's not nearly as reliable or defensible. And that was like the spirit of the rugged software manifesto a long, long time ago. But we have not figured out that security is a team sport. And instead of making everyone experts at it, we should give everyone some literacy and fit for purpose uh, guidance on how they pr prosecute their job in a way that's contributing to the net, the net resilience goal. Okay, la last question. This is the glass half empty, glass half full. I'm going to go Josh, Wendy, Jay. I, I started with you, Jay. I'll let you finish. So the glass half empty way is uh, what's a technology you're tired of hearing abused, hyped, or used to death uh, in the media or in our industry? The glass half full is what's a technology you're looking forward to seeing grow and reach fruition? And I'm fully aware that it's the, the more risky one here is the glass half full because these things may fail or be on the way up the hype curve. So Josh half empty or half full and and what is it um on the half empty i'm, I'm going to acknowledge my bias here that i after trying to keep the nation's critical infrastructure resilient and available and seeing that you know 85 percent of those owners and operators don't have a single qualified security person on staff yet i don't want to hear another fucking thing sorry for the f-bomb about, about, about post quantum crypto you know in ot or ics or hospitals like we don't even have single passwords in a lot of these where we have hard-coded default passwords go check out sysa.gov slash bad practices for the three dangerous practices that are legion in our nation's critical infrastructure it's things like unsupported end of life software it's things like hard-coded default passwords or no passwords things like single factor or less in remote administration tools we can't keep a password a password from emptying poisonous levels of lie into water supply what are we doing talking about post quantum crypto for those environments we have to crawl walk run give fit for purpose things to make sure that we are actually reducing the number of adverse events from accidents and adversaries on the internet so i'm kind of tired of hearing about that one apology for the f-bomb i am encouraged on the other hand by a lot of the devops community and platform engineering community who don't look at these things as burdens or you know costs or obstacles or whatnot if you look at salsa and sig store people are basically doing really intelligent hygiene tracking signing at machine speed as you build software as a byproduct of software development and if we just make this stuff frictionless easy and the right thing to do people will likely do it because you know less complex code is more reliable available profitable code so i think the things that encourage me are the people looking at cloud native machine speed hygiene. So you did both there, thank you. Wendy, half empty or half full and, and what is it? Well, first of all, I love it when Josh gets spicy. Yeah, um, I do, That's it's, we, we are all here for that, by the way. Yeah, um, and, and when it comes to glass half empty or half full, uh, you know, I like to think of it as, uh, isn't it great that we have twice as much glass as we need? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of where I'm, I'm gonna go with this. I, I, I won't say that, these are technologies, but I think everybody's very tired of the confusion around terms like zero trust, SASE, SSE. Um, I, I think XDR has been pretty well defined by Allie Mellon at Forrester. You know, if you if you read her stuff, although there's still a lot of XDR washing uh, going on, but I think there's ju just a lot of confusion. Um, because these aren't technologies, these are, you know, the zero trust is a design pattern. It's a way of thinking uh, and you can implement it in a lot of different ways at a lot of different layers. And uh, SASE uh, or SSE, as far as I'm concerned, is just moving the network security controls out to the edge, meaning closer to where the applications and users are today. So it's, it's an architecture change. Um, it may involve some upgrades in technology and, and, you know, some other improvements, but it's not, again, a thing that you can buy. But I think with, when organizations are trying to decide what their strategy should be, what they should be getting and why, I think a lot of these terms just sort of get in the way. And if we go back to what security outcomes are you trying to get, let's talk about that. And then we'll talk about what's going to help you get there. Uh, I, I think that's a better way to go. And luckily, for good or for ill, I think the pandemic pushed a lot of organizations to uh, start moving in this direction, even though they weren't ready. And now that we're kind of accepting that we live in a much more dynamic hybrid world, 
uh, we're going to have to rebuild what we threw together in a hurry and you know make it more sustainable. So uh, I, I'm encouraged by that activity. Thank you, and shout out to Ali; she's wonderful. So yeah, good, good call out there. Jaya, how about you for the final the final question? Yeah, so th this is always difficult, but um, I'm gonna say that you know we have a, a glass half empty, glass half full situation depending on where you look. Right. So if I'm looking from the perspective of Ukraine and the cyber war situation, it is actually uh, not as terrible as we thought. So I would almost say that that's actually half full, even though that there's a lot happening uh, from a cyber perspective and the way that companies and everyone are binding together. That's actually pretty good. From a technology perspective, though, I have to say that here as well, there is one lesson that keeps coming back to me, which is that we need to prioritize better things that are important and not only those things that are urgent in cybersecurity. We have a tendency to love chasing, you know, firefighting like tasks. We love it. Okay, the next incident, everyone's all motivated. We know where to go. We know where to run. You know, we love working IR. And, and that is a real problem because, I mean, all of the stuff that Josh talked about, the cyber hygiene stuff, we know it for ages. You know, we don't, like we don't put the money there. We don't put the people there. We don't get it done. And so I really would like to, if I could like kind of have a motto, prioritize important before it becomes urgent. And that relates to like the forward defense kind of stuff and our cyber hygiene, but it's also relating, and now I'm going to close the circle, Josh, to things like artificial intelligence being used by the attackers. We have an advantage. We haven't seen any actual attacks except for domain generating algorithms. But I think that gap is closing, that we can use AI and ML only for defensive things where, and we're not expecting to see democratization by the attackers. I think we are. So I really think we need to do a better job of getting our act together to use it to fix our stuff, find it, fix it, before the attackers use it to find and fix those vulnerabilities or find and you know, insert themselves into those vulnerabilities. That being said, um, the last thing, post-quantum crypto. I don't disagree with Josh. There's a shitload of other homework we need to, and again, not an S-bomb maybe, but a shitload of other things that we need to get done first. That being said, if we don't prioritize it now, it will bite us in the ass later. So let's not wait for that to happen either. All right. I agree with her. I just want most a, a handful of small smart people where it needs to be looked at now have to look at it now. The rest of us, let's shut the front door. Yep. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if we have time in the room to for any questions or if there are any. Uh, Bree and AC, if there are any, please feel free to uh, to raise them. And if there isn't time, we can always uh, follow up afterwards. Thank you so much, Sam. I think we have time for one question. Hi, <laughs> Mark Bohannon is Red Hat. Great discussion. And uh, Josh, thank you very, very much for the call out to SigStore, which I think is a very underappreciated technology and framework that is emerging that will be useful not only to open source, but ultimately, in my humble opinion, uh, to proprietary code development as well. Um, we've talked a lot about the vendors, and obviously, we are very committed to the best and possible vendor transparency that you can given our business model as well as our products. I think though that we are not discussing the obligations of users in all of this. And I think the Log4j experience in our view, based on our experience, emphasizes this. Mm -hmm. Our work and our scans were showing that most Log4j instances were not in the context of traditional product consumption, but in the context of digital transformation where enterprises are doing their own software development and not keeping track of what they are doing. Um, I actually have written that I think that s ones would have done little to solve or help ameliorate the, uh, the Log4j as a result. And of course, this is a whole history of Java, which one does not really, I mean, that's a whole nother discussion. But I do think in our conversation, we are missing, and again, we are an enterprise customer. We do not, we're not a consumer, which I think are different dynamics but we're not talking enough about the obligations of consumers to have in place good site life cycle management practices that we can do six sigma, but if they are not doing what they are supposed to do, this is a fraught effort. I hate to be candid, but I'm, we're not talking enough about the obligations and the needs of users 
to get real about the digital environment as well. Josh, you have a your hand. Yeah, up real first. fast speed round. Um, in we are also talking about the operational environment. This is a shared responsibility between how are you defending your kingdom and is your kingdom defensible from the supply you're getting from OEMs and commercial goods. Um, the White House National Cyber Strategy, which is imminent, uh, has significant focus on minimum obligations for some of the owners and operators of those environments and that shared responsibility. The, the, what Eric Goldstein just talked about, the, the baseline cyber performance goals are putting onus on the operational environment. Things like bad practices are putting onus on the operational environment. It's an and. Um, there's current legislation and a white, actually I'll point to the white paper and then I'll yield um, Senator Warner. Uh, put out a pretty comprehensive white paper and discussion draft with towards legislative proposals for healthcare, and it has a section on the medical devices and cash for clunkers and getting rid of unsupported end of life hard coded passwords, and it has a section on the minimum cyber hygiene for hospitals themselves with potential for stimulus. Similarly, on the house, so there is a both. We have to walk and chew them. They're both deficient. And in case of Log4j, the last point I'll make is um, before we called it SBOM, and it was a cool thing that, you know, uttered by Alan Friedman, the pioneering has happened in financial services for the code they write and self-consume. And there's some what, a great study from the DevOps Enterprise Forum, uh, and they published as an ebook on how banks were able to very quickly see their own use of Log4j, where they suffered was third parties being able to equip them with the similar transparency. So I think we're on the right path, but we have to push them in parallel. Uh, I can't defend indefensible material or opaque material, but also, yeah, you're right. When people have exposures of their own, uh, it should be on their shoulders. Uh, if I can just jump in and, and just say one more small rant, um, that a lot of the solutions that we talk about uh, to all of these problems involve either throwing money at the problem, setting expectations for other organizations to follow, or sharing information. And I still want to argue that that's all great, but if you can't do anything with what you just learned, or you can't implement a, a, uh, a, a better best practice, then we still have a lot of work to do dealing with that. We can't simply tell everybody, okay, this is your responsibility. Good luck. You know, we'll see you. Uh, be, and we tend to do that a lot, especially in the United States. We're very, you know, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps sort of culture. But we also have to understand in the context of what we owe one another that we can't just throw something over the transom and, and say, you know, here you go. You should be doing this. Good luck. Or you should know about this. Okay, now you know. Here's an S-bomb. Have fun but without helping them actually make use of, of what they now know. Dan, did you have anything to add? No, I think uh, Josh and Wendy expressed that brilliantly. All right. So folks, um, I want to thank the wonderful panelists that uh, I was graced with here. Thank you for your participation and for your candor. Uh, no one here is shy. And I want to thank the audience for dealing with us remote. If you have questions, if you have comments, we want to hear them. Um, we can continue the dialogue and we hope to. And I want to thank both the sponsors for the event and uh, and uh, everyone who's associated with it. We hope the rest of the conference goes well. And Ari, I think I'm handing it back to you. Thank you very much, Sam. That was great. So I'll say um, I've known Alan Friedman for uh, probably, I think, 22 years. And that's the first time I've ever heard this sentence, a cool thing uttered by Alan Friedman. <laughs> um, also, uh, it was nice to have, uh, I mean, uh, I will, while well, I will apologize for the uh, the um, the F-bomb and the S-bomb, you did get two kinds of S-bombs on that panel, which I thought was really uh, the first time I had heard that joke uh, or that pun used. Uh, maybe was it was on purpose? I don't know. I'll give Jay the credit for uh, doing it on purpose if that's the case. Um, anyways, uh, we're going to take a break now, uh, and we're coming back at 11.15 it is. Um, 11.15 and then... Uh, for the diversity panel, but uh, folks can get coffee and other things here and come back online at 11.15. Thanks.
So oh, this is on. Oh, test, test, test. It'll take a second. Do you hold the bottom? Because the bottom is the red. The remote. Okay. It's, uh, wait, wait, yeah. So hold it here. Yes. Don't cover the bottom because that's where the. Okay. Take a deep breath. I literally. Yeah. Hello, if I, is that oh. I'm here. I'm based. There we go. Thank you. If everyone can take their seats, we're going to get started with the next panel, uh, which is on diversity. And uh, Jeanette Jarvis from uh, CTA is going to be the moderator. We're going to hand things over to her. Take it from here, Jeanette. Is this on? Good day, everybody. Hey, I know you, <laughs> Eric. Allison. Hello, hello, hello. There it is. I'd like to welcome you to our panel discuss discussion, fostering a stronger <coughs> workforce through <coughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm going to start with the introduction of each of our panel members, and then they're going to say a, a few words about themselves. So on the end, Allison Knox, she's senior director of education policy at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Al. I'm I'm Allison, and um, I work on education and workforce policy for our U.S. Government Affairs Unit here in D.C., about four blocks that way. Next is Rodney Peterson. Rodney is director at the National Institute for Cybersecurity Education. Yeah, and for those of the, you that aren't familiar with NICE, it's at NIST and is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And um, Michael is chief human resources officer at Trellix. Yeah, as you said, I'm Michael. Uh, my background is is in big data, um, uh, and uh, I've been at part of Trellix for a little bit a little bit over a year, um, and uh, and it's really a fascinating time to actually be in in cybersecurity. We have so many things um, um, that that we have uh, to look forward to. Wonderful, and and lastly, we have Debbie Taylor Moore, who's senior partner and VP of Global Cybersecurity at IBM Consulting. Hi there. So I've been in the industry since its very beginning, and I've worked as a practitioner, been a consultant. I've uh, led people operationally as well as have worked with uh, venture and early stage products and solutions that are being brought to market globally. Wonderful. Well, I'm really delighted to introduce you to this uh, esteemed panel. Um, and I also want to mention that I've been on and, and been involved and listened to a lot of diversity panels over the years, and generally they're all male, I mean, all female. It's really nice to have two men on the panel because they need to be part of the conversation and they certainly are part of the solution. So happy to have you guys here. So we hear all the time that there are um, hundreds of thousands of jobs available in cybersecurity, and that's projected to be millions in, within a number of years. And the cybersecurity problem is complex. The adversaries keep us on our toes. We definitely need to have fresh ideas and fresh thoughts and, and uh, fresh innovation. And uh, one way to do that is address it through diversity and bringing um, diverse candidates to the table who do think differently. Um, and besides, it's really the right thing to do. Society overall is very diverse. Why isn't the workforce? So starting with you, Rodney, why is hiring diverse candidates in cybersecurity so hard? And where do you go to find a diverse pool of job candidates? Yeah, so let me start with... Uh provocative is the mic not working in the back so we're just... okay 
Is it okay now? Okay. So, so the provocative statement is there are not enough qualified candidates who are women and people of color. And it may sound provocative, but truthfully, if you went back to your companies or hiring managers, you might get people who feel that way. And, and the reason I lead with that is I think it starts with the last question about where are we going to recruit and develop talent? And we have to change the paradigm of, I'll call it the good old boys network as the male on the panel here. When I first started working in my job and I was hiring and staffing up, the number of referrals I got from friends and colleagues were nine out of 10 were men and over a majority of them were white as well. And I think we need to, you know, be more creative and actually go to where the diverse populations live and learn and work. And that's a part of the strategy maybe I can talk a little bit more about later. I'll just give you one specific example. There's a lot of interest in working with minority-serving institutions. So whether it's historically Black colleges, universities, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, uh, that's a great place to go and start. But recognizing these are college-educated, sometimes you don't need a college degree to do this type of work. Um, but I went to the Hispanic Association of College and University Hiring Fair, where their graduates were looking for jobs. And that was a way that we brought in some diversity into our organization and quite frankly, not just diversity talent, a very talented individual who served us really well. So that's one thing. Two is the question of qualifications. What does it mean to be qualified? And we heard the last panel touch on this a little bit. It's not just degrees and um, certifications, but it's competencies and skills. And we need to think about <clears throat> measuring and, uh, and describing them differently than we have in the past. And that it goes even further when you look at traditional job descriptions it's well known a lot of them have bias or prejudice built into what they're looking for and that are turnoffs to women and people of color. Uh, also qualifying people for entry level jobs, which we don't have enough of. Again, the panelists before talked about how many entry level jobs require five to eight years experience and how are you gonna get that five to eight years experience for an entry level job, if you will. Uh, and also the career entry job. So it may not just be your first job, but Again, as somebody said previously, it might be your existing workforce that wants to reskill or upskill into cybersecurity. And so we need to make sure our career entry jobs are written appropriately and address appropriately the needs that we have. And then finally, I just left St. Louis the last couple of days where we run an annual K-12 cybersecurity education conference. And, and we work closely with school counselors who are talking to young people in the schools and parents and families about careers, including cybersecurity. And, and one of the comments was, you can't be it if you don't see it. And to me, that has kind of two components. One is awareness of cybersecurity and information technology jobs in general needs to be promoted and discoverable by young people as well as working adults. And we need to work harder on that. And those of you that are from companies need to do that through internships, through open houses, through whatever it takes to bring in your community members to be able to see what the work is about. And then secondly, I'll just close with this, is that if we truly want to attract and retain a more diverse workforce, we need to work hard and quickly to have that kind of workforce where there are people in leadership positions and positions of influence who can be role models. Yeah, excellent points. Um, speaking of education, I know Microsoft is working to expand and diversify the workforce through the CUNY College mm -hmm. point of view. Can you talk about the initiative that you're doing there? Yeah, so um, I don't know how many here know that uh, you know 57% of those who attend the community college system in our country are women. 49% um, are Black and African American and or Hispanic. 29% um, of them are first generation college goers and 20% are people with disabilities. So we believe that by working with that system, the community college system across the country um, and making a commitment to skill, provide skills and opportunity scholarships programs to that constituency, our commitment is to make sure that 250,000 new people have the skills they need to go into the cybersecurity workforce over the next five years. So that was our commitment made by our president. And again, a lot of this starts, I believe, at the top by Brad Smith um, on October 29th last year. And we're partnering with the American Association of Community Colleges, 
We are making sure that there's more scholarships available. We're going to get 25,000 new scholarships to students all across the country in cybersecurity education at our community colleges. Um, we're working with a group called the Last Mile Education Fund. We released all our curriculum to community colleges for free. Um, but what we've learned through that is that um, it doesn't just, obviously it doesn't, we can't just rely on the private sector. We also have to have government step in. So we're really pleased that Representative Lisa McLean from Michigan and Representative Yvette Clark from New York in a bipartisan fashion um, introduced in September, HR 7890. Um, and this bill is all about community colleges and supporting them specifically on um, cybersecurity education. And so we're standing with them in a cacophony of voices to say, hey, this is the right direction. And of course we, invite all of you to stand with us as well. Um, just one last thing is it's been really good for the company, I believe, to get closer and connect more with community colleges and listen to the faculty needs. You know, how do you retain, how do you attract, how do you pay for these faculty members when they have so many different options in cybersecurity workforce? How do we make sure that the pathways for the students are affordable, right? What are we doing to meet them where they're at? And then, you know, finally, making sure that there's mechanisms that are simplified at a local level for work-based learning experiences. All of that is in this amazing bill. All of that we're trying to work on as a company. And again, I'm going to keep saying this. We welcome more companies and people to um, join in this effort because we do think community colleges are key to diversifying the cybersecurity workforce. Great. Thank you. Um, Debbie, what, in your opinion, does it mean to um, foster a stronger workforce and to mentor? Can you go into detail there? Sure. I think that, you know, as an industry that we have had a long time to sort of work on this, but typically the, the idea of what a cybersecurity professional is, is, you know, encompassed by some guy with a hoodie on, you know, or capturing the flag or um, just a few narrow sets of, of professions or narrow sets of jobs. And I think that, you know, in order for people to really um, understand that there's a broad range of um, potential roles, that I, I'm a big believer in apprenticeships and with people shadowing people in those current roles. So they sort of understand that you, you, you don't have to just be a SOC analyst. You don't have to just be a pen tester. There are roles in policy. There are roles in um, governance. There are roles in um, SOC operations. Lots of different other places that you can go. And so when it comes down to mentoring, I think that there's a big difference between mentoring and sponsoring. So when you think of sponsoring, you think of someone sort of helping someone find a job by giving them um, a tip or introducing them to a colleague. With mentoring, I think it's a bit more intense. And I think that there's a, a need to sort of develop a cadence with individuals that you mentor. Maybe that's setting aside some time on your calendar uh, once a week. I know people that I mentor, I have them on rotation so that we talk about what's going on in their current situation, what they're trying to get to. Because I think that even once you hired folks in, the um, real test of the organization is retention. And particularly when you're talking about DE and I, it's really inclusion. It really is. It's are you nurturing those folks to get to the next level or get in the right position? And I think for most people in cybersecurity, they can attest to trying, maybe most people, but I know in my career, I started out um, based on the fact that there was just a huge problem with clients that I had working for a large uh, software company at the time. And I found a startup of NSA folks who they, they were out here trying to solve the problem back in the 90s. And I thought, I'm going to learn this. It's fascinating. I had passion around it. I shadowed people. I was a nuisance to get to know, <laughs> to get to know the work. And so I just think that the reality of the work is really important. And I think that uh, that mentoring can't be sort of the lowest denominator, which is sort of just commiserating and or sort of putting somebody forward without a narrative around their passion, around their skills, 
around all the other things that are not an accident of birth, that are their talents and why they're uniquely suited for a particular position, if that makes sense. You know, I'm glad you brought up apprentices. Um, I think apprenticeship is something that we need to do more of in the cybersecurity industry. For whatever reason, there's a variety of students that uh, are in high school that will never go to college for whatever reason. It could be resources, it could be financial, it could be learning styles. And I think that there's plenty of opportunities in the industry to bring these folks on in apprenticeship and learn on the job because there's roles that they could easily fulfill. If I could just quickly on that point, if you're not aware, the Department of Commerce and Department of Labor just finished a 120-day apprenticeship sprint that began in July and just culminated in October. And not only was it an effort to increase awareness of apprenticeships by employers and, and learners, apprentices, uh, it was ultimately an effort to diversify the workforce because much like the community college population, the population that are attracted to apprenticeships need to earn a paycheck. You know, they may be a single mom or they may be supporting their family. They can't take time out to go and get an education or go to training. And so um, our data proved not only did we attract a thousand apprentice, apprentices during that quick four month period, um, but a hundred employer and the demographics of them were very diverse just based on the nature of that opportunity. So I'm a big believer in multiple pathways to the career in cybersecurity. Community colleges is a very underappreciated path as our apprenticeships. I think Rodney brings up a great point. I mean, in terms of sort of what we call at IBM, um, new collar roles. This idea of the job description, you had mentioned that earlier, where um, what we did was we took 50% or so of our positions in this realm and had them remove the four-year college degree portion of it. And what we found was it really opened the aperture of applicants in um, underrepresented, under-resourced, communities. And um, the result was that roughly about 20% of our new hires were people who might not necessarily be degreed, but are certainly really um, qualified to do quite a bit of the work that is what's necessary on the front line in terms of cybersecurity. They're saying that I think it's about 62% of adults over the age of 25 don't have degrees, I believe is the number. And so there's a whole pool of talent out there that'd be perfect for many of the roles. And I would include neurodiversity in that as well. Some of the people that I have hired and worked with that have a, a, a range of things that they, are, that they deal with have been some of the best and most effective employees and humans to work with. A lot of people have the attitude and the aptitude. They just need the opportunity, right? Michael, your turn now. And uh, I do want to point out that I like your Trellux socks you have on there. Yeah, you got to live the brand. <laughs> hey, there you go. got to do it. I want you to uh, address what are the biggest challenges facing cybersecurity today? And what are the tools that leaders need to do to develop the uh, talent landscape? So, I, look, I, I, I think we've all been saying it. The, the panel before us actually talked about it. You know, we have an existential threat. It, it's, there are about 3 million jobs in cybersecurity available globally. Um, uh, and that's the broader view of cybersecurity. And if you, if you shorten that view, close it off a little bit, maybe it's 2 million. In the U.S., it's 1.6 to 2 million roles that are, that are open. Um, uh, and these are these are great these are great jobs, and each one of the panelists actually talked about it. Mm -hmm. We we um, th there there are some things that you can do right away. Um, uh, for Trellix, we've hired about a thousand people so far this year, um, and we've competed against the largest companies. And part of that is we took a very structural approach to this. First thing um, we looked at was our job descriptions. Mm -hmm. There's something called the BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification. You take a look at a job description, you pull out all the things that aren't related to the actual job. You take out experience, you take out a whole bunch of things, and then you add the things that you think are really important for your organization. We did some original research that found that 93% of all cybersecurity professionals said that they learned uh, most of the skills on the job. 
that tells you something. That tells you that we can broaden our aperture and actually have really successful um, candidates and then successful employees. Um, and that's one of the things we did. We looked at every job description and we, we uh, removed that. The second thing um, we did is we looked at, you know, outreach uh, writ large. Um, everybody talks about um, historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic um, uh, universities. And they're tiered in, in, in that group. And so everybody goes to the top two or three universities and that's where they focus. Where, in fact, um, there's a bigger return on investment to actually going to the regional HBCUs. Um, and um, they have cybersecurity programs. They understand um, that this is an opportunity. Uh, and so we focused on that. And then the, the third thing uh, we did is we looked at uh, NGOs or uh, nonprofits organizations like ASE, which is the Hispanic uh, Alliance for Career Enhancement, where we create an accelerator program um, for folks that don't have a four-year degree. Maybe they have an associate's degree um, who have aptitude, and basically you create a certification program that they can go through, and then at the end of it, they get a job. I mean, that, that changes trajectories. Um, cybersecurity pays well. Right, our, our both our technical and our non-technical jobs pay well, and then and then lastly, and, and this is uh, this is important education, um, the K through twelve. I, I can't tell you, I can't stress how important that is. So you start doing some of that work. We've done it here in the U.S. We've done it outside the U.S., and and from that we've gotten internships. Most people, most companies look at internships at the college level. We start right after high school, and we've had some great success. Next year, we'll have 200 internships. This year, we had over 100, of which we've converted 75% into employees. That's, that's extraordinary. You know, I, I think, to your point about K through 12, I do a lot of work with Israel and have for the last 10 years or so, and they've become sort of a very um, center of the universe for cyber tech and um, really advanced technologies. And it's interesting, the approach. I mean, when I think about K through 12, I mean, I really, when you look at their model, it really is like starting a kindergarten. I think that as a country, we really should look at how we approach um, just uh, not only just online safety, but cyber hygiene. If kids are, are savvy enough to have an iPad on the, phone, on the uh, plane, and I see so many really little kids with iPads on planes. <laughs> they should be learning, and it should become a the part of the fabric of our society, um, much in the way that we approach climate change or sustainability or, you know, things as simple as farm-to-table selections when we go to restaurants. That It just should be part of our lexicon. I think um, one thing that I found so encouraging was CISA, did a segment on 60 Minutes that really did such a great job. This was back in the March timeframe of 2022, sort of mainstream the way we think about critical infrastructure and the electric grid. And they plain spoke it because I think a lot of times in cybersecurity, it's sort of held out as this discipline when really it should be just, you know, threaded through everything that we do, but spoken about in a, in a plain way that people can understand all ages, you know, all, all groups, all um, walks of life. You know, it's interesting because if you, if you look at the way Israel uh, approaches it, and quite frankly, Russia and many, many other countries, they look at it as a whole government um, view, right? It starts with curriculum. It moves from curriculum to opportunities and apprenticeships and mentorships and actual assignments. Look, mm -hmm. our enemies, right? Our adversaries um, are really diverse. They don't care the walk of life you come from. They don't care your background. Uh, they want you in. I just want to pick up on something you said about being plain spoken. Um, 
10 years ago, Microsoft was, is, we continue to be, but um, one of the things I got to do was work on expanding access to computer science education for all K-12 students, especially at the high school level. And one of the things we committed to is getting students, <laughs> brace yourself for this, making sure that students actually got high school graduation credit for simply taking AP computer science in high school. Only nine states 10 years ago gave the students credit. Now, we're not talking about a requirement. We're not talking about training teachers. We're talking about making sure that there's an incentive for students to take it. Anyway, today, I'm glad that there's 50 states that give them the credit. It, that's great. And yet, we have very few K-12 computer science teachers. We have, you know, the whole pipeline issue exists. But going back to plain spoken, one of the things that I learned showing up at state capitals, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to travel the country and, and talk with lawmakers, is I just realized we were talking past each other so often in that they would say, oh, don't worry, we're teaching kids how to use Microsoft Word. And so what I think cyber does is gives yet another wonderful sort of shocker and plain spoken moment where we can say our country's at threat, it, you know, we're getting all these threats, we're getting all these attacks all the time. We need foundational skills taking place at K-12. Part of that is computer science. Cyber is a piece of it as well. And let's talk about the specifics of what it is that's needed, because I, I'm not always convinced that all of our lawmakers, without sounding like we're smarter or anything like that, I think that the technology conversation and policy conversations, sometimes they're, we're just missing each other. There's a lot it of is soulful. It is soulful work. <laughs> Right, what we do is soulful work. This is a good thing, and I think um, who doesn't want to be part of? Raise your hand if you don't want to be part of something good. <laughs> I mean, everybody wants to be part of something good, and I think if you get um, folks early in their in their education, early in their careers, um, they'll buy into it. We'll have a stampede. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm not sure people realize that students aren't getting it. Like, for example, 75 percent of the country's community colleges. They do not have an associate's degree in cybersecurity. You know, like kids aren't taking computer science in K-12, but they are in Israel, right? Yeah. And so just shining a spotlight from the business perspective that there's an issue in a simple way, I think is really important. And I think also just informally, people don't understand or realize that there's a lot of free education out there. We have a program called Skills Build. 30 that seeks to educate 30 million people by 2030 and that's and it's completely free you literally go online the courses are available in 12 languages and so some of the um it's almost as if we need a public service announcement that that incentivizes people as well because when you think about it this idea of apprenticeship i know we work on a program that helps to turn apprenticeships into uh, actual college credit for folks. And same thing with um, K through 12, our P12 program does that as well. But this practical application piece is so important in cyber because yesterday's news becomes old oh, really fast. And you really, in order to be able to learn in the space, have to be able to um, have recency and currency and the ability to not just walk out there with theory. And, I'll, you know, that's a, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, within the, within the industry. That was all good. Um, Rodney, I have a question for you. The, the pandemic drove working from home, and we found that it's actually quite successful. People are productive, um, and many organizations are going to continue to work from home. But how do you hire and train um, someone new to cybersecurity when they're working remote. Because learning cybersecurity, no matter which role you're in, it's not easy. And adding remote access on top of it is a little bit harder. Yeah, so let, let me maybe give a few anecdotes. I'll start with one in the federal government. Our U.S. Department of Education, you know, occupies several floors in a building with IT employees. And because of the pandemic, they had to have people work remotely. And after a couple of years, they found out that works okay and they can work remotely. So they ended their lease. They now allow those employees to continue to work remotely. And I think all of us probably have stories like that where there was an awareness that certain jobs could be done at a distance. 
another anecdote was at the beginning of the pandemic, um, a lot of you probably in the government stopped our internship programs, right? Because we couldn't bring students in in person. We couldn't have them on site. Um, I did not jump on that bandwagon. In fact, I was not surprised to learn there were a bunch of students who had already started a virtual internship program because guess who the populations that are reached through virtual internships? Students that are living in rural areas, students that are, are parents or single moms or students who don't have the resources you know, to travel and, and be at a distance, et cetera. So fortunately, we worked with the National Science Foundation and a couple of universities to keep the momentum going with internships by making them virtual. And, and I think that's something we obviously plan to continue indefinitely because there will continue to be circumstances where um, students can't come to be with us for the summer or during the year for that matter. Um, I think the third one that concerned me greatly at the start of the pandemic is the number of women that were leaving the workforce, primarily to take care of children or maybe even parents, whatever their caregiver role might be. And, and now we're starting to hear about that returning worker population, uh, yet that returning worker population still has to deal with the viruses and the R, you know, what, whatever the latest <clears throat> strain of um, things are. And, and many of our organizations have gone to allowing remote work. I have, again, a small number of employees, a majority of them work in other states and work remotely. Um, more flexible telework policies that provides that accommodation. I, I think that's not only a solution to what we've seen happen during the pandemic. I think it is a solution to some of our efforts to diversify the workforce. The one caveat I would give is that works really well for returning workers and maybe more experienced professionals. It is a challenge for new professionals, right? Because especially if they're younger and have never been in a professional setting, they need the mentor, they need the on-site workplace experience. They might even need the um, work ethic that comes with, you know, being in a structured workplace being versus being at home. Uh, but, but I think the pandemic and telework policies, aside from accommodating maybe uh, employers, uh, do a lot to help increase our access to talent. I think the, the one challenge that I see is, is companies um, sort of go to this hybrid so I don't see companies anymore saying we're 100%, um, you know, uh, remote. It's sort of this hybrid environment that we make sure that you don't disadvantage folks that are remote, which tend to be, uh, in, in our world, predominantly women um, uh, and folks that are in rural uh, settings, that they don't get the same promotional opportunities, that they don't get the same increases, the the pay equity component is going to come into play there. So we just got to make sure that as companies evolve their thinking, they also evolve their thinking on how do you measure performance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just another quick anecdote. When we had our student interns on site, we would weekly have a staff lunch with them in the cafeteria. And it was a way to informally mentor them, get to know them, kind of develop a network. And when we moved virtually, we said, well, we can still have virtual lunches together. So we started scheduling these virtual lunches where we'd bring our lunch and have lunch over the video, but have the same conversations. And it was such a great idea because, again, my workforce is remote. We said, let's do this as a staff monthly. So every month we have lunch lunch together. And it's not about work. Work's off the table. It's, you know, we even have, we call it, we're nice. So it's nice breakers, uh, play off of ice breakers, but it's nice breakers just to get to know each other better and help each other out with their own personal lives and growth. Oh, that's wonderful. Alice, I want to um, talk to you about integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into the very fabric of the organizations. Um, it seems like potentially um, embedding diversity and inclusion into strategic plans um, and missions is needed. I think um, I used to work at Intel Security, and I, I think Intel did a really good job of this. They were held accountable for uh, hiring diversity candidates and also um, reaching equity, pay equity across the company. Um, should we embed these kind of policies and hold leaders accountable. Absolutely. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion is core and long standing to our company's ability to achieve our broader mission, which is empowering every single person on this planet to achieve more. Um, we can't get there without being committed to diversity and inclusion. I'm also really, you know, um, proud and feel great about the fact that I have a CEO and executive leaders who talk about this issue all the time and not only talk about it, but 
have specific goals and measures. And I even brought something, a 49 page report that's, <laughs> which is, you know, it's a fascinating um, report in that it really from A to Z talks about what we're doing internally, what we're doing with employees, how we, you know, require every single employee twice a year to have a conversation with your manager about diversity and inclusion, how managers um, are actually their performance is partly paid, you know, based on what they're doing in diversity and inclusion, but then also externally, how we're committed to include, you know, growing inclusive communities across the world. And so what does that require? It might require expanding access to skills. And it goes on and on and on. We have racial inequity, you know, commitments philanthropically. But the great part is that this, it seems like over four years, we've been doing this for four years, printing out this report. Um, it shows growth, but it also reminds us employees that the story never ends and that this is, this is part of our culture. This is part of who we are. And, um, you know, I have a great, I've been at the company for 17 years and Satya Nadella is a really unique um, leader and incredibly empathic and incredibly committed to weaving these concepts and these values into who we are. Absolutely. Um, in the same vein, very proud of the work that Arvind Krishna has put forth for IBM and the goals that have been set forth around this entire space, the work with the 20 HBCUs, um, Skills 30, Skills Build 30 that I talked about before. I do think with diversity and equity, and as you asked the question about goals and how do you weave it into the fabric, I think it's a slippery slope in a way. And the reason why I say that is that it's, it's extremely important as you may have a goal in the organization at a certain level that says, you know, um, you know, these are the percentages that we want to get to, or, you know, you have your revenue goal, you have your um, profit goal, and then you have your diversity goal. And, you know, as that filters into the organization, maybe into mid-management or, you know, in, in this sort of way, it's really important that the diverse candidates and the diverse people who worked real hard to get where they are um, not become, um, you know, sort of what Jaya was saying. I kind of agree with what she was saying that, you know, you really don't want to have your hard work diminished by being just part of a goal, right? And so it's very um, challenging because you really, you know, there is diversity of thought, certainly, and there is diversity of people. And sometimes you find out or you see just organically that sometimes really great teams are really great because they're diverse. But I do think that, um, you know, candidates don't want to, not candidates, but I guess people that work in a company don't want to be just part of some goal or when they're introduced or the narrative around them when they're new and brought into the company is, well, that's our diversity hire. That's our diversity hire. You know, <laughs> and want people want to blend in just like everybody else and really be um, recognized for their skills and, and talents. So the goal piece, even if everybody's bought in on the idea, and it is great to have those discussions and to provide focus on it. You won't, you don't achieve a goal that's not known. So that part's very important, but I think people, uh, people's HR departments need to maybe coach on not being too heavy handed with it. Because on the flip side, it's not just the folks who are diverse that don't wanna be, um, you know, always paint it with the diverse brush. On the other side, those that aren't diverse don't want to feel like, hey, well, you know, what am I, Swiss cheese, am I not valued by the organization anymore? So. You know, to, to build on that, and, and it's funny because uh, Debbie and I didn't know each other prior to this, and so I, we were getting something to drink, and it just came up naturally. The big thing about DE&I, and I think you, you could argue it, but I think you agree, is the I piece. You could have 70% of your population be diverse, but if they're in none of the none of the meetings that actually decisions are being made, you're not really getting the point. Um, uh, and and oftentimes, you know, you get these goals, but they're never at the at the right level. Or, you know, as as I talk with our CEO Brian Palmer, who I guess you'll, you'll see a little bit later, you know, it, it's about progress, right? It's not about a number. 
It's about looking at your leadership and saying, do I have a leadership that is going to holistically bring our best solutions to our clients? Um, uh, and, and, you know, the other, the other thing we talked about is the fact that, and, and most of you have probably heard this, that people like to work or they will hire people that are like themselves. So if your leadership team isn't diverse, you could have all the quotas in the world. You could have every sort of goal. It's very unlikely that you're going to reach it in a way that's going to change the landscape for cybersecurity in your company. Right? So it starts at the top. That's a good point. Well, people want to be respected for the capabilities they bring to the table, for sure. Michael, um, you know, the pandemic stalled gains made uh, to address the pay gap. And some states have recently passed laws uh, showing um, pay um, salary disclosure. What are your thoughts on um, on this? And is that something that we need to do to be more transparent about the salary uh, gaps that exist? Yeah, you know, that's, you know, that topic is, is a pretty interesting one for me, because I don't, I don't know about your companies, but in my organization, everybody's pretty honest and straightforward about um, uh, their salary. So regardless of whether I want to do it or not, it's happening. I think um, uh, the, the truth of the matter is, that our, our bigger issue is making sure that we are diverse, that we have a broad spectrum of folks in our, um, uh, in our company. Uh, so that's, that's one. Two, uh, you have to have, again, I talk about structure. Uh, when you're going through a year-end cycle, which many companies are going through now, you, you have to do a review that says, how, how, of all the increases we're giving uh, for this year, how are women facing? How are people of color facing? Um, um, location differentials. Um, and, and you also have to have that component of meritocracy that plays into it, right? You don't want to work for a company that everybody gets paid the same regardless of their performance because you're going to go right to the lowest common denominator. It's just not uh, healthy for organizations. I think IBM does a really good job of it. I know Microsoft does a pretty good job of that, that whole view. So that's that's how I think about it. I, I'm not afraid about disclosure. Um, I, I just don't think that's the biggest issue we have. Okay, we're nearly out of time, but I want to touch on retention. You know, we spend a lot of time to bring people on board and train them, but we're finding through the pandemic that women in particular are leaving the workforce in record numbers. So what can we do and what are you doing to help diversity hires be set up for success and leadership opportunities that um, they're desiring. Do you want I, to start? I would just say, I know when I started in this space, it was less than 3% women easily. And the first company that I worked for was literally a fraternity. I mean, the guys had uh, hustler screensavers. When you walked into the office, it was, it was a startup. It was kind of wild. And I would just say that, you know, in that environment, being passionate about your work and knowing what it is that you want to do. This is a field where it's kind of hard for people to sort of figure out, you know, career path. And I think it's incumbent on managers to sort of shepherd people because you can become so proficient at the one thing and everybody will want to keep you in that one spot. And there's no growth for the employee if you're not creating a path, and it's you know the the industry is relatively new in, in some respects, and so I think that you know retain part of retaining people is having them have something that they're looking forward to and something that they're working toward and advancing folks and into the next role. That's a, I think that's a huge part, and the you know back to the old inclusion, making sure that everybody's, you know, part of the team, because these teams operate quite a bit like firefighters, at least the frontline folks. And when I say it's a fraternity, it, that's not always a bad thing. Um, sometimes that's a really good thing. It's, you know, it, it should be a fraternity. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny, because I, I totally agree. And, and um, sort of to build on that, one of the things that we've seen is with um, women in particular uh, uh, working from home, um, it, it, 
it, it's been a little bit more difficult to get some of the training um, uh, that traditionally we've done. And um, so we've moved to so that micro learning or nano learning where um, uh, we have uh, uh, opportunities um, where folks can pick a certain set of skills and uh, every other week they will get some training on it that's 15, 20 minutes that they can deploy in their everyday work environment um, uh, and then get feedback on it. So, for example, uh, communication. You know, it, sometimes it's it's tough if you're new into the work environment. You happen to be a woman. You're in the you're in a room of of white middle aged men. There's nothing wrong with you guys, but <laughs> uh, sometimes it's hard to communicate. Sometimes it's hard to come across. So how do you how do you express yourself in a way that gets you heard, um, uh, and and not have sort of um, you know be muted out in the background. And so some of the things that, that we've done is get that micro learning out there, get that feedback out there so that we, we do enhance. So from a retention perspective, folks that have been in that program, 83% um, retention. Yeah, yeah, the point that you make about being heard is really important. That's a, you can't underscore that enough, particularly in cybersecurity. I think that there is this rife sort of imposter syndrome concern that people have because you can't know everything. There's no such thing as a cyber expert per se on everything. It's impossible. And so people constantly fight to try to get as much information or be as smart as they can be on the topic. But I think it's really important for um, underrepresented people, women, um, minorities, everyone that sort of sits in a rarefied seat, so to speak, to um, speak with authority. You know the things you know. Don't um, hold yourself back. Like make sure that you achieve equal business stature with your peers. And, and you know, it's easy to say, be confident, but that's, a, that's almost a practice that you incorporate into your, your way of working before it starts to feel like a, a reality. So like just, don't sell yourself short, I guess. <laughs> I think too, the um, online environment, the Zoom environment, if you will, has brought a barrier for introverts not to contribute. And we have to be intentional about having them contribute. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. I know some of you have questions for our panelists. So uh, if you can catch them at lunch, that would be great. And can you join me in thanking them for their points? Thank you very much. That was really great. I, I actually have some follow-up thoughts, but uh, um, I, will, I will get them on the side as well. Um, we actually are not, you can't really talk during lunch. You can talk on the line to lunch because we're going to have a set, uh, working session lunch. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to go out there. It's a buffet. Sandwiches, though, so you should be able to pick them up pretty quickly. Um, come right back. We're going to eat them in here, and then we're going to have Sasha uh, Romanowski, uh, give his presentation, uh, and first I chat, I'm handing over my MC duties to the great Michael Daniel. So, uh, if you could please join us for lunch uh, and picking up the lunch in the buffet. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me do a wireless. Okay, perfect. So the only thing about the edge, it's off right now. We'll turn it around. Oh, we'll put it
we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce our next uh, presentation, uh, Sasha Romanowski. Um, this is an interesting topic, um, talking about, an, we have long had severity scores for uh, vulnerabilities, um, but we all know that that is only one part of the picture. Um, and another part of the picture is, is anybody likely to do anything with that vulnerability? Because in reality, you want to know both of those things if you actually want to make a decision about what you as an organization are going to do about a vulnerability. And so there's been a lot of hard work um, that has gone into looking at that question. Um, and we're about to have a presentation on uh, one way of looking at that and one way of thinking about that problem in a much more rigorous and evidence-based way. So with that, I will turn it over to Sasha. Excellent. Oops. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is great. I've never done a lunchtime talk before. It's fun watching everyone eat. Uh, so yes, I am Sasha. Uh, I am a policy researcher at RAND. I study data breaches, cost of breaches, litigation around breaches, cyber insurance. In addition, I've done a bit of work with vulnerabilities, as Michael has mentioned, um, try to understand more of the characteristics of these vulnerabilities uh, in an effort to help organizations prioritize, right? So as Eric, as you heard this morning, Eric mentioned, it's not really about what you need to do, it's about what you need to do next. And I think that's a really great way to frame it, right? We're always interested in what is the marginal improvement of the next dollar spent? Where should we spend that next dollar in cybersecurity? Okay, so as, as we mentioned, this is, you know, framing this within the context of today, this is about helping those network defenders better understand and prioritize their vulnerability management. What do you patch next? Okay. Um, so, so, so there we go. Okay. So the exploit prediction scoring system. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a monumental world of known vulnerabilities, over 180,000 of them, which is pretty substantial, 180,000 known vulnerabilities. That's a lot to deal with. And any organization of any kind of size is going to have thousands and tens of thousands of vulnerabilities that they'll detect when they run their scanning systems. Fine. The trouble is, the reality is that only a very small percent of those 180,000 are ever going to be exploited by anyone, which means as a network defender, you really only care about the red circle. You don't care about the other circle. You care about that which is relevant to you and will be exploited. That's a really hard problem to solve. We don't know ex ante what is going to be exploited. The best we can do is create predictions, estimates of what will be exploited. Uh, so the, what people like to say is that the current way of doing it is based on severity. So the common vulnerability scoring system, uh, people think of as really a severity system, a, a score from zero to 10, 10 being really bad. And absent any other information, how should you prioritize? Well, you'd kind of want to prioritize based on severity of the vulnerability. What is the impact of the system if it were to be exploited? And that's entirely reasonable. Uh, the trouble is, again, that only a small percentage of those vulnerabilities, even if they could lead to a complete compromise of your system, will be exploited. So it's really the intersection. Does this work? No. It's, oh, it's really the intersection of those circles in this diagram that we want to understand and protect. So organizations may have different strategies, let's say, to um, addressing their vulnerability management practice. They may say, look, everything that's super important and nine and above, we're going to a patch. And that might be really efficient in a way that you're only patching most of the time the stuff that you think will be exploited. Trouble is you're missing a lot. So maybe they expand their scope to say, okay, everything is seven and above, seven, eight, nine, 10. Trouble is you're increasing the amount of patching of effort greatly. Okay, so you see the problem here. So I think, we think, many people think that we need a better solution. If CDSS is really good 
at capturing the severity of this impact? What about this exploitability? Is there a standard, a system, a model, a framework, or whatever that we can use to understand the threat, so the probability of exploitation, and the time-changing threat? So unlike CVSS, unlike the severity, that is kind of based around the immutable characteristics of a vulnerability. The score isn't going to change very much over time. The vulnerability is what it is. Threat changes. This is dynamic. This is going to change over days, months, weeks, and years. So um, we haven't had this before. So what I'm about to share is an effort by a bunch of us volunteers to create this new capability that I would argue has never existed before. So EPSS, an open, a data-driven um, scoring system. It's based on whatever statistics and models, but it is data-driven, unlike CVSS, in that we collect data from different sources, from different organizations around the world on observed exploit activity. Again, attempted exploit activity. And we combine these data, we match them with other features of the vulnerability, and we create a model. And it could be a regression. You just, I mean, you could think of a table. Every row represents a vulnerability. All of the columns represent different characteristics of that vulnerability. And um, you could run a regression, a simple regression to estimate the probability. We've gone through that and we've evolved it over time to create a more sophisticated machine learning model, uh, which is very nice. But what it does is produce what we think estimates of the actual exploitation, the probability that this thing will be exploited specifically the next 30 days, like as of today, as of the day when the, the score was produced. So we have these probability scores between zero and, and 100%. We also provide a ranking for those um, uh, who are interested in that. The scores are freely available, all 180,000 of them. You can go and download the data today if you want. Um, you may ask yourself, why are we doing this? We're not getting paid for any of this work. Uh, we do it because we love doing it, right? This isn't sort of what we do. This is, this is why, this is, this is about, we have this innate interest in creating something sort of for a greater good. But so it's there, it's free for you. Um, whoops. Uh, it is a special interest group, it's sort of a birds of feather, a community of, of researchers, of other academics, of government folks. There are some members here in the audience. It's nice to see you all. Uh, uh, not just in the US, but internationally. And it's sort of managed, you could say, under the auspice of FIRST. So FIRST is an international nonprofit organization of incident response, computer response um, teams from around the world. We have 180, sorry, 150 plus um, members of these different organizations. Uh, we have email, we have Slack channels and conversations, and anyone is welcome to participate and, and, and contribute. You're also welcome to lurk. You don't have to do anything if you don't want to. Uh, we've published a couple papers already. We have a third one on the go that's going to talk about some of the um, data analysis that we've done, we've been able to collect and analyze uh, so far. And I'll actually show you some of the results in a bit. So what can you do with this? Well, one thing you can do with it is that for every vulnerability, you can find, you can look up the CVSS score, the severity score, uh, which is mapped on the x-axis, and you can look up the probability score, and you can map all of that on a scatter plot like this. It doesn't really matter what, so each dot is a vulnerability. Um, this is kind of from a collection of vulnerabilities here. But what this does is kind of give you a risk picture. I'm not going to claim it's, it's, it's the end-all be-all, and it's certainly comprehensive of your environment. It's going to change whatever. But what you can do, you can go to the IT people, the security people, and you can collect from them, tell me all the vulnerabilities that we have on our network now. They should be able to provide that. You can go look up the scores, and you can plot them on this. You can produce this for your environment today. You can also produce it a month from now, two months from now, quarter from now, and see the change over time. So it gives you, I would argue, a representation of your attack surface, your organization's attack surface. You could do this for one system, one laptop. You could do this for one office. You could do this for your whole enterprise. It scales that way, and it's pretty, pretty fun to see. 
The point of this is that I think it helps you prioritize. Again, going back to the story of prioritizing and understanding what to do next. Um, the story, I mean, it's not super sophisticated. You look at the high highs, you do those first. You worry about the low lows afterwards. And how you get from uh, the top right to the bottom left is, is, is sort of up to you. Some people might say that, look, CVSS, we don't understand uh, the math behind it. The metrics are a little kind of fuzzy and, and we just don't like them. We think that threat is really the most important thing. So maybe you take a path up on the top. You go after the high probability vulnerabilities first. That's fine. You can do that. Or you say, look, well, we don't, EPSS is nice, but we really believe that these vulnerabilities that could lead to a full compromise are pretty important. So we want to go after those. So you kind of follow a path on the bottom and, and all that's fine. But my point is that this is, this is possible to do now. And again, you can see the change in the evolution of the attack surface over time. You can also look at your S-bomb. So for those who are uh, uh, producing S-bombs or collecting them from their vendors, you can create exactly the same kind of map. And, I mean, it's no surprise that this looks pretty much like, uh, like the image before. The idea being that for every product listed on that bill of materials, for each version, you can look up or you should be able to look up the known vulnerabilities for that product. You can look up the CVSS score and the EPSS score and you can plot them. So this could be the attack surface of a particular application based on the SBOM. And again, you can see it change over time should you want to understand how that vendor is managing the risk of their vulnerabilities. You could also use to compare across products. That might be a little hard. Um, how are you really supposed to internalize the dot configuration on one chart versus another? But it provides an opportunity that, again, didn't exist before. Uh, there are lots of great inferences that we can draw and sort of descriptive statistics that we can collect based on these data. So one is, okay, I, I told you before, only a small percentage of all vulnerabilities are being exploited. Why should you believe me? Well, let me show you some data. So uh, first we're showing the number of exploited. So based on these uh, 5 million exploit attempts we see. So each data point, so 5 million data points of exploit activities collected from the real, real world, representing a little over 9,000 unique vulnerabilities, right? So 9,000 divided by 180,000, right? It's a pretty small percent. This shows you um, based on the year that the CV, the vulnerability, CV is a vulnerability, based on the year the vulnerability was publicly disclosed, how many, to, uh, how many were, uh, were exploited? What happened to the Zoom people? Is there an AV person who should take care of the Zoom people? There we go. Okay. Uh, we can also show you the number of published CVs. So how many vulnerabilities are being disclosed every year? Well, this is, I mean, this may seem shocking, and I think it kind of is. There are a lot of vulnerabilities being discovered and a lot more every year relative to the year before. That's, that's a lot of work for a lot of people to find them and to manage them. Like, um, and that's, that doesn't bode well for network defenders who need to protect against all these vulnerabilities. Uh, my expectation is that this is gonna continue increasing. But what we can do is kind of divide you know, one chart by the, by the other and we can come up with an estimate. Well, it's not an estimate. It's an actual value of the percent of vulnerabilities that are being exploited. So I said a small percent, so 5%. So if you learn nothing else from this talk, you can go home and tell your kids when they ask you, mommy, and daddy, how many vulnerabilities are being exploited in the wild? You can say, daughter, son, it's 5%. And they can go home. My kids aren't going to care, but your kids might. Um, but this is really useful to know, I think. It gives us a good picture about what's happening out there in the world. We may have our little, what was it, a soda, soda straw that we look through and we may observe some activity. This gives us, I think, a bigger soda straw to look through. Okay. Um, an age-old question in this world of information security is, for any given vulnerability, is it being exploited more over time or less over time? 
That's a really hard question to answer because um, we have conflicting views. On one hand, we may think vulnerabilities are being exploited more over time because over time, more is known about the vulnerability. We understand more the dynamics about how it works, what the effect is. The ability to uh, package that vulnerability up into a piece of malware to create a point and click exploit increases over time. So it makes it easier for the attackers to use, to bundle, to deploy. So we might think exploitation activity increases. On the other hand, we might think it decreases because months, years go by, people get bored of it, new vulnerabilities are discovered, they wanna go after the new shiny thing, they forget about the old thing. So what's the answer? I know this question is burning on your mind. I'm here to answer that. So, oh, well, here's a description of that. Might be exploited more over time, it becomes easier to, um, uh, to exploit the thing. On the other hand, it might be exploited over time. Um, what do we think? Okay, this is good. This gives me a great chance. So, so the show of hands, who thinks vulnerabilities are exploited more over time? So the left, uh, the left graph. Okay, one, three, five, thank you. 10-ish, okay. And then how many people think it's decreasing over time? Hey, Jay, your, your, your hand counts for two, okay. Uh, sort of the same amount. A lot of you non-answered, non-committal. Oh, shoot. Oh, damn it. I get too excited to press you the button. Okay, so the answer is, um, well, at first, their exp exploitation is increasing with time. Now, notice on the bottom here, so this is the age of the vulnerability. So it's, as time goes on, effectively, this is in years. So in, in, after about four years, so if you can consider the, the uh, vulnerabilities up to about age four, exploit activity is increasing over time. What happens after that? Ah. It's decreasing over time. So between four years and eight years, I guess attackers get bored. Why do they get bored of it? I don't really know. I really want to study that. Um, but something happens around four years old where people are less interested. Maybe they find other things. Maybe all those factors that I was talking about before come into reality. Somebody has an answer. I'm just wondering because by the time do you think that some companies might find a study and more Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, there's less interest by attackers. Firms may have patched the vulnerability. And so what are we going to do? Um, uh, I'll, I'll answer that in a little bit. Yeah. There's also depending on who your audience is, you're moving to new product lines. So people are confusing. Sure, software ages out, right? right? It's, 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 um, it's removed from the network, the new versions and, and whatever. So four years, activity is increasing. Four to eight years, activity is decreasing. What happens after that? What? Suddenly, there's a resurgence of this activity. Now it becomes cool again to exploit these vulnerabilities. Why does that happen? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I wish I did. This is part of the fun of not just the effort of creating this thing for everyone to use, but of being able to collect and study these data over time. As far as I know, no one has ever seen this before. Certainly the first time I've, maybe the second time I've presented it to any kind of group. So you really are kind of getting a, um, a sneak peek at this. And I guess for anyone online who's watching it too. I should also say that these are preliminary findings. We need to confirm this, and I should have a caveat there. But um, but this is kind of mind blowing, right? First, we see uh, uh, an increase in activity, then it's a decrease, then there's this bump. I don't know what's going on. This is part of what we'll look at, and then after that, sort of as expected, people get bored and the vulnerabilities go away, probably for all the reasons um, we mentioned before. Great. Any questions? Okay. Uh, this is also kind of mind blowing. So are hackers exploiting newer or older vulnerabilities? So I, I showed you one way of answering that question a second ago, meaning that it increasing over time and decreasing. Da, 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 da. But if we just kind of take all of the vulnerabilities as a big lump, are they generally the newer ones or are they generally the older ones? Well, this is another way to present the information. The insights are these two. Two thirds of all the vulnerabilities that have been exploited are greater than five years old. 
A third, 37% of them, are greater than 10 years old. What? So not only, now again, these are attempts, right? It's not a successful attack, let's say. It's not a successful breach, it's attempted. Um, and, and moreover, well, let me get into some of the reasons. But what this is saying is that of all those vulnerabilities that are attempted to be exploited, a third of them are attacking vulnerabilities more than 10 years old. What? People have systems that are 10 years old that are unpatched for which vulnerabilities exist? And I guess the answer is yes, they sure do. They shouldn't, of course, but they do. Yes? For example, in the healthcare industry, you can see some devices that are still using Windows 3.1. Yeah. Windows 3.1. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So fair point. So the point is that, look, some people, some organizations just need to be running these old systems. It's too expensive. They're unable for whatever reason to patch them, to deploy new stuff, whatever. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. At the same time, I mean, come on, right? I mean, there is sort of a responsibility, but you know, that's fair. Um, so, uh, but still, so two thirds of the vulnerability, more than five years old. I think that's mind blowing. Um, now it may also be true that this represents, so uh, it is important to think about the data generating process by which I mean these data are collected largely from network sensors, some host-based sensors, but from network sensors, intrusion detection systems. They have their signature base, they're looking for a certain set of vulnerabilities. If they see one, it triggers an alert, and that's what this is showing. It may be possible that there are uh, scripts, automated scripts, not from malicious people, just automated scripts, scanners, Shodan, gray noise, whatever. We're kind of scanning the internet for things. And some of those scripts use um, uh, to, they would trigger signatures that are old. And so this means nothing. That could be the case. It's also the case that people are using very old systems, as we heard, um, and, and understanding the difference. So maybe what we do is we shave off some numbers, some percent here of, of the older ones. And so the graph might look a little different. I don't think it would look materially different. And I think there's a lot of other analysis that we could do here, and we will do, to look at variation across kind of vulnerability, across system, across application, is it web-based, is it database, is it da-da-da-da? Yeah. Could there be more players in the game, more people reselling older malware? And that's what you're seeing because you have a lot of ransomware service groups that are reselling you know, malware that was created years ago. And now you have more cyber criminals coming into the market, purchasing something that was created years ago, focused on vulnerability that was new back in the day. It could be, it could be. So if there are, uh, lots of hackers, lots of criminals. Yeah, I guess buying, right? So malware is a service and they're buying the cheap and easy things, uh, bits of exploit code that use vulnerabilities from long ago that that could represent, it, it could be. Uh, yeah. Do we have data sets that look at hits as opposed to attempts, meaning successes, um, to compare this graph with? Uh, I do not. Um, those data, I mean, they exist, uh, but you could imagine what it would take to kind of collect it enough of it to make some useful inferences. Um, there are data sets on breaches, we know. Uh, does that exactly get at your question? It might, but what we don't know from those data are how many, how many are caused by exploitation of a specific vulnerability. It would be lovely, here's a call out to everyone, um, to, to do a better job of, of tracking that information. If we had better information about the cause of, vulner, cause of, of data breaches down to the vulnerability that was exploited, that would be re, really useful to understand. Now, maybe um, DHS's new um, uh, cybersecurity safety uh, review board will be able to you know, create some momentum behind that. Um, uh, that would be super. Anyway. Uh, okay. So for those mathematically inclined, um, one of the other problems, it sounds like we're running out of time. This is really sad. I'm just getting into it. 
uh, is how to convey probabilities. So for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, people are not very good at estimating probabilities, especially low probability events. And so we have this ongoing conversation, and, and Michael has heard this, um, is how do we convey, how do I, how do I meaningfully convey to you the probability of exploit is uh, 1.456 versus 1.873. Like, does that mean anything to you? It's hard for me to do. Um, and I think it's hard for everyone to do. So we try and find better ways of, of conveying the information that is meaningful. It's a struggle. Happy to hear any, um, any recommendations. Um, you're asking yourself, I know, how can I help Sasha with this effort? Thank you for asking. Um, there are two ways. You could try it. Download the data, do whatever you like with them, apply it to your organization, get the security folks, tell them about you heard this wonderful presentation and hey, they should try this new thing and let me know. Let me know if it works or if you think it's crap and you don't want to touch it, that's fine. Um, happy to hear that, but the data are there for you. Also, um, we are nothing uh, without the data from the data providers. So if any of you represent organizations or have friends and organizations that have these sensors, these intrusion detection systems that collect the data and are interested in collaborating with us and we go through whatever agreements, we would love to have that because the more information we have, the better our inferences are, the better estimates, uh, the better we can offer these, um, these data for everyone and hopefully make everyone happy. So uh, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, do we still have time for questions? Unfortunately, no. Okay, I've taken too much time. Uh, so. No questions. Okay. Let's give Sacha another round of applause for a very interesting topic. And you can hit him up uh, outside. Um, the uh, This is an ongoing project, um, and Sasha does not give credit enough to him and Jay and the others that have been leading this through um, through the process. And you can imagine that in the Slack channel, there's lots of very calm and unemotional discussions. Yes, it's like the normal cybersecurity discussions um, in the Slack uh, channels and groups on this. So it's an ongoing project and it's uh, really great to really great to see. Uh, but now um, we are going to move to a fireside chat um, and um, we are going to, uh, I'm very excited to uh, welcome uh, Brian Palma and uh, Kimba Walden uh, to the stage for a discussion. I feel like I should turn on a fireplace or something for you, but um, you know, they, uh, um, both friends of mine, and I'm very glad to have them uh, have them here. Is Kimba actually ready? <laughs> so, um, top hat, cane. I'll do some more dancing while we uh, finish out the mics. But that, um, but we're very uh, glad to have the um, the deputy national security uh, national can't even speak national cyber director here uh, to talk in, in this space on the policy issues that are important, and there are certainly. Uh, a lot of them. So I think that um, the the environment that we're in, you've, we've already heard a lot of the discussion from the luminaries panel and from um, the diversity panel. Uh, now in this discussion about the rate of vulnerability exploitation, you've heard the presentation from CISA this morning. Um, all of those are uh, indicative of the deep policy challenges that uh, that we face. Um, and now we actually have an office in the executive office of the president, part of the White House that's dedicated specifically to tackling those challenges as a cybersecurity challenge. Um, and that's an enormous step forward in, uh, in our policy environment. Uh, so with that, I will still keep talking. Um, so I'm still talking. Yes. All right. We're good. Excellent. Good. We're headed. All right. Great. Did you tap me? Yeah, I did. I was, I, but I was running out of things to vamp. But please, welcome to the stage, Kimba and Brian. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Hello. How's everyone? Excited to be here. Oh, thanks so much. As Mike said, um, am I hot? It's working? Yeah. I got a loud voice, so I probably don't need a mic, but maybe this one will work. Hello, hello. 
No? Virtual people can't hear? How are we doing? Turn on mic. Hello? HH4, please. Hello? HH4? HH4. There we go. Look at that. Working well. Excellent. Well, excited to be here. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I am Brian Palma. I'm the CEO of Trellix, and I am very honored to be here with Kemba. I'll let you introduce yourself, although I think everyone knows who you are. Yeah, I see some former colleagues from DHS and some of my current colleagues. I'm Kemba Walden. I'm the Principal Deputy National Cyber Director. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I think there's applause for that. Yes. So look, we're going to try to make this mildly entertaining. It's after lunch. And I think there's a lot of great topics that we've talked about. So, you know, I wanted to start off. I think it's been, have you been there just over a year now? Is that right? It feels like two years, it but it's been six months. Six months. All right. You said two years. Uh, that's funny. Uh, okay. So obviously the office of the National Cybersecurity Directorate seems to be hitting its stride. You know, the first question I had is when you think about the strategic imperatives, talk to me a little bit about how you're acting on those and, and the momentum you're building. Oh, I'd be happy to. So let me just start with the reason why we exist. And you've heard this in various forms, but it helps set the context for what I'm about to explain, what we've done over the course of the last year. Um, the reason we exist is to make sure that everyone's able to thrive and prosper in our internet, in our interconnected society. And I envision an internet that is secure, resilient, and equitable, um, and reflective of our society, which, which should be secure, resilient, and equitable. Um, and that's done in an international context, right? Our security is very much dependent upon country X's security. Their security is dependent upon ours. So it's in an international context. So with that framing in mind, oh, there's light. Um, with that framing in mind, uh, we a lot of we've done we've had a lot of activity over the course of the past year. I've been a part of the office for six months, but we've been appropriated for about a year. And so, in my mind, though we were authorized in January of 2021, and, and Chris was confirmed in April, we've really gotten rolling starting in November of last year. Um, so we've done a number of things. The first pivotal moment in our in our history, in our short history, uh, is what we've done with on the eve of the Ukraine uh, aggression, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, we were able to, we were part of the machine that declassified or found classified information that would be useful to those that operate in Ukraine or with Ukraine um, in anticipation of some retaliatory measure. Um, that was a different, a net difference in how we view public-private partnership. Um, and so one of our tenants is to ensure that we have active, actual public-private collaboration. I see some of my um, former colleagues from DHS, and I know that it's like um, nails on chalkboard when you say information sharing, right? Um, they're smiling, so I think they agree. Um, but we've really taken that and evolved. Um, taken that a step further. Uh, and so what happened? Um, for a lot of reasons, Russia is unsuccessful in Ukraine. One of those reasons I like to think is because we shared actionable information to those entities that could do something. So we're double downing on that model. And so over the course of the year, you've seen that we've done a number of executive fora, right? We will share classified information with um, Committing officials, that's important, committing officials across a variety of, of markets. So, for example, the electric vehicle market, the health sector are two notable examples in my mind. Share classified information, share classified threat information, in some cases classified vulnerability information, which, you know, married together means risk. Um, and then we bring in um, additional policymakers, additional stakeholders for a conversation about what do we do next? How do we collaborate? What are, what are the insights that we both bring to bear to do something next? Uh, and so we saw that clearly in the electric vehicle um, forum, for example, the Department of Energy was there, Department of um, Transportation was there so that we were able to really have that uh, operational conversation on the heels of that one-time read-in of threat and vulnerability information. Um, so that's the kind of work that we're pulling, pushing forward. That's what we've done. Uh, we'll see that is married up with uh, the administration's bipartisan infrastructure law. 
uh, and the uh, Inf Inflation Reduction Act in particular have funding available for electric vehicles. There's a move towards um, securing our climate, right? Or move towards uh, um, doing something responding to climate change, but we're doing that for society's benefit and we incorporate cybersecurity in all of those measures, right? So that's how we come, we've come to the EV system, for example. That's just one of many examples. Sure. Um, and I would love to talk to you about all the different things that we're doing, but I just wanted to give you some highlights. No, no, I think that that makes sense. And at the at the risk of being nails on the chalkboard, I do want to talk a little bit about collaborating with industry, mm -hmm. specifically Executive Order 14028. So could you tell us a little more about that and how you think that's going and, and your thoughts on that? Sure. I think, so look, we in the federal government have to eat our own dog food. If we're going to increase cybersecurity, um, for the whole of nation, we've got to we've got to do our work in the federal systems, right? And we do that in collaboration, obviously, with private sector. But that's what 14028 really represents: is the work that we have to do in order to be able to um, increase cybersecurity. So we've been implementing ONC, we meaning ONCD has been implementing the administration's executive order, <clears throat> you know, with the zero trust and the multi-factor authentication, etc. We've been taking those experiences and really pushing forward um, our zero trust architecture <coughs> opportunities. Um, one of the wonderful things about the Office of National Cyber Director, if I can just do a public service announcement first, is that we have uh, dual hatted as part of our organization. The federal CISO, who's a part of OMB, is also the, the Deputy National Cyber Director for Federal Security. Um, what that does is that helps us help OMB and OMB help us. We work by, with, and through each other. And you will have seen that in implementation of 14028, but also in the work that we've done on zero trust architecture, right? So for example, um, we have taken the experiences and mandates required in executive order on, on using our procurement power to really scale security. Um, we've done that, we issued OMB issued a, a guidance document associated with that procurement power, um, but we didn't want uh, to, to sort of implement a FAR rule that would hit the, the vendor community like a ton of bricks, right? So we wanted to be able to start with guidance so that vendors and the, and the federal enterprise together could prepare, could figure out what works, what doesn't work, when then we're, we're having a, a listening session soon in order to get to that feedback, sort of, okay, what is working, what isn't working, so that as we start crafting that FAR rule, um, we're doing it in, an, in a way that can, be, that can be executed and serve the purpose that we're seeking to serve, would be one example of that. Another would be our OMB on the, on the management side, the spring guidance that uh, Director Young and Director Inglis signed out together, um, sort of being able to take our budgeting authorities in ONCD, um, our ability to look across across programs together, hand in hand with OMB, to really put money where where our priorities are, um, and that spring guidance was a, a great opportunity for that sort of management work to be done. So we've been we've been sprinting a marathon. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point, right? Mm -hmm. Is putting the money behind it in a unified way. I mean, yeah, that's a key to driving that, the, driving that change. So it's it's great to see that. I think the second piece is you know that everyone's kind of thinking about is the cybersecurity strategy. Yeah. And you know we're getting near the holidays, and sometimes people are giving gifts. I don't know the timing on that, <laughs> but uh, but many of us are excited about it, right? And just wondering, you know, your thoughts on the themes for that. How will it differ from the previous strategy and when might we expect it? <laughs> I would love to be able to give you a holiday gift <laughs> in the form of the strategy. Look, we're, we're really proud of what we have done so far. And I, I want to thank, there are a lot of you in this room um, that might have seen some of the details of the strategy and really provided input. And that was intentional. Um, you know, we had over 300 engagements. We've engaged in our agency. We really wanted this to be a national cybersecurity strategy, national meaning not just ONCDs, um, not just federal departments and agencies, but yours, academia's, uh, nonprofit sector. 
it's international in scope, right? It is a national cybersecurity strategy. Um, I, so I can't give you details about when it's sure. going to be out. I figured, I'd try. I I figured can, I'd try. You can always ask, <laughs> um, but I can give you some themes and sort of what's new in this strategy. Excellent. Um, so what's, what's new from my perspective is that we've, we've really thought about where the risk of cyber lies. It's really right now with the end user, with individuals, it's with my mom. It's with my 10 year old daughter, my seven year old son. It's the end user, the small business. It's the customer that really bears the brunt of the cybersecurity risk, right? So we've taken the approach and we meaning the nation has taken the approach in the strategy to really shift the balance so that we're not um, bearing risk on those that don't have the power or the means to buy it down. We're making investments necessary to shift that risk. So from customer to provider, from small to big, and I include federal enterprise as part of the big, right? That where we can bear the risk and buy it down. Um, so that's one theme that you'll see. And we all know in this room that we don't get to zero risk, right? right? There's just no such thing. You have residual risk. And so what do you do? You insure it sometimes. But for us, you'll see the other central theme is, is resilience, right? And that's really the focus. It's resilience in what do you do with that residual risk? So we make what we have. We do near-term investments uh, for, to make what we have defensible. But then what are those strategic investments for making sure that we remain resilient? Right, so you'll see things in the near term in there uh, about um, light touch regulation, right? So, so, and but no lighter, okay? But the point of that is uh, to be able to uh, have an even playing field so that we encourage those that are able to bear the risk to make the proper investments. Um, and, and to even out the playing field, you have some entities that will are, are all in investing all in and some that haven't don't do anything. The idea is to bring everybody to the same space, right? So you'll see some uh, details about that, about um, sharing, finding ways to, we know that the large theme is that we are able to share classified information to those that are action taking, drawing on that. So now we need to start talking about how do we um, execute that? How do we, wh what's the technology that we need? How do we innovate in that space to be able to do it? Um, Long-term investments are are things like um, like do we what do we do about um, market forces? What do we do and what do we, how do we evolve so that we're not just relying on market forces? And I can't give away too many details because it's you know it's not final, but just imagine all the things, all the tools that we're not using. Um, that we could be using and investing in those tools. Another strong piece of that was the long-term investment. I know that's important to you because of the work that you do um, is workforce. What do we do with people? Uh, and there'll be a workforce strategy. I'm sure we'll talk about that. That drops off of this strategy once it's published. But what, do we, what are the investments that we make in people? The other um, piece that you'll see is, is, I just want to make two more points about the strategy and then we can move on. I know I'm taking a long time talking about this. I think this is important. Hey, Dia Kuski, how are you? <laughs> um, we, uh, we, I lost my train of thought for a second from Mike. <laughs> um, two more pieces. Uh, that's in the international context. We had 300 reviewers or so, including some international allies and partners. And so you'll see a convergence of, of some of the themes that we're talking about now with our international allies. The other piece that you'll see is um, an assignment of roles and responsibilities at the highest level, right? Um, one of the vulnerabilities that's often overlooked is, is the gap between who's accountable for what and who's responsible for what. So if you're not guarding the gates, and some of you have heard me say this, if you're not guarding the gates, uh, the transgressor is going to take the easiest path in right through the front door. Uh, and so you'll see some light role assignments in there. Um, that will help inform what will then become implementation plan. And I think I got that right. I'm looking at Matt Chabot, who teaches governance. Uh, but the, that's that's an important piece of, of the strategy that you'll see. Excellent. Well, great to get an update on that. And yeah. Maybe not a 
not a holiday gift, but maybe Valentine's Day. We'll work for that. We'll work for that. Um, you, you did bring up one of my favorite topics, which is the workforce. Uh, and I think, you know, from my perspective, having started in this industry over 20 years ago, we had a gap then on cybersecurity talent. That gap is widened now to, by our estimates, over 3 million people, um, which is a real problem, especially when our adversaries are training cyber warriors right through compulsory military service on a daily basis, thousands of folks. I know you share it. I know uh, Director English shares it. I know Jen shares it. Um, and Chris talked about this at the uh, National Cyber Workforce and Education Summit in July. He made some commitments around um, K-12 education. And then in October, you guys released the um, RFI related to the insight and expertise around cyber workforce. I'd love to hear your, you know, we've been, Mike Garcia, our Chief Human Resources Officer was on earlier. We've done after, if you haven't gone out and saw my soulful work speech from last year's RSA, you should, you should look at that. And we're doing many of similar things that you're doing, right? Working with organizations to bring in mid-career professionals through apprenticeship, training through internships. We think K-12 is a big part of that. But can you talk a little bit about how you're progress, progressing on those commitments? And then what can folks like myself and others do to help accelerate? Sure. Let me let me set the stage on this workforce a little bit first, and then I'll drill down into some details. So, the, you know, we had a, like you said, a summit, a, a really productive summit. Um, we had the Secretary of Homeland Security there. We had the Secretary of Commerce there, Secretary of Labor there, um, as well as one of the undersecretaries from education there. Uh, and you really need all, all pieces, right, to have an effective workforce and education strategy to have some impact, right? You need... Um, education piece, right, the pipeline, um, you need the labor piece for skilling apprenticeships, but you also need the end result jobs, right, so commerce, um, and this is all done because in my mind it is a national security concern that we are, we don't have uh, a full complement of cybersecurity workers in this country, but it's also, um, going back to commerce, an economic opportunity, right, so we are the Office of the National Cyber Director, meaning that we, only, we not only worry about national security, but we work, worry about economic opportunity, technical innovation. All these pieces are wrapped into workforce. Uh, and so we started looking at it, and which led to the summit. We realized that there are 700 and counting thousand um, unfilled jobs with the word cyber and IT in them, right? That's a problem. It's a national security problem, but it's also an economic opportunity. But then we started sort of coming out from that middle, that, that center piece, figuring out what are the jobs that implicate cyber and how well are they doing in cybersecurity awareness. And that's people like me, policymakers, lawyers, the assembly worker, the CEO, the accountants all implicate cyber. What is their cyber awareness? And then you look even further, what's the pipeline? And you focused a lot here. What's the pipeline for cyber? Um, that's K through 12. Those are retirees that are using this space. Those are people coming home from the military, reskilling, upskilling, we're moving broadband out to rural and urban areas. What is their skilling? What, what is the what, sort of, what is the pipeline? Um, recognizing that people are in cyber, we developed it, we use it, we're not around it, under it. So this is a people-centric space, a people-centric problem. So what has happened since then? Um, the Department of Labor announced, Department of Labor and Commerce announced uh, at our summit in July that they were starting a registered uh, apprenticeship program dedicated to cyber. Um, and so they started, they did a sprint. Um, the sprint concluded at around the time the president uh, issued, uh, uh, declared an apprenticeship week. I was able to travel with the first lady to Chicago to launch Apprenticeship Week, where we had more entrants in the registered agent, uh, registered, registered agent, registered apprenticeship program. And I have some numbers here. I'm not Jen Easterly. I can't memorize all of the numbers. But um, as a result of that sprint, uh, we have 194 cybersecurity related programs that are registered. Um, that represents 120 occupations in that in sort of a cyber. Um, more than 7,000, I even heard from um, Secretary Walsh's staff, it's probably closer to 8,000, apprentices have been hired. Um, that's impactful over, over that 120-day sprint. 
Um, over a thousand of those 7,000 were from the private sector and of those private sector apprentices, and this is important for a lot of reasons, 42% um, were people of color, 32% were female, and prior to the sprint, the numbers were 27% and 28%, right? We have to recognize that diversity is America's superpower. That this is something that, you know, where we're not like all the others. We have significant diversity of thought, diversity of ability. We, we, need, to, we need to leverage that um, to make our, our nation a little bit more secure. So that with that in mind, what can you do to help? Well, so we, we had this 120 day sprint, but these registered apprenticeships are available um, all year round, right? This is something, this is what the Department of Labor executes on a regular basis. So to the extent that you have an enterprise that wants to be able to enable this, these apprenticeships, let's do that. The other piece I can say, um, just thinking about some of the challenges and, and hurdles associated with upskilling and reskilling and start to rethink how you um, value, and you, you know, you've talked about this, how you value um, community colleges, historically black universities, yep. How do you value skills over certifications? Do you really need a, a, a master's degree to execute this specific job, or do you need these four or five skills? Do you need this certification? Do so. We have to start thinking about this. Why are these certifications so expensive? Right. Are and, they accessible? Yeah, and that and that's a huge point. Yeah. Here we have this shortage, but we have all these constraints on the system. Yeah. So it's not even a master's <laughs> degree. It's do you need a college education? Right. The answer is no. The leading professor from Stanford in computer science puts his curriculum on the web. Many people are self-educating themselves. Right. We're in a different market than we were ten years ago. We have to provide access to those people. To your point about broadband to these communities, we want to have. A more diverse workforce, but yet we have all these criteria, yeah. for you, right? And all those are hurdles, especially for people that we want to bring from diverse backgrounds. So I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Question on the apprenticeships. So can I sign up for 20? <laughs> 20? Michael's here. Well, we'll take 20. <laughs> 20 in the back. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we're, that. we're on. No, we're not joking. Good. We've been doing it ourselves. Oh, we, we found it to be, yep. Trellix is committed. <laughs> okay. We're in. Signed up for 20. Uh, 420. Okay, okay. good. We'll good. Done good. <laughs> Love that. Um, all right, let's switch gears real quick. So incident reporting, um, cyber incident reporting, ransomware reporting is getting some momentum. I, some of the challenges for that, if you're you know, on my side or the CIOs and CEOs that I talk to, different reporting requirements, right? There's some new laws that are going to have some reporting. There's SEC. Obviously, there's other regulatory bodies in Europe and Asia and Latin America. Talk to me a little bit about how you see that developing and, and how you're thinking about that. Okay, sure. Well, I mean, as, as most of you know, it's difficult to manage what you don't measure, right? And right now, we don't have a good measure of what's happening, what are what's happening, what the consequences of these incidents are. What's the consequences of ransomware attacks? How many ransomware attacks do we have? We don't have a good measure, good data in order to be able to manage it. Um, and so that's what incident reporting is getting to. Uh, in, on the SEC side, they're getting to investor protections, for example. Uh, so we have good reason to really focus in on incident reporting, and but we also have good reason for harmonizing that exactly. process. I think that's the key. Right? Um, we understand that we're only gonna do well if we get good data. <clears throat> Um, you're only going to be able to give good data if it's clear what we need and why we need it and how you're going to submit it. And so in CERCIA, for example, one of the things that Congress did when they enacted CERCIA, the Critical Infrastructure, I can't remember what it stands for, CERCIA, um, one of the things that they did was develop the, the, the Critical Infrastructure Reporting Council or the Cyber Incident Reporting Council, the CERC. ONCD is a member of the CERC. Um, as among other agencies, including independent agencies, SEC, the CFTC, and et cetera. Um, and the objective there is to figure out how to make this vendor friendly. It's a complicated area, to be sure. sure. Um, but wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, like college applications, one, one mechanism that serves many, and then you have the additional. 
but these are the things that we're thinking about. And there's a, there's a lag time, right? The CISA has to issue regulations before the law can become um, final. But we're really thinking through these thoughtfully, and we always are seeking input. Right. And, in the private sector. And just to build on that, I know one of the areas you have deep expertise in and is top of mind for many of the folks that I talk to is, is ransomware. Yeah. So when we think about ransomware and the, the risk that it presents to both public and private sector, obviously at Trellix, that's an area we're focused on, you know, with our with our technology. But what might we see from the Biden administration in the coming months uh, to help counter ransomware? Well, we've... We've instituted, I'm going to keep my White House hat on, and I might take it off for, for a minute after I tell you the White House stuff, but we, um, we have our counter ransomware initiative coming out of the White House. There are 37 countries involved. It's both operational and policy focused. For the first time this year, we've involved the private sector, um, which is a, a net improvement over how we collaborate and how we think about ransomware. Obviously, there's more work to be done. There are some outcomes that are associated with that ransomware counter ransomware initiative. Um, you'll see in the in the president's strategies, um, the president is focused on ransomware um, gen specifically, but cybercrime generally. We have the Joint Ransomware Task Force, <clears throat> which is different from the IST task force that I served on. Um, but the Joint Ransomware Task Force, ONCD, had a hand in shaping that task force and who's involved, what the membership is. So the administration is looking forward to uh, operationalizing across boundaries, across agencies. How do we disrupt uh, the the transgressor? How do we uh, disrupt the threat actors? How do we disrupt the infrastructure? Um, you'll see some of those themes in the president's national cybersecurity strategy as well. Um, so, with that said, uh, you know, with the ransomware background that I have, and I, I obviously can't leave everything behind when you take a new uh, job. So I have thoughts about ransomware based Please, on we'd love to hear. ransomware task force experience. And I keep pointing to Megan Stiefel and I know Michael's in the room somewhere. Um, one, <laughs> back there, one of, the, one of the reasons why I'm a fan of Circea from that perspective is that in the task force, we realized that we didn't have a good measure on the impact of ransomware and, and, and we had some anecdotal information. We had some information that was drawn from others, but not really great uh, information about the impact on small and medium businesses and individuals, schools, et cetera. Uh, and so we were uh, strong. We, we submitted a strong recommendation in that about what, one, identifying, excuse me. I think my water is right there. Um, thanks. I've got water. Thanks. Um, recommending one that the president identifies ransomware as a national security concern, which which he did. The administration is taking it seriously, and that's why you saw Jake Sullivan um, focused on the counter ransomware initiative from the National Security Council's perspective. We also recommended um, some sort of incident reporting process so that we can manage and measure what we what we can see, right? And how do we respond to that? We also made recommendations in the ransomware task force about disruption, um, disrupting not only threat actors and going after the bad guys, but working across boundaries to pull down infrastructure. Um, so there's there's a and you'll see some of that rec reflected in the administration's activities. Um, but I think we're making a, a good a good dent in in the ransomware story, and certainly we've developed a coalition of countries to be able to do that. And I'm sure the Rans IST Ransomware Task Force would would be able to provide more um, statistics on how we're doing. Yeah, that's great. And when you think about the task force in 2023, Kemba, is there anything that you would like to see them recommend? Is there anything, you know? So the, the Joint Ransomware Task Force, yeah. so I, the ONCD's participation was to make sure that we had um, a superb subject matter expertise on that task force. So I don't want to preempt what they may recommend. I, I'm right. fully confident that they're going to give us great recommendations. Got it. Okay. Sounds great. So I think I'm looking at Mike here on our time. I think we're getting close. So, um, you know, what, what I would say is prior to us coming up, we heard a discussion about vulnerabilities and old systems and 
what did that mean and why weren't folks patching and getting off it? Um, there's a lot of cybersecurity and privacy and control frameworks out there. How do you think we've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the stick, right? Incident reporting and what does that mean? How do you think we can incentivize organizations to take advantage of some of these control frameworks, cybersecurity frameworks to be taking action within the organizations, especially in what I'll call the long tail of the market, right? Outside of those industries that are are clearly doing the work, right? Financials and, and others. Well, two things come to mind. The first is we have a lot of work to do, those of us in this room, to shift the burden of risk from those customers, those individuals, those small and medium businesses, to those that can bear it, right? So that's one. Um, that will incentivize those smaller businesses, those customers, to be able to in, prioritize in what they need to do. Um, the second is sort of more theoretical. Cybersecurity is, is ubiquitous. Right? It is everybody's problem. It is the problem of the C-suite. It is the problem of the individual. Everybody has a role to play. I know that sounds um, sort of corny, but it's it's true. Right, Everybody has a role to play. Um, so we, there are incentives built in. There's a carrot and stick process, uh, and you decide which is which. But that regulatory harmonization that we're working on is to enable a, a level playing field so that those that don't currently make investments in cybersecurity will. Um, those that might be overregulated um, can start being a little bit more innovative about their approaches. Uh, but that's what that work is is meant to do: is to incentivize, um, in a lot of ways, cybersecurity work and the right investments. Um, but also really changing the conversation, such that cybersecurity isn't only about national security; it's all of it. It's national security. It enables technical innovation. It enables economic opportunity. It enables an equitable society. It's about all of it, and they don't need to be mutually exclusive. Because uh, a company might think, "I'm not a national. I'm not a cybersecurity company. I'm not a national security concern." But don't you? You you do have uh, equity in technical innovation or economic opportunity. Yes. Well, then you are in the cybersecurity space. It enables that. I think changing the conversation in a lot of ways. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I opened with the progress that you all have been making and it's six months in, yeah. obviously doing great. Um, we'll close with, I don't know, I'll flip the tables a bit. Any questions for me or, or as a representative of industry or anything that, that you'd want to close with? Um, well, I'm hoping that, that you're going to give us a lot of feedback over time, sure. but I, I'm always happy. I'm always open for feedback. Yeah. You know, like, how are we doing? I just figured I wanted a question, right? It's <laughs> a good way to set it up. Um, no, I, I, you know, I think the one thing that I would recommend is a little bit more of a marketing effort. I, I think there's a lot of really good things going on. And, um, it, you know, what you have to do is get out of the concentric circle of people that already know what that message is. I think that, you know, and that's a traditional kind of demand marketing situation. How do you get to the people who don't know the message? And so, you know, I would look to how does the department work on marketing, right? I mean, I think you're doing a lot of the right things, but I think there are concentric circles of operators out there that just, just don't get the message. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that back for action. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you for that. Good. And I'll 20 people. So yeah, yeah, I got, I wrote that got, down. I gave you an action yeah. item, <laughs> In, but I also gave you, two, yeah, I, I you just also gave me 20. Good. <laughs> right. Well, listen, Mike, we've, we've enjoyed it. We'll turn the program back over to you to wherever we go next. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. <clears throat> My turn for that. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kimba, for coming and sharing those insights with us today. That was really, uh, that was really valuable. That was really great. So, um, and yes, anything in the White House, like it's like dog years. It just, you know, um, so uh, it, it's amazing how short the time is, but how long it feels. So thank you very much. Let's give another round of applause for them. So now I'm going to call up to the stage our panel for, uh, well, we're going to drop some bombs, right? Um, F-bombs, S-bombs, other kinds of bombs, D-bombs, H-bombs. Um, but talking about bills of material, so I'm going to call those folks up to the, up to the stage.
So as they get, um, as the, as this panel gets uh, gets set up, and I'll turn it over to Heather here uh, as the moderator in just a minute to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, I think we've already heard some from our luminary panel and from the others about this idea of the bills uh, bills of materials, right? Um, knowing what's actually in the software or the hardware. Um, and I think this is a very foundational um, idea. Um, in most other industries, it's not even controversial uh, that you would know what is in a product. Um, and so the fact that we're even having this as a debate is an interesting policy one for me as a, as a student of policy. Like, why is this even a question? Um, but it is a question um, and it is complicated and there are definitely some nuances to it. And I think that this panel will provide uh, some really good insight because they've got some real experts uh, in both the benefits and the limitations of uh, where we are with the, in this process. So with that, let me turn it over to Heather West uh, to introduce herself and the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Ah, I won the mic game. Um, so, so yes, my name is Heather West, uh, and I am here to talk with this excellent panel about bills of materials. Um, I spent a fair bit of time wondering where the extra S went um, once, we, once we were talking in the abstract, but figured it out. Um, and as Mike said, we are going to talk about bombs and throw bombs, and, and if we can find a few new kinds of bombs, we'll find out. Um, I am at Venable, where I work on privacy and security uh, strategy and policy uh, with, with a bunch of folks in the room. Uh, and the Cybersecurity Coalition is one of my favorites, so very happy to be here. Um, so, so if you were here this morning, you got a little bit of a preview of this panel. Um, as the cyber luminaries uh, started talking about SBOMs, software bomb bills of materials. Uh, and, and those have been the subject of a lot of conversation over the last few years. Um, but notably, I, I want to make sure that we talk about a few other kinds of bombs too. Um, very specifically, hardware bill of materials, and then how we think about something like bill of materials for the cloud. Because I think that there's there's some aspects of each that 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 are interesting to think through separately and compare and contrast. Um, so uh, welcome, and uh, I am joined by three rock stars today to talk this through, uh, and I will introduce you, and then you can talk a little bit about why you're here and what you're working on, uh, and then we can dive into conversation and discussion. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amit Elazari, who is the head of cybersecurity policy at Intel. Um, she she uh, holds her doctorate from UC Berkeley in technology law, uh, teaches at Israel Reichman University, co-founded Disclose.io uh, to foster adoption of contractual protections for security researchers. Um, she's knowledgeable, wonderful, uh, talks and thinks a lot about international standardization, uh, and so, so I mean, talk a little bit about why you're here and why you're interested in bill of materials. Okay, uh, Mike is on. Oh, oh, is it on? I'm looking at the. Okay. Can you hear me? Should I use this one? Okay. We can use this one too. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I think, you know, it's very clear from today's discussion, and I think also the discussions that have been unfolding uh, for the past couple of years, uh, why we're so interested in the conversation about software build materials, but also build materials uh, more generally. You know, we play a foundational role, right? We supply components to multiple sectors, and uh, for, for us, you know, security is, of course, top of mind. And in the supply chain, uh, supply chain security conversation, there is a very foundational understanding that the bill of materials, this concept of you should understand what you have in your product, even if it's evolving and changing like software, but definitely in hardware, is a foundational tool for other risk management right solutions. For example, what we do on vulnerability management. Uh, so we are very passionate about the topic. We've been engaging on it. We are getting ready uh, for the executive order and delivering uh, SBOMs to our customers more broadly. We engage with the ecosystem in things like the open source security foundation, enabling SPDX and much more. But we are also very passionate about making sure that 
the, the industry consumers, customers can consume these bombs, whether these are S bombs or other types of bombs like we do in hardware. And it really is pushing the needle on security. So just to give you one example of what we do in the area of hardware, where we, where we have been producing bombs for many, many years, um, is this concept of the transparent supply chain. So we are not assuming that the customer, the end customer, you when you charge your PCs, you know, you might be interested in the bomb. It's possible you are, and there is a tool for you to get it, but more importantly, the bomb is there to enable the security. So through solutions like transparent supply chain, we are able to uh, attest and support the integrity of the components and sure, I mean, kind of uh, have visibility whether there is, any, there is any tempering or things along that uh, nature. And I think there are a lot of learnings uh, for the software uh, community and the ecosystem that can be learned uh, from hardware. And that is but a part of the role we play there. We also have very big, and this is kind of less known when people think about Intel, they think about hardware, but we are also a very, very, very big contributor of open source uh, security and very excited about our uh, security software solutions. And as part of that, we engage with the community also on enabling uh, the software part of the bill of materials. So that is why I'm here and I'm excited to be learning from my fellow panelists. No, yeah. it is. Okay, cool. Um, so, so I'll just go down the line. Uh, next up, Isaac, uh, you're a product manager working on supply chain integrity at Google, um, which is a really interesting one uh, and a little bit different than you, you've got some of the hardware, you've got some of the software, very similar to Amit. Um, and in this role, uh, you incubated the Google's first party SBOM program. Um, and uh, think a lot and about strategy for open source supply chain security uh, and uh, work on very tasty projects such as salsa and guac. I'm, I feel like I'm required to make a joke out of those because I love it. Um, and uh, has also worked in developer facing uh, products at Google, Twitter, Stripe, Microsoft. So you have a great perspective into this. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you've been working on on this, this you know, S-bomb, other bombs, et cetera, at Google? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for having me here. Um, like Amit, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and uh, learning from you all. Um, I'm a software practitioner by background. Um, I spent three decades um, and gosh, maybe even more. I'm building software. I'm, I'm fairly new to policy. And so I've been super interested to be um, upfront and close to um, you know, teaching 50,000 software engineers at Google about S-bombs and about you know, how we should be building first-party S-bombs across an enormous um, suite of, of first-party products. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I've been particularly fascinated by is to see the interplay and the dynamics between you know, legislation and standardization and open source and open source foundations and you know, the industry um, and, and seeing the dynamics evolve. And I, I'm fascinated um, and excited to see um, you know, the industry mobilizing to produce SBOMs for, for packaged software. Um, and I scope that carefully. I think that there's more work to be done around cloud software. We need to think harder about, you know, SaaS bombs. What does an S bomb mean in the world of SaaS? Um, you know, is an appropriate, um, is an appropriately robust concept in that universe? Um, but certainly, you know, working at Google on supply chain security, I spent a lot of time in the open source ecosystem through the Open SSF, working on Salsa, Guac, Sigstore, and, and so on. Um, and uh, it's. It feels like um, a, a time of really rapid and necessary change in the industry. I mean, someone said, you know, um, why is this even a discussion about, you know, the, the composition of our products? And I, I've been doing, you know, my own research as I learn about, you know, the introduction of policy and how this plays out. I've been looking at, you know, the late 30s and 40s and 50s and the, you know, Food, Drugs and Cosmetics Act that brought in, introduced ingredients labels on packaged foods. Um, and of course, did the packaged food industry think that they were ready to put ingredients labels on their foods? No, ladies and gentlemen, they did not. Um, and yet, you know, we all go to the grocery store and pick up peanut butter off the shelf and, and learn about the ingredients of that thing. Um, and it seems to me there are some really um, instructive lessons to be learned from, yes, from, from the hardware bill of materials and from other technology domains, but even, um, you know, more prosaic domains like the food supply chain, um, I think there's tons of lessons that we can learn collectively there. This is, um, for the largest part, um, not especially new ground. Um, there are some interesting things that make software different. Um, but you could easily imagine a world where, yes, you pick software off the shelf in your grocery store and look at the ingredients label and, and that's your S-bomb. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, last and never least, uh, Kent Landfield is the Chief Standards and Technology Policy Strat Strategist at Trellix um, and has spent 30 plus years in software development, network operations, vulnerability, network security arenas. Um, and he is always deeply thoughtful about these questions uh, and some of the things that we need to figure out on uh, some of the opportunities that, that we see. Um, he's been active on all sorts of interesting stuff. I'm gonna mention NIST cybersecurity framework, the privacy framework development, security automation. Um, and so, you know, Ken, what, where, where do you sit on, on the topic of bombs? Well, I'm just glad we don't have firmware being discussed here today. Um, I mean, hey, we can we can pull I'll an you add the first letter to it. Um, so, from the standpoint of uh, my involvement, I actually began this with an asset um, effort at the NCCOE in 2012. There was a lot of discussion about how do we how do we track our assets, and our assets were basically software. There was a big push around using SWID tag files and the like, and building it into our uh, our our products so that we could actually deliver those. So in 2013, we implemented uh, SWID tag files uh, into our products so that we could actually deliver what is, for all intent and purposes, a precursor to the S bombs of today. The one thing it was missing was the the third party component and and getting into the actual dependencies of the third party component. So this is a software transparency issue. Um, it does involve a lot of open source because we're consuming a great deal of open source today and we're continuing to conceal uh, uh, continuing to to use a great deal of open source in our products um, so being able to see what is there um, i should also mention I'm, I'm one of the board members for cve so one of the things that um, we want to do is to be able to get uh, the ability for end users in the environment to use the SBOM information that comes so that they can actually see what the level of risk is in their network for the deployed products by knowing what's in those products. Um, today, that's that's hard to do. Um, as, as we're moving forward, a lot of my interest is more around the, you know, how do we move a community from the from zero to sixty, um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to that kind of transparency, um, we've had a situation where um, the government is finally doing something intelligent, from my perspective, and using the power of the checkbook to influence industry in a way that could actually get us to move in the right direction. Um, it's going to take a while. They're getting ahead of themselves in many places but it's a step in the right direction and I want to be a part of that, that movement. I love it. Thank you. Um, I think that, that you each touched a little bit on this uh, as, as we started this discussion, um, but, but I think it's worth asking explicitly. If, if you were to set out the goals of a bomb, what are we actually working towards in this in this journey of going from zero to sixty, um, and and trying to make sure that we keep those in mind as we talk about the opportunities and challenges and the best practices and what we're trying to accomplish here? I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Amit. Okay. Um. Yeah. To me, I mean, we 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 heard today what what has often been said. You know, S bomb is not. Or, or by the way, other types of bombs too are not the silver bullet. So for me, the underlying you know goal is how can you leverage uh, and what are the features and what are the kind of properties of building the bomb and communicating it and automating and the tools around it for the bomb, the inventory, um, the you know the, the kind of asset list, whatever term you, terminology you want to use. What are the features uh, that are needed for that to support other risk management and risk mitigation tools? And how can you make sure that as the landscape evolves, and the landscape is not just the innovation, the technology, and the stack itself, and the dependency in the software, it's also the attack, right? Um, a landscape, how can we make sure that those features are uh, being adjusted and uh, you know adapted as that landscape uh, landscape evolves. So it's the fit to purpose, and also recognizing that this is really a foundational tool and needs to connect to all the, so these other controls or other technologies that you have there. Part of that fit to purpose is having the scalability, the standardization. We talk a lot about it, the readiness, 
but also the usability. And usability could include consumption, and that would vary depending on the user. And that dependency could be sectorial or could be the sophistication or level of the consumer. And you led right into my next question. I want to make sure someone talks about who are bombs for? Who, are, who, who is the user? Who are we serving here? I'll take that. Um, so uh, they're for the consumers. Actually, they're for the whole life cycle of software development. They really shouldn't be considered just for the procurement side of the house. They shouldn't be just used for the vulnerability side of the house. There's many different use cases for that foundational information of what's in a package that's going to be delivered or what's what's the um, what's the, the the cloud environment that's the software that you're depending on is running in. So having that kind of um, uh, uh, sort of influence from both the development perspective. Um, developers get a lot of uh, benefit out of an SBOM by really understanding what's in their products. And in a lot of cases in the past, that hasn't been um, the situation. Uh, we've, we've had situations where quite normally people will take something off of an open source project, they'll incorporate it in their build process, they've got it all working and it's fine, it's gone through QA somewhat, and um, then it gets pushed out to customers. That's not exactly, and, and forgotten for all intended purposes. When there's vulnerabilities in the third party components they've added, they don't, you know, they're not paying attention. This forces the community and the development community, especially to pay attention to really what's going on in all of the different components that they're adding, be they commercial or open source, so that they can address them in a proactive manner, which hasn't been the case in the past. I, I mean, I would, I would add to that, and I, I think I think a lot about you know actual practical utility of S bombs, and you know the extent to which you know the you know, putative consumers of S bombs today are really ready to operationalize the consumption side of S bombs, and I think that that's you know that there's a lot of focus in the industry around how do we generate S bombs, you know how do we test them, how do we you know verify their integrity and so on, but there's there's been little focus that I've seen on you know how do we you know, reason about and comprehend S bombs at scale and, and make sense of that. Um, while that is being developed, I would I would echo a point that Josh made this morning, which is there is value simply in you know making a vendor or an upstream supplier demonstrate that they're living the S bomb lifestyle, right? And so you know even the internal capability and rigor and discipline to be able to produce an S bomb has value, even if the S bomb is ultimately discarded. Um, and so, you know, Google's internal capability, we have a very mature you know, software development practice. And for the most part, you know, Google is already living the SBOM lifestyle internally. And much of the work to generate SBOMs is to you know, produce the, the actual document at the end of that process. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the pressure it puts on you know, software suppliers um, to increase their rigor and discipline, to have better self-knowledge and introspection around, you know, how are they building their products, have better controls placed around it. Um, I think that's a that's a really really important aspect of S bombs as well. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly add on that that I completely agree. I think you know we talk a lot about the S bombs and the, and we talk about the interaction between S bomb and the concept of trust and how can you trust the bomb, especially as it evolves. And this is where we talked about integrity and the station. These are things we can also do with hardware signatures and uh, different types of signature. But trust is also earned from the usability and whether we are communicating that information in a way that is actually effective and really delivering on that. And I completely agree that the, 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 the simple notion of be able, being able to produce the bomb is, you know, a part of, should be a part of your kind of supply chain and security assurance foundational kind of capabilities. But we also need to recognize that this is challenging, right? It's challenging for Google. It's challenging for big companies like Intel, this is still working progress as a community. We're working on the standards, we're working on how to test this. And as we think about that, that's where ecosystem contribution and what we're doing with the developers, you know, in this group, in the groups like open source, the open source um, security foundation or SSF is important because it will be challenging for smaller players as well. And we have to make sure that, you know, they are ready to go, right? And we are we are kind of delivering on that as well. And that's usable, especially if it's going to be kind of a market-driven um, approach towards looking at how it was where you are and whether you have, you know, secure posture. I'd add one more thing as well. Um, I agree with everything you said. And I, I think, you know, the, the other aspect of back pressure on you know, software suppliers is, again, the, the analogy to the, the packaged food industry. When packaged food manufacturers were forced to put ingredients labels on their products, 
they had to become very selective about what those ingredients were in the first place. Um, you know, there was a certain amount of concern optically. You know, what would it look like if we started to tell people how much coal tar there was in their peanut butter or whatever it may be? Um, and I think there are similar questions being asked in industry now, and rightfully so, that, you know, there is there will be a, a greater um, rigor applied to dependence, dependency selection in building software um, if software companies, um, you know, begin to, you know, have obligations to talk about the ingredients of their products. They're going to select better ingredients. They're going to select fewer ingredients. Um, and, you know, that, that concern about the optics or perception of S-bombs is, again, part of the value they provide in terms of the, the back pressure they put on the suppliers. I like that. And I really, I do think that the uh, nutrition label uh, comparison is really helpful in a lot of ways. Uh, but obviously, we're, we're thinking about a bomb that is, that is used a little bit differently than me turning on my peanut butter which I really hope doesn't have coal tar. Um, but, but so how, how do we help people get ready to use a bomb? Um, how, how can we make sure that they are useful to the, that end user, um, whether, whether that's someone who's very, very sophisticated or not? And are there, there are folks that this just isn't going to be useful for? So from my perspective, um, one of the things that we're missing in this effort as we move from the, the SWID to NTIA to DHS oper operationalizing SBOMs is that we really need to standardize aspects. There needs to be aspects that can be really looked at and said, this is a specification of what constitutes a good SBOM. These are the practices that need to be in place for for assuring that trust is implementable. These are the standards that are going to be the foundation for actually creating tooling that are going to take SBOMs into the operational usefulness for the multiple use cases that, that they could support. Um, but we have to have some specification, some standards. Um, standards are good. Right now, we've got 15 or 20 different SBOM efforts going on in the space. Um, and we have products in the field today who generate S-bombs, um, you know, that you can buy. Um, that's all great, but uh, let's try to see and and parse that those individual S-bombs and see just how compatible they are from a standpoint of being able to implement automation. So it's it's really important that we get a standard in place. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that, and it's 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 a part of the you know the. Uh, the, the nascency, I guess, of, of, of this whole initiative around S bombs. And I think the you know the executive order is, is clarifying that, that it puts you know hard dates uh, and you know focuses uh, the industry's efforts at, at solving some of these problems. Um, and you know there are certainly challenges in the S bomb ecosystem, both on the generation, consumption, you know, comprehension, reasoning side. Um, something you know, a, a small plug for a, a project called Guac. It's an open source project. It pairs well with Salsa, of course. Um, but it's a graph for understanding art artifact composition. And the idea that the kind of the, the founding principle behind Guac is, you know, in a world where you know we wake up and find a quarter of a million S bombs in our inbox, um, plus salsa provenance, plus developer intelligence and threat intelligence and OpenSSF scorecard and all of this other security metadata that can be associated with a software artifact. How do we you know, aggregate that and, and reify this hypergraph of information in order that I can pick up an artifact in my organization and you know, trace not just its heritage up the supply chain, but all of the security metadata related to that artifact? Like, you know, were there um, email domains associated with the maintainer of the open source project, which is embedded in this software that just expired? If that email domain expired, that suggests there's a possible identity compromise. Again, there's a risk to my supply chain there. Um, it's so very, very early. Um, I mean, it's, it's part of my excitement to be a part of this is that there is so very much to do, um, but there's so much value we can deliver as well. And, and part of you know, one of the, the commonest pushbacks against the idea of S-bombs and I've heard is that, you know, S-bombs not a silver bullet. It's totally true. Um, and I don't think there are silver bullets in this domain, period. Um, but the fact remains that S-bombs, you know, they're you know, conceptually robust. 
they're implementable and they have tangible utility today. And so I think that there's there's a lot to be said for you know the industry you know rising up and, and building these standards, building the tools and building a generation consumption comprehension ecosystem around them. It's the start, it's not the end, it's the very, very beginning. You know, ingredients labels in the 40s were, were where kind of food labeling began, nutrition labels came later, there'll be other labeling and more information come about the food supply later. You know, the ingredients labels that came in following the 1938 Act, you know, we're very, very beginning to start to understand what went into the food supply. Um, you know, we're still not done with that journey 50 years later. Yeah, I think you, you covered a lot of it already, but there are, two, there are I think two things that I would like to emphasize or kind of underscore in what you shared, which is, um, first, the, the entire issue about building mechanisms for integrity to deliver an attestation of the bombs. Uh, I think especially as the concept of the S-bomb evolves for larger bombs that com com you know, comprehend both software, firmware, hardware together in one packaging, the integrity of the bomb is really interesting. And we, we you know, in the minimal elements work and the synthesization work, you know, we think about hashes and those kind of, kind of digital signatures, but we do TPM signatures rooted in the silicon, for example. So we are very, I think, you know, as a community, I'm excited to continue to think about that element of the bomb and how, you know, it can deliver trust. But I'm also very excited about the concept of um, integrating, we talked about the bomb as a tool for other risk management and risk, man, um, risk mitigation uh, kind of uh, vehicles. I think the concept of the communication of the bomb becoming usable is going to be very interesting as we think about different users. So it's going to become, I think, as a, a kind of a core element of other attestation certification uh, forms. If you think about the EU Cyber Resilience Act, right, you know, Ari talked about it, it was mentioned a few times today, you know, this is this holistic product security regulation we're seeing from Europe, and one of the key elements under the kind of Annex 1 of the essential cyber requirements is having uh, software bill of, bill of materials as part of the communication requirements. And I think as the concept would evolve, the way we can use the bomb to simplify the way to communicate just the, the posture right without creating a false sense of security that's going to be very interesting and that interacts with the concept of the scorecards that interacts with the concept of how this works together with other data like is this device secured is does it have vulnerable components how can you take all that information together but deliver it to the end user in a way that is easy and can get and get can get consumed but also don't create that kind of false sense that is exciting for me yeah, and one thing to, to note, um, we're talking about S-bombs, we're talking about information about software uh, that's actually as built, supposedly. Um, the, the, the interesting fact is that all the things that just this one little topic, you know, we start talking about an S-bomb is not a silver bullet. That's fine. But what it's doing to supply chain security and what it's adding to the dialogue around supply chain security is truly amazing because it is it is an inflection point in our in in our um, industry where we're actually looking at um, one little piece, but it touches so many other parts of the process um, that everything is going to be uh, improved because of it. So, so in the course of this conversation and a little bit uh, throughout the day, we've mentioned a lot of the efforts surrounding bombs, um, whether that's, you know, CRA, whether that is the NTIA and CISA processes, whether that is standards and open source, um, the, the OMB memos, uh, the executive orders, uh, there, there is a lot of efforts, I think, I think you may have said myriad uh, efforts around S bombs, for example, um, where where do you see that that attempt at standardization and the attempt to push this forward and to realize these benefits? Um, and are there things that that you can kind of hope get accomplished, uh, whether that's that's something substantive or kind of a consolidation or or that kind of thing? Um, well, I hope it doesn't take as long as it did for the nutrition labels to become effective and useful. Um, but we've been talking about this for eight years now. Um, we have now have a national dialogue, thanks to executive orders and OMB, you know, uh, 2218 and those types of, of uh, government edicts. Uh, but, um, you know, we really do need to step back and quit admiring the problem and look at the, the issues of 
how do we specify what good construction is? To, to Amit's point about integrity and trust, we have to have that built in. It has to be written down somewhere. Um, and right now, there's not a lot of movement in that direction. Um, everyone has a, it's like, you know, eating the elephant. Everybody's touching at a different point and figuring out what it is that they're, they want to approach it with. And that has, um, that has slowed us down. Whereas if we had sat down and said, we, our outcome is we need to have an, uh, a specification for how to cre create a good SBOM and create some initial considered best practices. Best practices come with time. We need to get to the point where we have those, uh, that time to do it. Uh, but we need, to, we need to actually focus on um, the specifics of what is being asked of the industry um, and how those things need to be developed. Yeah, I can go next. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things I can kind of emphasize. You know, we've we've seen the NDA language today, so I think we, the executive order, you know, has really, you know, has very commendable driven the momentum around the SMO. That's appropriate, and we are now working in the implementation, right, with the OMB memo, and we, we need to take the time, right, to allow SBAM to evolve and support it. Meantime, we need to work on the standards, and, you know, we are active, that it, we've been active at SPDX for, for many, many years, we're active in, in OSSF in many venues, so, but I think what is kind of maybe not highlighted in the standardization conversation, which is ongoing, um, is the fit for use and fit for sector. Uh, and that goes a lot more into the, it's not the SBOM itself and the minimal elements and the SPDX versus the cyclone. It's more about how the SBOM is getting connected to other type of measures that you have in your SDL, in your security posture. So think about the connectivity between the SBOM and the SSDF, the secure software development framework by NIST. And this is this kind of that connectivity, especially when it comes to usage for vulnerability remediation or updating the bomb, right? As the dependencies as the software changes, that would vary per sector. So CISA has started the work of assembling, for example, the cloud community. We talked about the challenges in SaaS, there are unique challenges in other use cases, like in, in the hardware world. I think that type of standardization, which is more sector oriented and therefore challenging because it requires many sectors to come together and describe you know, the use cases for different users. Uh, I think that will need to continue to evolve. While really in the regulatory landscape, keeping up the momentum, but also allowing the space for that work with industry to, to mature while not creating fragmentation. And I think that is a key message you heard from industry throughout the day. Yeah, I, I, I would also, uh, I mean, I'd what you said resonated very much with me in terms of uh, cloud, you know, standing, standing around admiring the problem, but, but coming out with some, some real specifics. A lot of the work that I've been doing internally at Google has been, you know, absorbing executive orders and OMB memos and various PDFs from various .gov websites, um, and then trying to convert that into an actual tangible, actionable specification that I can give to Google engineering teams and say, here is the thing you need to do. Um, and we're, we're missing some of that. And I think, you know, at the same time, there, there are things which I really ad admire about how this change is coming about. And I think, you know, it is largely, I mean, yes, there are technology pieces to this problem, but there are large parts of this problem that are simple change management, um, you know, things which are almost generic. Um, and things like, you know, the NTI minimum elements report for SBOMs, you know, had a section about accommodation of errors, which was eye-opening to me that there was such pragmatism and saying, you know, hey, we're just getting started here. In order to get us off the ground, we're going to be permissive with, with what we accept. We're going to recognize that people will make accidental omissions and will make errors in their SBOMs. But that's a very practical change, practical approach to change management. Um, I think, yes, more of that and the pragmatism of, of driving change in the industry, but yes, to more specificity um, and you know, less looking at kind of very abstract documents about kind of these you know, benefits we might one day see and more specificity and standardization around, you know, the very, very tangible things that at the end of the day, um, you know, again, there are 50,000 plus engineers at Google, um, all of whom are, you know, having to begin caring about SBOMs um, in a great way. Um, but I would like to make my job easier not having to do, do all, all of this kind of converting these, these very abstract set of requirements to something very, very, very tangible. Um, and so it's that specificity that's missing to me. All right. 
uh, I am definitely hearing a push towards really concrete standards and collaboration and just making this easier for everyone involved, uh, which, which I think is is fantastic. Um, and you've stolen the, my thunder for the last the last question here, which is is what concrete things you want to see accomplished that will really make bombs um, incredibly useful and 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 move us from that zero to 60 um and and the concrete piece of this to ensure that we're not just admiring the problem which is a lot of fun sometimes however um it is it is a lot less useful than actually you know moving things towards useful bombs yeah from the standpoint of at least i am gonna speak from my company's perspective, trying to communicate what the what the needs are, the what the the actual needs are in creating an S-bomb is is a fundamental problem. Um another fundamental problem is the OMB memo actually had um it had a statement in there that I found problematic and and we're trying to potentially uh, uh understand that a bit more. And, and that was where agencies could request additional information. Um, that would be sort of interesting because I'm trying to build this into my build process. So these are true artifacts of an as-built kind of package. And if agencies can add on at whim, um, I know it's not a whim, but if they can add on uh, additional uh, requirements then uh, to be included in the SBOM that I, I just can't have a build process where I'm going to be um, building for the Department of Commerce, building for the Department of Defense, building for um, some small agency somewhere that nobody's ever heard of. Um, we need to have one set of requirements that are leveraged on us and we need to then understand uh, the timeline. Right now the timeline as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, is 270 days from when it was signed on September 14th. Oops. Um, how many of you guys have actually got your development teams, you know, researching how to create an SBOM? Or are you just going to send, <laughs> or are you just going to send uh, CSV files or text files with the with the components that are in your software? Hopefully, that latter doesn't occur. Um, but we do need to have a good solid set of requirements as to what constitutes uh, an SBOM that's acceptable from the federal government perspective. Um, commercial companies are already, uh, commercial customers are already asking for SBOMs um, and that's fine. But when you ask them what they, what you need in the SBOM, well, whatever the government wants. Um, yeah, okay, fine. We're not sure what that is. So anyway. Yeah, I, I <laughs> Again, very much what you said. Um, I mean, I, I think the the OMB memo as well. I think you know there there are other areas which are um, unhelpfully ambiguous. Um, and you know, I think you know of the work that I'm doing to untangle that ambiguity, to work through it in conversations with the OMB, with with CISA, with others externally, then codify it into you know language which is useful um, and actionable for inter internal engineering teams. If I think of that work that I'm doing, and then replicate that in every software organization, that's an incredibly wasteful exercise that you could otherwise imagine being done once centrally and having a single specification which can then be given to companies that is immediately actionable, is immediately relevant, and is an immediately at the appropriate level of detail and altitude to be implementable. Um, that's a big gap today. And you know, at Google, we're, we're doing the work to fill that gap. I'm personally doing, doing some of that work as well and, and working with my engineers. Um, but it does seem to me that, you know, if I look around the industry for every, you know, for every one person at Google doing this, there are, there are thousands across, you know, the ecosystem as a whole doing pretty much the exact same work. Yes, there are fora in which we can collaborate and share, but it, it doesn't seem like it's the most efficient approach overall. Yeah, I, I think it was covered. Uh, we have tremendous amount of resource being um, right now spent on some forms of discovery, right? Discovery, reducing ambiguity, trying to understand. And I think the issue is, is you know, as a community, we haven't uh, you know fully unfolded all the value that could be driven from consuming, right? Those ty different types of information. So there are two things we can I can I can add to the conversation. I'm excited for us as a community to find the right balance, which may vary per sector and per use case and per architecture uh, between the flexibility and harmonization in terms of having the, the baseline, the, the right set of, uh, of uh, essential component of the bomb. And I'm 
also excited about the feedback loop. Right today, we heard about the feedback loop in the, from Eric and uh, from from others in the context of incident reporting. I think we're excited to hear, you know, from agencies, uh, not just having, you know, less duplicity and more kind of coherence in terms of data station form and what would be required, but what is most effective? How are they going to use it? Uh, where where are really really we are moving the needle on on their on you know the ecosystem and their security by delivering those bombs and taking those learnings back. So it, it's two for both achieving kind of the right balance and having that clarity and being able to share it. And sharing is not just standards. Uh, I think the average developer or even a small organization, it's not just about having the spec. It's the tool right that makes it ready to go and that's a lot of what we are doing with the open source community so that element of having that right balance and um achieving that but also hearing from our government colleagues and you know all of, of really consumers of the of the s bombs uh, all around as to what is useful in terms of the consumptions and having that feedback loop of information so we can all improve as we grow this community thank you um, I'd like to turn now to any questions uh, in the room. I see, I see one right there and, and there. Uh, all right, good. I'm glad I left some time. Um, and uh, I will wait for, for Ari, uh, but yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you for a wonderful panel. A uh, big believer in S-bombs and very wonderful to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm going to throw a little one out of a left field just because I think it might be interesting. And, you know, the theme of the conference, of course, is Cybernext DC. So have you thought about, and this might be, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but have you thought about how SBOMs would also cover algorithms? Or, you know, is there another mechanism in kind of unpacking the algorithmic side of software? All right, I'll take that. Um, the answer is no, we haven't thought about it. Um, there's, there's definitely, it's been brought up uh, a few times in various forms, um, but at this point, I'm not sure we know enough about how to deliver S bombs in a useful way um, and how to deliver algorithmic based attribute information in a useful way is yet another problem that's still very similar to the S bomb problem. But um, we haven't really, at least I haven't been a part of anything that's really walked down that path very deeply. I think. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I mean, I was, I was going to add to that, that I think one of the, I can agree with Kent yet again, um, but one of, one of the great things about SBOMS is I think it, it begins to set up ultimately a metadata distribution channel to a company software, an mm -hmm. attestation distribution channel. And once that distribution channel is established at the key ports in the supply chain and hopefully end to end in the supply chain, once that truck is running, we can start to put more and more things on the truck. And so SBOMs today, yes. Salsa Providence, yes. Open SSF scorecards, yes. Algorithmic content, yes. And I think you know, one of the, the beauties of uh, you know, the SBOM requirement is that it's requiring industry to, to start to build this distribution mechanism for relevant security metadata about the software they're supplying. And today, uh, you know, we're starting with SBOMs. It seems like a great place to start. There's dem demonstrable utility in, in you know, distributing SBOMs along with software. Um, but I can certainly imagine, you know, once we have, you know, this, this fleet of trucks sending SBOMs out into the world, we can start putting other things on the trucks too um, and start talking about other interesting and relevant and useful attributes um, that, that pertain to upstream software supply. Um, algorithms could be one of those. Yeah, I have, I'm so excited you brought that question because I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, years ago before, before I joined Intel was a birthday, I wrote about the concept of algor algorithmic bug bounty before it was adopted by, by Twitter and others. And there's just so many commonalities and things to be learned when it comes to algorithmic um, transparency, governance, data governance, and that area from security. And spot on, as you mentioned, you know, the concept of understanding what are the components for part included that you have in the software or the product, this concept of the inventory is enabling for years Many use cases, IP, risk management and security, risk management in privacy. It's not just, you know, uh, algorithmic governance and kind of data governance and uh, data sets and the like. It's also, you know, the privacy use cases. So I think that is going to be very excited. And there are a lot of uh, ideas we can draw in terms of understanding how, the, you know, having those bombs accessible can enable different types of activities like this where appropriate and as appropriate, this concept of enabling research 
right, on the code itself. And this, we are talking about often in SBOM, open source code. So it's not proprietary, it's already out there. I'm excited about this idea on how this would foster not just vulnerability research, but also research in other areas like privacy and algorithmic auditing. Uh, let me ask, I, let me ask my question actually briefly, uh, which is um, there was a suggestion, sort of a suggestion that um, you know we're not quite there yet. Things are a little vague in terms of being what's requested from from S bombs. There's also the suggestion that we don't want it over regulated and ask you know too many people asking for it before you get to that point. What's the chicken and egg situation then between how do you get enough clarity over what an SBOM should be without it kind of creating something that no one will use. I think from a lot of respects, we just need to get something that's being delivered with the products. So um, will it be an interoperable format? Probably not. Till we have standards, it won't be. But you know, it's more than it's more than um, you know a CSV file. Um, but it's the transparency that's the most important. And we have to do these things as in, in parallel, so to speak. We have to create, as Amit said, we have to create the, the standards while we're trying to work towards what should be in those standards and how should we address those. Um, so if we're delivering something, and I think it was mentioned earlier, the NTI um, um, document on minimal elements um, says that they'll be permissive. Well, yes, if I'm sending it in one format, he's sending it in another format, and we're both calling it S-bombs, well, okay. Um, we may have to go through that transition to actually get to the point we want to get to in somewhat reasonable time frame. And, and just to add to that, I mean, I, I think your point is really well taken. As, as I was saying the words about specificity, I, I, my mind went to over-regulation, thinking, well, what if it just, it's well-specified but terrible, um, which is a conceivable outcome, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking through, how would I approach this? Again, I'm, I'm new enough to the, the policy and, and, and regulation and legislative universe that I don't know how things are done, but thinking of the corporate universe, how might one do this in order to, to make this rollout more efficient? You would start with a few pilot orgs and, and develop with fairly tight feedback loops with these pilot orgs, actual real world specifications, which you can say, okay, here are ones which we've managed to get off the ground with these three software producing organizations, seems to work well, they didn't have too much trouble implementing, we've reached an appropriate level of specificity, and then codify that into regulation. Um, you, you don't want to kind of have to solicit feedback from the entire world and get drowned in it. At the same time, you don't want to under-specify and get all this confusion and du duplication in the industry as everyone's trying to come up with their own tangible and actual specifications. Again, I don't know how realistic or, or pragmatic it would be to kind of do small pilots, but it seems to me that starting with a, a small number of organizations would demonstrate you know, practicality of an approach would generate a level of specificity which you could then transfer onto other organizations without too much wasted effort. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think and the key issue is the learnings uh, from these pilots should be open and should be consumable and easy, easy to digest and transferable, translated to the policymaker uh, audience. I think that's the key issue. And, you know, we have been talking a long time about SBOM and regulations and, you know, that, you know, not to derail, not to fragment, not to kind of, you know, push this push this for codification too early. But the truth is, this is the real call, act, call to action to all the players here. And, you know, we, Google, others are, are already doing that is we have to, to get going and moving on the SBOM and this conversation right now, do those pilots, get those tooling out there. So we are able to, you know, go to, to the policy makers and the regulatory audience and show them, what, you know, kind of exhibit what works and what is useful in order to be compelling on the argument of, you know, don't regulate it now. And this is really up to, to the ecosystem. And then I think this is the call to action, right, for collaboration uh, with this group here. Mark, did you? Um, Mark Bohannon with Red Hat. Um, Amit and Kim will be familiar with my question. Let's see if they give the same answer this time that they have in the past. Um, I, I think the SPOM discussion has, in fact, as Kent said, um, brought greater awareness of the need to be transparent about what is in your product in a real time, practical way. Um, I think my, and I think Red Hat's concern, 
is that the overt focus on SBOMs has actually been more confusing than beneficial. At the heart of it is how do we encourage software development, lifecycle development management practices? Because without that, you can't produce an SBOM. I still remember the event that the Cyber Coalition held at RSA, where a major software company representative said they don't need to have a manifest to produce an SBOM, which indicated to me we are missing some very deep concerns about how SBOMs are created and their role. The other thing that I think we need to be cautious about, and Kent alluded to it, we had SWID tags, way too heavy, cumbersome, SBOMs. I see SBOMs as an intermediary. Things like SIGSTORE and others will enable the functional equivalent of what's going on in SBOMs. Because I think we're moving increasingly to an area where an SBOM, which is so dependent on traditional vendor product framework, that's not the way software is being developed now. It's much more dynamic. Digital transformation means that everyone is a software developer and a software product producer. So I think we need to see SBOMs in the cultural and time context of which we're operating right now. And that we are really looking to new efforts that get at the same, that are gonna be more efficient and everything else. Comments? All right, I'll start and probably give you a different answer. Um, so from the standpoint of, of SBOMs, we, we have we come to the table with a with a perspective of of software that's developed, boxed, or delivered by via download. Um, the world's changing, as you mentioned. Um, CI/CD kind of approaches to software development uh, have made it um, quite dynamic. Um, in those cases, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't deliver a soft, uh, an SBOM, uh, but you may want to consider how you deliver one on demand. So instead of delivering it in a box or in a download package, you just have a, have a standard where the cloud or the, the environment that it's running in can produce a, an SBOM at the moment based on the container or whatever the, the target is. Um, and so, I mean, there's different ways to do it, but I think right now a lot of us come to the table with that with that uh, on-premise kind of approach to software because to this day, that's been where the most progress has been made. Yeah, I was I, mean, I was going to um, echo your, your point about SIGSTOR. I think SIGSTOR is actually a, a fundamental enabling capability for, you know, a, a broader ecosystem of software metadata and attestations. And if you think about software as marrying up like identity and artifact and the claim about that artifact, a claim could be the content of the artifact, i.e. an SBOM. A claim could be, you know, about how that artifact was produced, like salsa provenance. It could be about, you know, the principal identities behind that artifact, like the developer identities. But I think SIGSTOR is an enabling capability to make these fairly granular attestations about software composition, um, which better supports, to your point, the increasing fragmentation of the software ecosystem that, you know, it used to be that the software was much more monolithic, and now it's you made us much more smaller, more granular components sourced from across the world, I think capabilities like SIGSTOR, where you can tie strong identities to claims to artifacts, um, is a fundamental enabling capability for the future of supply chain security. Um, I mean, and I say that with my own biases, because I'm super involved in this. We have biases too, as you know. Um, but, you know, I, I see SIGSTOR, you know, my, my architecture diagrams have SIGSTOR at the bottom and, you know, SALSA at the top and then GUAC as a reasoning engine. And I think SIGSTOR brings that, that foundational capability to have non-reputable strong identities um, which are tied to claims about software. And that's an enabling capability that can drive SBOM distribution, but also a whole lot more. I, as always, I completely agree. And I, I really, you know, echo and I, you know, I'm, a, a, you know, big support of this notion of really it's not just about the S bomb or other type of bombs. It's about what you do with them and how that is fitting into your entire security posture. It's not just the SDL, it's how you do quantum vulnerability disclosure, right? We we heard we hear a lot about that relationship between vulnerability management and the bill of materials. So for me it's about again when we think about the S bomb conversation, we think about it holistically. Um, not over indexing about just the communication of the S bomb and that the fact that we get it communicated to the right audience. But what does it mean? Does it mean that is, you know, it is really 
uh, a signal towards the security and moving the con conversation towards attestation of the posture on security, uh, and you touched on it, as also, again, to the co connectivity to your other, you know, security uh, controls that you have within the organization. Fantastic. Thank you so much, and thank you for your questions. Uh, and I will yep. give it back to you. Great. Thank you. Let's give our panel a round of applause. So in Washington, D.C., it can often feel like you're rolling a rock <laughs> up a hill. Um, it can also feel like you're rolling the same rock uh, up a hill, the same hill, multiple times. Um, and so in that spirit, um, we're going to talk about rolling the rock up a hill. Um, our Jay Healy is. Um, and so I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage Jay, my longtime friend and colleague, to talk about Sisyphus and the modern version of that myth. Great, thanks. Um, and if you if you don't get the idea between Sisyphus, you will. If you wondered why rolling a rock up a hill, it's N.J. Healy, right? I mean, I was. Uh, you might have been wondering where that was going. Um, and uh, so I'm here under uh, as a um, cybersecurity research scholar, which I didn't know was a thing at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. I'm only representing Columbia and I never thought I'd be a cybersecurity scholar. And then I realized I'd grew into it because last week I realized I was wearing a sweater vest and a black hoodie over it. And so I was like, man, if anything says cybersecurity professor, or cybersecurity scholar, it's got to be a sweater vest and a, uh, and a black hoodie. So yes, yeah, Sisyphus is getting to the idea that how often have we been in these conferences and you've seen an idea, you've seen a recommendation and you've said, my God, I was involved in that and we did the same thing X years ago. And we've been through these, right, again and again and again, right, someone out at RSA or some other conference rolls out some new idea that had not been covered before. Um, and because of that, we are not making the progress that we should. Uh, Rob Kanaki over at ONCD had a good one on this, on um, how many times we said that the idea independently came up, we needed an NTSB-like uh, idea for cyber, right? It grew up at least three, if not four times independently um, by great folks to say, here's the idea that we need. And so what we're trying to do with Sisyphus is reduce by an order of magnitude the time it takes to develop good recommendations by having a searchable database of every cybersecurity recommendation ever made in the English language. Now, I don't know if we're ever gonna hit that of every cybersecurity recommendation uh, ever made, um, but that's what we're going for. Uh, any advice on that? A hoodie and a vest, get it, <laughs> right? The hoodie is cybersecurity and the vest is, is academic. Um, okay, great, thanks. I got to take vamping lessons from someone. Um, right, and so uh, I've already come to some of the why of the size of this, right? How many damn reports have we been writing over the decades? How many thousands, hundreds of thousands of recommendations that we've been doing over those years? How many times are we repeating are we actually making any progress at all? Or are we just keep stomping on the same ideas? A new, a new team gets involved um, and comes up with the ideas. So what we're trying to do, so we're gonna, we're gonna start out with a pop quiz. Some of these recommendations, and I was really thinking about this um, when it came up um, uh, during the uh, uh, far side chat um, with Kemba, which of these recommendations on workforce are from 2000? Uh, that was the first national cyber strategy it came out two years after PDD 63 and which came out from 2022. Right. We are making now these are, are maybe less recommendations than, than than actions that the government is telling to do itself. But that's they're still about the same. Right. We are not making the kinds of progress. That we think we ought to now, if you came up with the correct answers. I would bet that you came up with the correct answers just because of the language that was used. The things that are saying more IT 
um, or InfoSec are the older ones and the ones that say cyber are, are the newer ones. If I, I wanted to control flow, I was going to strip those out um, because then you, they would have been relatively indistinguishable. So not only does this mean we're not making progress because we keep coming up with the same recommendations, but we don't realize that we're not making progress because we don't look back and can easily say, you know what, we were saying the same things decades ago and we haven't made any progress. And so um, we need to do something fundamentally different because we've had the same idea recommendations many times and we haven't been making the progress. Um, any ideas? Last month in uh, November, we had the, the, the anniversary of the first time that I can find in print that we said we need uh, we can't just bake uh, bolt security on. We need to bake it in as part of design. Any guesses with the, which anniversary it was of that? If you've been following me on Twitter, you know the answer. 50th, 1972 was the first time that I can find that in print. It was the Anderson report um, by the, uh, done by the United States, uh, by, uh, done for the United States Air Force by, I think, uh, Rand report. So 50 years, right? How does that change? How we think about that recommendation that we need to bake in? How, are you, how should we be thinking differently about when we hear that? When you say, all right, we've been saying that for 50 years, like almost like this last panel. Okay, quit, let's quit talking about it. Like, what are we going to actually do about it? Here's another one that I really liked. I love, I, I'm not sure this one fits in with my narrative, but I just thought it was really, it was really great in 2000 that they said, we're going to increase the focus on intelligence agencies. <laughs> Done. <laughs> but it's also good to go back and look at the recommendations. And, um, uh, so that one ended up not being completed in, um, in 1999. So the problem is repeatedly covering that same ground. So therefore, what SciSphis is trying to do is go mine through um, all those recommendations from the past in a searchable way. Um, so that way, when we have new staff coming in, they're able to just go through or new researchers come in. Um, just a little about the origin story. Um, so I'd been uh, uh, helped set up the first uh, joint task force, Cyber Command, back in uh, 1998, White House, uh, former vice chairman of the FSISAC. And so when the, uh, the Trump administration came in in 2016, Tom Bossert and others, when they announced they were going to do their 60-day review, I think there's a 60-day review, or it was 90 or 120, it was some, some you know, an end-day review that new administrations do, I got a little frustrated because we had just had two major reports come out, um, including the, the Donilon report and the CSIS, uh, Cybersecurity for the 45th Presidency. And so I said, we don't need to do a review. What we need to do is a horizon scan and say, let's look across which recommendations have been made like they all say, like increase the level of of White House senior. So I, we had some student. Hey, hello. Um, we had some students get together, um, and we went through report by report from fifteen reports to come up with one hundred and seventy five recommendations that we wrote up. And we sent over to, to Tom Bossert and, and, and Josh Steinman. Um, and so that's the way that we were going to proceed with, the, with Sisyphus. Um, uh, and frankly, it didn't really work that great. Uh, we, we foundered. We weren't selecting the reports really uh, very well. It was a little difficult to try and get through the, the coding. Um, and we just couldn't get the scale that we wanted. So fortunately, we were able to get some funding from Microsoft and from Smith Richardson. Um, so uh, we've now broken it down. We, we, we brought on a fantastic uh, researcher uh, as our program coordinator named Jen Lake. She was going to join today to help uh, answer some of the more technical questions, but she came up with a very bad cough. Um, she's a PhD student at uh, University of Texas, Austin, um, and she's perfect for this because she had been a cybersecurity researcher at the Congressional Research Service for like two decades. So this was absolutely in line with what uh, with 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 her work there and now she's able to work on methodologies as a phd student so we want to be able to um uh, do the better recommendations but also we want to have a decision support element in this right some some uh, because this new phase is building in machine learning at the beginning we want to be able to help 
pull out some of the patterns, right? Where do the recommendations genuinely agree? Where is there a bifurcation where, where some, some reports say do this and some say do the opposite? And so we, the beneficiaries or the policymakers and their staffs, as well as the researchers. And this is where I think it fits in with, um, by the way, I can, I can really imagine this for um, especially legislative staff, right? You're coming in with a new Congress, your boss is going to be having some um, uh, testimony um, and you need to generate quick questions, uh, smart questions quickly. Well, that's what we want for this. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Undersecretary, uh, Madam Deputy Secretary, your agency has been told, recommended three times over the last five years to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, where do you stand on that? And this is where it ties to workforce, right? We, we hit workforce a lot. And so we're going to be having a flood of new people coming in, which is exactly as it should be. But the new people coming in don't know what we know. They haven't had the experiences, right? They don't know, hey, I know my buddy was on that task force a couple of years ago and they had some recommendations on that go look there they don't know that it might not pop up in the lit review and so we're doing this in part also to help on those workforce issues so across the three phases as i said we started trying to do this just having the students go through one report at a time it was both inefficient and it was difficult because um uh because of selection problems so instead doing it in more machine learning grabbed keywords out of um, uh, the NIST glossary, um, crawl across the web, generate 60,000 documents that have that, um, start going through uh, those. So where we're actually starting from isn't just a collection of cybersecurity reports. We might at the end of our first phase have a great database of a big knowledge base of all things cybersecurity not just think tank or GAO recommendations or DSB recommendations as, as we imagined. Um, the analytical part is where, and, th and this has been relatively easy and, and is complete. Uh, where, we're, where it slowed down a lot, I was hoping that pulling regu regulate, uh, recommendations out using machine learning was going to be very easy. After all, they have a very given syntax. The subject is who's going to be doing it. It's usually probably going to be some organization like the Department of Homeland Security. The verb is going to be something like should or, or will or must. Um, and the direct object and the indirect object are what the actual recommendation of what, what you want them to do. So I was hoping that was going to be pull out. Actually, it turns out to be a super hard machine learning problem that, and that hasn't been tackled before. Um, I would have thought that was going to be easy. Um, so they're working through that right now. Fortunately, we're, we're, we're bringing on uh, uh, one of the professors from the Columbia Data Science Institute to help on that. And we think we got it, actually. We were thinking we we're getting our arms around it. Um, also, the topic modeling, we were hoping that all of the things that fit together with information secure, uh, say, information sharing would naturally come together. That might have to be a little bit um, uh, more uh, fine-tuned than we were hoping for, um, but, we're, but we're getting there. Um, we're hoping this should be out um, and online over the next, um, uh, in 2023. So going through, pulling out the keyword extraction, doing the categorization of how, of how these come together. And when it comes out, uh, we still figure out if we're going to host this ourselves. We might also team with IST uh, or Center for Internet Security or, or some other location um, to get these out. Um, phase one or this part will just start on a searchable database um, and we'll work with Atlanta Council and other think tanks to help get this out to the, to the, to the Hill and other researchers that can use it. I'm hoping that we can get ourselves past this to more of a decision support tool so that you can really see how the concepts are coming together. We're hoping that because it's born um, in machine learning and, and, in, and in data science um, that all that visualization and those other things that you, you can come together are, are going to help on that. So I was hoping to be able to say, Ta -da, and, and it'll unveil it, but we still need probably six to, uh, six to nine months before we get there. And I know we're running a little bit late, so I wanted to run through that, that quickly um, for Michael's behalf. And uh, thanks for having and open up for questions. More applause. Let's open it up for applause. Thank you, Sasha. Questions for Jay? Seven minutes, seven minutes, silence. 
AJ, um, so are you going to be able to, at some point, really look at those recommendations and, and check off which ones actually got fulfilled? It, it, great, great question. Um, I don't think we are necessarily, but some will. Um, put it this way, I don't think our team can. Um, some will be, some might be obvious, and we could use data science to, to determine those. Like, was like create CISA, got it. We can do that. That's easy. Um, a lot of them are just you know if it's improve or something like that, right? It's you know like deter adversaries. Well, how, how the hell are we supposed to do that? And so I think when we get into those, it, that's going to be on the application side, right? So that I think tech can get together and say, all right, you know, let's look at let's look at all the recommendations that were done on public private sector partnership and collaboration. And let's dive in and we do a special topic on this and look over which of these we think we think have been concluded. I'm, I'm also cautious on because not all the recommendations are good ideas, right? I mean, as you go through, there's some there, there are some real um, um, honkers in there um, that uh, that just because someone made the idea that it needs to get I I implemented. So. Um, and what, Josh Corbin wanted to ask a question. Can you hear me? Uh, Josh, if you had a question, you want to put it up on chat? I feel like yeah. I'm, is he, oh, is he behind me? Can you hear um, me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sh should I do the follow up? <laughs> Synonyms, what? Well, I think we have uh, we have the question from Josh, so I can try to read it to the audience, and then I, there might be an opportunity for my own. No, I'll, I'll do your own, okay. and then I'll, I'll do my own first. Okay, pal. Uh, I just wanted to build on the comment. First of all, very exciting, and and thank you so much uh, on the concept of measuring not just implementation, but rather impact, impact and results of the different policy recommendations. Uh, you you said it very difficult, right? Uh, depending on on you know what, what is the objective, I. I am excited about, and I'm wondering how we can build and have you consider building in um, at least, um, you know, kind of uh, qualitative uh, mm -hmm. type of, of responses into that. For example, talking with industry, talking with researchers, with hackers, talking with different parts of the security ecosystem, and even end users themselves to capture uh, you know, point of views on, you know, uh, what is the difference that they absorb the policy recommendation has made, what is useful, and what was the impact. So it wouldn't be completely, you know, um, it's difficult to measure, but there is an opportunity maybe to at least have one place or some ability to collect views, qualitative insights into that. Yeah, I like that. And that's where, I, you know, I've been, we've been thinking about teaming with places like the Atlantic Council or others that are here in town and are, are, are closer or, 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 you know, out in um, Silicon Valley. And where I think this tool can particularly help is not only giving the full set of recommendations, but also saying, and this is what I really hope out of the decision support element, is saying, all right, you have these clusters of recommendations that over time have all been saying roughly the same thing. And like that's where then we should say, okay, where's our where is our attention to go to? And and I think in general we could probably sense where those are, but I'm hoping that we're going to be able to drive those or those places where you have that bifurcation, like a bunch of recommendations that say X, or a bunch of recommendations that say not X. And you can and then I'll do Josh. Yeah, just real quick, uh, crowdsourcing is that an option to potentially do some of the evaluation, additional research? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, and we've also looked at. Um, uh, working with other universities to get through some of these bits. Like, for example, Harvard has done a ton of work on elections, right? So, okay, good. I mean, on the election, on the election security stuff, right? There's, there's no universities better than Harvard uh, to look at that. You know, you could imagine some, some for Stanford. We've talked, you know, we've been, had some talks with Duke and, um, and UT Austin uh, across that. So, um, uh, so I think so. Um, do we have, okay, great. That was one of the issues. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so 
synonyms. Uh, when you have, uh, if we're different using different languages for different areas, especially if someone, you know, some report came up with some brand new acronym that they were trying to push um, to, you know, uh, for better marketing. Uh, how do you work all of that? That was definitely an issue when we were having the students do it because the students did not have enough experience to be able to recognize that, you know, how these ought to be coded and, and, and put together. Uh, we're expecting a lot less of that when we're going through the machine with, with the machine learning approach because we're going to have a lot more examples. We're going to have a lot more scale, a lot more data points to say that these are related to one another. Great. Thanks, Josh. Jay Healy, pleasure to see you again after so long. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, have you explored um, uh, relationships with GAO and Congress and, you know, putting out some of this data? Do you have any restrictions? You know, since it's more of academic work um, and how do you see that you want to kind of expand this ideally with your partner? Yeah, that's great. Um, and it's, uh, it's a difficulty being in New York, right? Being, being in New York gives us a lot of advantages in all sorts of areas when it's come, coming to thinking about cybersecurity. It definitely doesn't help here, right? If we were, if I were um, at Georgetown or, or at the Alperovich Center, right, we would be doing this in a different manner because we're here in town um, and we could own more parts of that ourselves. Um, my school doesn't have a big presence down here yet. And so, um, so, so the two parts of the answer is, so one, I think we need to, that, that's why an important part to be teaming up. We've been mostly talking with the Atlantic Council, where I'm still a senior fellow, um, to talk through to help on those areas. And also, it's just why it was such a strategic hire for us to bring on Jen Lake from the Congressional Research Service, right? Because she knows, right? She's really in, you know, tied in well with the uh, the cybersecurity research community in in Congress and, and in other places. So, great, thanks. I want to thank. Uh, Jay for this. Um, the This project is one that I'm very personally very interested in having been you know, involved in the policy process here in Washington for um, a long time now. And I still remember my one of my very first years at uh, the Office of Management and Budget and we were talking about a policy proposal and one of the guys in the office said, yeah, you know, we tried that back in 1976 um, <laughs> and uh, it didn't work then. Right. And so I think having a resource to look at what's been proposed before and then actually start thinking about the question of if it's been recommended 17 times before and we still haven't done it, then you got to start asking the question why um, and start looking yeah. at those kinds of recommendations and thinking through why those recommendations haven't been implemented. Um, but with that, let's give Jay a round yeah. of applause. And after some consultation with Ari, what we're going to do is take a quick break now and come back in 15 minutes for the incident response panel.
Go ahead and get started again. So one of the things that uh, is certainly very true in cybersecurity is that, you know, we want to get much better. We want to be much re more resilient. Uh, we've heard that term a lot, uh, to be more resilient to uh, cyber incidents. We've talked some about actually going out and, you know, disrupting the bad guys and getting better at uh, making their lives more difficult. But the fact remains that um, some of the time uh, your resilience will fail and some of the time your, uh, your disruption will fail. And so we'll be in the space of actually having to respond to cyber incidents. Um, and, you know, understanding cyber incidents at a, um, how, like how often they're occurring, what their impact is, all of those things we've already heard alluded to by both the Luminary panel and by um, Kimba and her, Kimba Walden and her remarks. And so now we're going to have a panel uh, to actually talk about some of these incident response issues and some of the incident reporting requirements that are coming out and some of those uh, kind of policy issues that um, are in this space. So with that, I will turn it over to Harley Geiger from Venable to uh, uh, lead this panel. All right. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, this is Threat Landscape Transparency through Incident Response Reporting. And uh, as the title suggests, we are going to be talking about reporting cybersecurity incidents, particularly to government bodies. Um, I'm Harley Geiger, I'm your moderator, and I'm an attorney here with the cybersecurity services team at Venable. Um, and this panel, as Michael mentioned, is very timely because there are several requirements that are gonna be coming into force in the next year or two that are gonna affect large swaths of the economy and require incident reporting. I know that some of them were talked about earlier today, like uh, uh, Circe's rule, a uh, proposed rule that would apply to entities within critical infrastructure sectors, potentially a huge range of entities. And of course, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed rule, which would apply to all public companies. Uh, again, a very large number of organizations. So if your organization is not yet thinking about incident reporting, there is a high likelihood that they will uh, pretty soon in, in the future. Um, but what does incident reporting look like? Like what, what, what does it require? What is the purpose? What is the benefit? And how does incident reporting affect uh, incident response and incident prevention? So I'm very pleased to welcome this esteemed panel here uh, to talk about these very issues. So I'm now going to turn it over to the panel to make uh, brief introductions, starting with Ben to my left. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Good to be here. Uh, is the mic picking? How about now? Test. There we go. Uh, hey, everyone. How's it going? Uh, so this is actually my second uh, time at, at Cybernext. First one was, I, I believe, the very first Cybernext. So it's really cool to be back. Um, my name is Ben Miller. I uh, come, I focus on critical infrastructure. So uh, early in my career, I was at Constellation Energy, I actually helped build out their entry response team when I was there. Uh, at the time, that was a Fortune 150 company. Uh, and then I spent several years at NERC, uh, where I worked on uh, the cases from incident response activities that may come in and, and other other matters around the electricity grid. Uh, so I mainly come from an electric background, but I am uh, currently at Dragos. Uh, Dragos is focused on uh, OT or industrial control system security. Uh, and my team uh, uh, uses our technology and, and really the, the consulting uh, consultants that are doing assessments, doing incident response, doing penetration tests within the critical infrastructure. Uh, and so that's a lot of the context I'll be bringing to this conversation. count to five. There we go. Hey, uh, hey, everyone. I'm Megan Stiefel. I'm the chief strategy officer at a nonprofit organization called the Institute for Security and Technology. We're a West Coast based quasi think tank dedicated to eradicating and uh, identifying emerging security risks largely presented through technology. Um, one of the reasons I think I'm here is that uh, I was a I am a co chair of the ransomware task force, along with um, Michael Daniel and a few others, uh, Kemba. Um, and this is the third nonprofit I've been at since I left the government. I was an attorney in the Department of Justice in the National Security Division uh, and worked on a range of issues, including FISA, now that everybody understands what that word is. Um, many didn't a few years ago when I started, uh, but largely uh, was a 
involved in cyber policy, both offense and defense, uh, spent a little bit of time at CSIPS and uh, left to the government uh, after working for Michael, um, not because of Michael, um, <laughs> uh, and, and half of, I feel like, the uh, Venable security team. So I'm uh, delighted to be a member of civil society comment, commenting on this today. Uh, Coleman Mehta here from cybersecurity company Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so thank you very much, Harley and, and team, for, for having us. Um, senior Director for Global Policy, which means that me and my team at Palo Alto Networks make sure that we're offering ourselves as good partners with government agencies around the world on areas of operational collaboration, but also anytime they're implementing regulations like CERCIA. And so I think we uh, we all have a vested interest in making sure that, that CISA gets this right and, and want to be as good partners as we can. And so very much looking forward to this panel today. Uh, prior to Palo Alto Networks, I was a long time in the US federal government, about a decade with Homeland Security and all of the CISA predecessors and National Security Council staff as well. Thanks. Okay, so let's start really basic. What is a cybersecurity incident? And how does it differ from a cybersecurity event? Uh, ben, do you want to take this one? Uh, so I think it's different between policy and, and the practitioners. Uh, in the electric sector, uh, definitely we define every term. So everything has a definition. And, and uh, from a regulatory nature, it's existed for years. So cyber incident is a regulatory event that happens. Uh, and it's generally connotated with like malicious uh, or impact uh, that's surrounding it. Uh, which would be different from event, which is just something happened, we don't know what, and we don't know if it's malicious in nature or not. Uh, uh, so using using those terms with, within that space uh, definitely has connotations of like everything is an event until it hits a certain threshold. And then we have an incident and that sets the timer off for 24 hour notification, things along those lines from a NERCSEP perspective. And uh what, can you describe some of the, the differences in terms of the seriousness of cybersecurity events, right? Some of them are presumably insignificant, some of them less so. Yeah, well, on, on the critical infrastructure side, uh, certainly there, there's uh, an aspect of, well, we're not really concerned about data loss, uh, which historically with, within the IT space has been uh, what we've been measuring. I, I believe some of the panels were talking about that earlier as far as number of records loss, the, the impact from revenue. This uh, critical infrastructure is more of uh, impact to safety, loss of human life, uh, environmental concerns. Uh, uh, and, and so those have been uh, demonstrated uh, over time. Uh, in 2017, a refinery in Saudi Arabia had a safety event several times uh, caused by malware that was in the safety uh, controller, the safety infrastructure of the refinery that tripped the refinery itself. Those are the sorts of events that uh, are in scope in the critical infrastructure landscape. Does anybody want to add on to that? Or that was great. Okay, so um, let's stay in the in the vein of what is a what is an incident. Uh, let's talk about vulnerabilities. Is it what are the what is the difference between just the presence of a vulnerability and a cybersecurity incident? Is is having a vulnerability itself a reportable incident, or should it be? I think the you know. The legislative history of, of how CERCIA implemented the incident reporting requir regime came to be, I think it was pretty clear that looking at things like um, potential incidents or, or possible vulnerabilities was, was out of scope, right? And, and, and I think that's for a very good reason, which is for a productive incident reporting regime of some kind, you need clarity, right? You need to make sure that it's a confirmed incident, that it has some sort of tangible or substantial impact to security, that it has something that you can sort of evident, have some sort of evidentiary basis by which to understand that there's an incident that occurred that should have some sort of um, uh, tail end response to it that CISA can do something with. Coleman, there we go. Um, it, but just to build onto it and say an unexploited vulnerability should not be considered an incident, right? But it does not mean that it doesn't deserve attention. So we do, you know, just to echo things that have been said earlier, to points that have been said earlier today, we do want companies to be thinking about how they're managing the vulnerabilities within their networks, but, uh, and, and being aware and setting timelines for uh, proper management, but that does not mean that it should become a reportable uh, so-called incident to the, the, the regime of, of organizations that, that all of you are subject to, and I just uh, give you my empathy. Um, so, you know, and just to, to I think, well, 
to sort of further and partially um, selfishly footstomp uh, something that we worked on with CTA with Michael is uh, a cyber incident reporting framework that that uh, we through in our efforts to implement recommendations from the ransomware task force where we did call for heightened incident reporting requirements including ransomware payments um, developed a, a set of recommendations and I invite all of you to take a look at it but um, there we also made this distinction between an incident and overall excuse me vulnerability and whether or not it had been exploited so Great. So we're looking at something that happens, you know, to security. It seems to be uh, malicious or potentially, you know, causing damage. It's not insignificant. It's not the mere presence of a vulnerability. What is the benefit of reporting that to the government? What is it? What is the benefit of incident reporting? I'm, I'm happy to start. So I think CISA has been pretty clear, and, and I think we would associate ourselves with with some benefits here. One is. The more collective understanding that that we in the cybersecurity ecosystem have of incidents, the better. Um, the more that there's an ability to run analytics to identify trends, and even for CISA to ultimately search support in cases of exigent national security issues, on balance, are all a good thing. And I think for us, the first principle there of identifying a, a sort of a, a tangible good for the cybersecurity community is, is really, really important. Uh, and I'll give a quick example. So about a year ago, CISA and some of its federal agency partners put out uh, an alert around an incident that had occurred with a particular infrastructure, critical infrastructure in, in a port activity. And um, our threat intelligence team at Palo Alto Networks, which is called Unit 42. So Unit 42 went and ran its own telemetry based on that alert and was able to identify other places where a particular threat actor was using similar vectors and similar TTPs, and um, but not in the critical infrastructure sector that CISA and its agency partners had identified. But it was clear that it was related in some ways. And so we're able to use, turn that back over to the federal government and get sort of a broader understanding of what an impact is and, and how this is an important incident that should be triaged in some ways. So for us, when we're thinking about CISA's ability to enrich the data and to make sure that it has um, that it can take steps to have that broader understanding of, of what an incident is and, and why it's important and, and how it can be responded to is really important. Just to build on that a bit, um, there we go. Yeah, so I, you know, Coleman is frequently referring to CISA, as I already said in my remarks, I came from the Department of Justice, so I would li not limit the scope of incident reporting, no, no, uh, to, to our lead cyber defenders um, on the domestic side of things, including notwithstanding, uh, or excuse me, um, not to exclude cyber, uh, cyber command, but in addition to doing um, analytics and enriching data, you know, I think obviously we know that other organizations are involved in the data enrichment, and so we would hope to see that as incidents come into CISA, uh, they are being uh, enriched with information that the government already has access access to, um, and you know, potentially, as I think Coleman even alluded to, working with other information provided by private sector entities to do some, in addition to kind of day-to-day -day management, we have trend analysis. Um, I mentioned the investi investigative measures that can be undertaken with this uh, type of reporting, which also then can lead to preventative measures. So the government can issue, uh, through any number of alerts that it can issue, uh, recommendations to different sector entities to better protect themselves and take this, these preventative steps to prevent further exploitation um, and reduce the, the victimhood of, of other entities. Um, I think the other piece of this that, that um, and again, to sort of partially footstomp other work that Michael and I did, uh, we there was an op-ed that we were fortunate to have published in The Hill right after uh, the counter ransomware initiative in early November. And one of the things that we talked about there is, you know, reporting helps uh, think about the trend analysis by a sector basis, by sort of what is the rate. And I think one of the big questions that so many of us are grappling with, and I think uh, even Rob Joyce has come back around to say, oh, ransomware was down. Well, no, now it's up. Uh, we don't have a good sense of this. And Kemba alluded to this earlier today. So we, we believe that incident reporting will help us make a better assessment, you know, take the straws and build a one big, huge, uh, hopefully like, I don't know what that straw would look like, but uh, to EA Goldstein's um, remarks, have a better picture of not only the U.S. domestic ecosystem, but where trends are happening globally. So I hope that's a big enough plug. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, much more to add than, than what was already stated. I, I, I think it's fair to, to not assume uh, um, like a lot of parts of the uh, other parts of the world, uh, critical infrastructure is not actually owned by the U.S. government. It's owned by the private industry. So when you're really looking at what, where the largest threats uh, uh, to the nation, it could be against critical infrastructure. 
uh, largely there's not a lot of visibility into that, uh, especially in the, in the OT industrial control system side, uh, especially six years ago, there was just a lack of information. Who was doing this? We had anecdotes, right? We had Ukraine 2015 uh, and a journey of a lot of other activities uh, since then to now include ransomware that does, does uh, get into OT environments. Uh, so that the landscape's changed uh, and it's like less anecdotal to, to um, more um, empirical, still a lot of missing data out there, especially from the, uh, the US government's perspective. So since incident reporting is, is a lot of it is about threat landscape transparency and intelligence sharing, uh, do we think that this will, uh, how important is that to the security team within organizations? And do we think that there's uh, evidence that this will uh, inspire them to strengthen their safeguards to prevent cybersecurity incidents? Uh, I'm not sure if it's necessarily, uh, so I, I think the folks that are already concerned about it are already strengthening their environment. And then there's those that aren't paying attention. Uh, uh, so uh, these rules don't necessarily change that for uh, individuals um uh what was it I forget the last part of your question oh will it um will it help companies realize that they need to strengthen their security safeguards i think the largest i think the largest challenge is them competing with uh the the aspect of security versus regulatory risk uh, and what does that look like uh, from a regulatory perspective? Uh, and I think that's the, the largest challenge they have when when these dynamics dynamics come into play. One thing I would add is where when the government has additional information and there is a reporting requirement under CERCIA, at least, to say here are some trends that the government is seeing, that will help, I think, uh, organizations either continue to make the case that they need to make ongoing investments in cybersecurity or for those who are still struggling to convince their board that this is a worthy investment, um, hopefully embolden them uh, and give them the data behind the need to make these investments. So the the two uh, reporting requirements that we talked about being proposed earlier, uh, CERCIA, the SEC rule, they get a ton of attention. Um, but there are, actually there are already you know, numerous reporting requirements that are in, in law on the books already, um, get a lot less attention. And so through those, we do have some idea as to what the government is already doing uh, with incident reports. Um, what, what is the government already doing with the incident reports? What should they be doing differently? I think so. some of the uh, other regulations or security directives, so certainly uh, TSA has security directives around uh, reporting, uh, both on the pipeline side as well as now on, on rail. Uh, NERCSIP has been uh, in um, in motion now since like 2009, I want to say. Can we, can we tell the audience what, what NERCSIP is? Oh, geez. Uh, so NERCSIP is uh, Critical Infrastructure Protection. Uh, it is the, the first mandatory regulation for critical infrastructure in the United States. Uh, it came about in the uh, Federal Power Act of 2005, I think, uh, mandated it. It was uh, um, given authorities to work in uh, 2007 and became uh, compliant in 2009. Uh, but that's also that's cybersecurity as well as physical security. So when we're thinking about the uh, substations in North Carolina, uh, this past weekend, there are regulations that exist on mandatory reporting of that event that would have occurred, I believe, within six hours, if I remember correctly. Uh, so there's both physical and cybersecurity regulations there. Right. So that's for bulk electric systems. And you have a regime already set up where they have to report and then do follow-up reports. And has the has the electric sector then been getting that sort of threat landscape transparency through that uh, that that reporting regime? Uh, yeah, it, it, so it's been occurring since uh, 2009. Uh, uh, there are a multitude of reports from OE 417s, which is a DOE uh, report, to, to some of the others. Uh, but those those workflows already exist. Uh, so they can be reported to NERC, who immediately shares it with uh, FERC, the the federal regulator, as well as DOE and, and CISA, uh, and and coordinate uh, with industry depending on the event. The challenge there, uh, as as exists on physical as well as cyber. So, so uh, certainly like the, the substations of recently, um, you get a report on substation getting shot at, it happens all the time. It's like, was it, was it a pistol that shot a, um, a uh, insulation, an insulator, or was it a, a high powered rifle that was shooting substations? So that, that's often the ambiguity that's in those initial reports. Same thing on cyber.
So it's already happening. We're already getting some benefit from incident reporting. These regulations that are coming on board, particularly uh, CERCIA, what do we hope that CISA will be doing with them that enhances the, 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 the current process that's in place for certain sectors like electricity? You know, I would say that we, we didn't quite talk about the mechanics of the, the implementing the regulation, but from the, the time of enactment, which was March of this year, CISA has, I think, 42 months to put together a final rule with the, the commensurate notices of proposed rulemaking and so forth. So that's a, a long tail that they have. I would encourage them now to start thinking about how they're going to ingest the information um, I, my expectation that sort of given how the, the definitions of covered incident and covered entity will ultimately shake out, but there will probably be a significant amount of reporting that needs to occur. It almost certainly will need to be an automated system and an automated ingest in some ways. So thinking about how to automate that now and, and so that it is ready to go and not, not thinking about that 42 months from now when or 42 months from March when the, the final rule is, is ultimately released, making sure that there are security controls that are a part of it. Um, you know, we're not too far uh, past solar winds when there were what nine federal agencies, um, in, including DHS, that were that had you know security incidents associated with them, and this is a an extraordinary repository of incidents and, and understanding what you do know and what you don't know, et cetera. So those two things, like figuring out that automation and figuring out that security, I think are really really important to start doing now. So I I think there are. What do we hope that they're doing? There are also things that CISA is also required under the statute to, to do certain things, like provide adequate security to the data. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are three things that, that I would say, just some of which uh, Coleman mentioned, but we want them to secure the data, we want them to share the data, and we want them to analyze the data. Um, obviously, I think folks know that the, the sharing internally, is particularly to the law enforcement community, is within 24 hours of receipt. Um, I think I, I put analysis after sharing because what may be important to CISA or some other entity in the USG may not be the same thing that's important to the law enforcement community. Um, what we don't want them to do and what we know that they're prohibited by statute from doing is using those reporting incidents for regulatory uh, measures, actions. Um, you, under the statute, uh, a regulatory agency cannot, by virtue of reporting only under that statute, take regulatory action. It is 220. 2245A5. I looked it up earlier this afternoon. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, we, I hope we will all come to a point where we recognize that reporting is not our problem. It's ignorance that's really our problem. This was the point that we made in our, in our op-ed. Um, the other piece of this to say is uh, um, we, in thinking about, uh, Coleman mentioned um, the, the automation piece of this, and I know we're going to get to this, so I'm not trying to get us to harmonization just yet, but to, again, sort of foot stomp some work that we've been doing. Um, there were really 10 principles that we suggested ought to be included in CISA's work uh, to implement CERCIA, including automation, but also the idea of um, interoperability and equivalence. So hopefully when uh, all of you have to, probably most of you will be required to report under the statute, uh, that it doesn't require you to then report the same information uh, to the SEC. Um, that we will get to a place where there is kind of a one one form suits them all, but it's also important to think about a form and a format that enables um, the probably low frequency, but also thinking about voluntary uh, incident reporting entity that is not super sophisticated. We want the form to be able to collect the minimum amount of information that can allow even the smallest entity to voluntarily share information about an incident. And then, if you are more mature, like everybody else on the stage, um, you know, you may be able to provide additional information that can really help the government and others enrich the data. So those are just a couple of things I hope we know. Some are required and some are. Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned the uh, that CERCIA uh, has a lot of uh, requirements in there for what CISA must do with the data. When I, I see a fair number of comments to the, to the rule and calling on you know CISA to declare what it's going to do with uh, with the um, uh, incident reports but but it actually there's there's pages worth of requirements about what they and, and the NCIC must do with it um, you know yeah, but I also agree that they could get into more specificity about how they're going to build it out um, so we talked about what an incident report is what the benefit is why why we're doing it um, let's talk about the effect on incident response because ultimately somebody has to write this report and and they're probably writing it under the worst of conditions. Um, so, Ben, could you talk to us about what it's like dealing with a significant cybersecurity incident? Significant incidents are the most likely ones that will be reported. Um, let's say that 
you know, your day one after a ransomware attack has, has, has just landed. Um, what does it look like? Like before we even get to reporting, like what is your bandwidth like? What are, who else is involved? Well, bandwidth would be limited, uh, certainly. And it, it would all largely turn into uh, probably a conversation with the, the manager of, of that incident. It's the manager and the legal team. It's probably a quick conversation. It's, I don't want to conflate uh, information sharing with instant reporting because they're entirely different. Uh, uh, instant reporting is as minimal details as you need to populate the form to, to hit send uh, that uh, your lawyer agrees with. Uh, in information sharing hopefully happens afterwards on these are the details, these are the forensics, this is what we understand the attack to be, but it's probably not that first 24 hours is probably not that first week. It's, it's uh, a while uh, that they're sitting down and sharing those details. Sure, I, I, it's a great point. I, I would add that if you haven't already talked to your legal team or to your crisis response teams and to the, the, the ancillary teams that would be associated with an, with an incident response, then it's, it's almost certainly too late at that point. Um, so that you've already answered the questions of, what, are the, what is my liability? What protections are in place? What do I do if I report this? And I do think that, you know, to the to your point, Ben, about you know the the minimum number of requirements to hit send is probably true. But that's also I, I would imagine the start of the conversation with CISA. And I think they've been and the other federal agencies involved, and I think they've been pretty clear that they would expect the information to change over time and to make sure that that um, that that open dialogue is is occurring. Yeah, I think this idea of iteration is something that we suggested be uh, part of the uh, implementation of CERCIA. Uh, that is, of course, very much more easily said than done. Um, how do you decide when you need to to advance or update your report? Um, what if you know the information, as we all know, will change multiple times as the uh, response carries on? So how do we not flood the system with with minor updates? Um, but just to again, you know thinking about an incident response plan and presumably most regulated entities or all regulated entities already had reporting as part of uh, their incident response plan. Obviously now that that's the scope of those entities reporting will uh, will grow, but to ensure that it is, um, it is an element of the plan. And I mean, to your point about the incident evolving and the report therefore evolving, um, what are the chances that 72 hours into an incident, you're reporting something inaccurate? It's kind of a softball. I'm sure that it's really hot. Yeah, no, that's definitely. Uh, I've I've definitely experienced that. Well, where uh, you don't have the legal team involved is when you get the more detailed reports. I would say of uh, uh, from that angle, uh, and and the situation changes drastically. So I, um, I, I can think back on, on cases where where uh, various facilities were brought offline on what was assumed to be a attack on malware where it was a false positive and, and other things occurred uh, that led to that. Uh, so th there's definitely, you can have that quick reaction uh, uh, that is missing key elements of data because you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to share out because who knows, is, is this happening across uh, the, 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 the US? Don't know, got to share it, make sure. Uh, so that there is that, that tension there for sure. So to draw some of the pieces together though, if we're looking at reporting you know, inaccuracies just because of the nature of the uh, of the timeline and follow-up reports as a result of that. And we're layering on top of this, not just the incident response, but one, two, perhaps three other incident reporting regimes, right? So in the case of, of, a, of you know, an electric company, right, you have NERC, you have potentially CERCIA, and then if you're a public company as well, you've got the SEC. So three different reporting regimes, plus on top of that, your follow-up reports and perhaps follow-up reports after that. Um, it is a pretty sizable uh, reporting obligation that is sort of kind of coming down in the next couple of years. Um, what does that look like for the for the strain on an incident response team? Um, is, is it minimal because you give it to the lawyers and, you know, and they, they, they're going to make it vague anyway? Or, or does having, you know, that that regime I just described, is it going to uh, be be a strain on incident responders. I think the Coleman's point. Like, if the conversations already occurred between uh, the the security teams and and the legal teams, then it's generally a really light lift. Uh, maybe long term, like those next six months could be uh, interesting. Uh, but in the in the short term of of when you're actually responding to the case, it is a pretty light lift because everyone's on this. 
everyone wants the same thing, right? Uh, restoration of operations and, and uh, everyone being in a secure environment. That's great. So some of the fears about this getting too uh, uh, too much of a strain on incident response may be unfounded if you can prep beforehand. If you can if you can have those conversations and processes established first. Um, how about making sure that you're not introducing too much noise into the system, right? So, like, wh where should the threshold be for incident response, uh, or sorry, for uh, incident reporting? You know, how significant is significant to ensure that, you know, when we're, what we're giving the government is not just clogging up the system for their analysis, but what they're giving back to the, to the industry is also high quality intelligence. It's no secret, and, and you all are, are very well aware that the, the vast majority of cyber attacks today are both automated and commoditized, and it's just a, a constant barrage. To the extent that the your defenses are, are equally automated and are stopping those, that would not rise, in my view, to the, the threshold of a confirmed incident. I think that would overwhelm the system in a counterproductive way. Um, you know, if, if, if we're looking to our federal agency partners to do the trend analysis and to understand the analytics and, and ultimately to surge support in, in cases of, of clear national security interest, then they need to be able to focus on those aspects of it. And to, to the extent that it's a, you know, a run of the mill, just constant attack that that probably does not rise to that level. In the framework that we proposed, um, there is a, this idea of materiality and uh, an immediate, I, actually we didn't put immediate in there, but um, uh, a significant impact on uh, both reputational harm, access to uh, trade secrets, something that would, again, rise above the level of the day-to-day -day scrum and drang of being an incident, uh, you know, in the cybersecurity services industry and, and selling services. Um, we also, in our piece of this thought that, in our recommendations, thought that it should be uh, the types of entities that should be covered, um, so not so much what, what should be reported, but who should be reporting is entities with um, not fewer than 50 employees, over 100, over 1,000 customers, and potentially sort of 5 million in revenue so that we aren't looking at, um, I don't know how many employees there would be in a substation. I will say, though, that I think if we are, um, if we don't think about this uh, a bit expansively, if we do have attacks on hospital systems, you know, rural hospital systems where there are not many uh, staff, um, and it turns out, that, like the substations, that all of a sudden it's happening around the country, we do need to, to be thinking about how it is that we will detect that. Um, I do think, you know, under the criteria that we proposed, that hospital would probably meet the threshold. Um, and I'm getting ahead of one of your questions, I know, but um, I, that's where I went. <laughs> well, so the, that question is. Um... What, who should report? Like, what is the metric? So you've, you've described what sounds like a size-based metric, a revenues-based based metric, but is that, um, how do you square that with the potential for, you know, as you just talked about, substations and hospitals that maybe have a smaller staff or smaller revenue, but also have an outsized consequence if they are disrupted? And I, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. So the, the way that Circia defines covered entity, it's any entity in a critical infrastructure sector, uh, which is the economy, right? It's 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 huge. It is, seems unlikely that that will be the final definition of of covered entity. Um, but what is the existing framework for narrowing down that universe of potential covered entities? There's the Section Nine list, but that could be too under inclusive. It's not a very long list. So what what else? How how else to do it? How else to define covered entities so that you're not capturing everybody, but also not capturing too small of a group? And I don't know the answer. I have an well, idea. I shared our but question, I don't. but I don't know. If, um, it's a tough question, I think, and, and it, it needs to be very well considered. Um, and I think also it needs to be one that we uh, we encourage um, both CISA, but also lawmakers and others to be mindful of the need for it to be itself iterative. Um, so that we, and I think actually that also may be required under the statute is that there's an, uh, in a frequent uh, reassessment of whether covered entities and uh, uh, a covered incident is keeping up with what we know from day-to-day -day operations. So um, I think it, it also goes to this point of um, how, and I think this is also required under the statute, but just to draw the point out, how uh, how if, how have we and will we, how will we um, manage measurement of the impact, uh, the effectiveness of these uh, reports? Um, that I think too should inform the covered incident and covered entity process. And you know, I was in a conversation last week where um, the one of the participants is um, been in the uh, financial services business and, and has been a lawyer for the government in that space. And he said, what we don't need is another SAR-like regime. 
because that actually is not that informative and effective in managing um, crime through financial services. So I think that's something that we all ought to be bearing in mind. And his, his you know, was sort of saying, we really need to help lawmakers and, and others think about how we will um, measure the effectiveness of this uh, reporting process as it, as it evolves. Right. There seems like there's a, a risk here of uh, a lot of potentially covered entities not knowing that they're covered entities, not knowing that they actually have an incident reporting obligation. I mean, if it's every everybody in a critical infrastructure sector, that's that's every IT company or every healthcare company. Distinguish that from the proposed SEC rules. If you're a public company or not, you know, you 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 know if you're a public company or not. Um, Cersei, it sounds like it's just kind of inevitably going to a bit more be a bit more ambiguous. Coleman, it looked like you were about to say something. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I, I would almost flip it in some ways. I mean, there's so clearly a, a crawl, walk, run element to this, where it, it's so important for CISA to get it right and to show value pretty quickly of the incident reports that it will be receiving, that you could imagine a scenario whereby it would start with some subset of critical infrastructure that it deems most significant of some kind and, and start with those as covered entities to to again do the crawl walk part of it and then when they have a better understanding of how it works and how they'll utilize it and how industry partnerships will occur then then you can broaden it from there it's a tough question i mean clearly it covers all sectors of the economy so far but you know they really need to think about how do they show value quickly and go from there i think the just to build on that a bit i think the, the need for CISA to raise awareness and again back something that we covered um around the, what qualifies as a covered entity uh, and potentially thinking about you know, the ability for CISA to offer to, for someone for an entity to write to CISA to say, "Here's who we are. Do we are we in or are we out?" Um, would be something that hopefully is also being considered as as Rob Silvers and the team are are thinking about this process, uh, because ambiguity is is not going to be helpful both for victims but also for the government. Yeah. So there is um there's a, a process that uh, to designate uh, entities systemically important entities, right? Um, there is a, a, a Langevin bill, and it did have like an appeals process like that. So you you know you, you would be notified under this bill uh, whether or not you you are one. The bill never made it through, but CISA has said that they're going to continue with this process of identifying systemically important entities, and that is the only other sort of process that I know about that shrinks that universe of potential covered entities down to something that is a bit more uh, more manageable than you know everybody in the economy. Me. Um, but that too may be under inclusive. Um, so we'll just have to see. Well, that, um, um, I think please. there might be a utility if if this process does evolve to where an entity could write and say, am I covered or am I not, that CISA could provide some transparency, obviously strip out the name of the entity requesting its a decision about its uh, uh, role, to, uh, its responsibility to report. But then, um, and again, some of you are probably familiar that this happens in other areas where there are um, letters that the government will write that say, this only applies to you, nobody else, but you can still um, draw some baseline uh, senses around uh, whether or not you might fall in or out of that regime. I can sort of see that conversation going, do we need to report or not? And CISA says, well, what are the consequences of being disrupted if you are disrupted? Um, it could be a long conversation. Uh, so incident reporting harmonization. So we've, we've, We've talked about the different reporting regimes. We talked about the the uh, the, the effect of it. Um, should should incident reporting requirements? So we you know we know, we know there's several different agencies that have them, but should those requirements reflect the purpose for which the incident reporting requirement is in place? Right. So the SEC's purpose, for example, is investor transparency. Now, it's a different mission than strengthening cybersecurity. Uh, does that make sense, or does it just make harmonization a lot harder? <laughs> Harmonization is obviously very important. Um, I, I think it's it's slightly a red herring in the way that you describe, which is that the 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 ultimate goal of each incident reporting regime matters a lot. So the you know the, if the SEC's goal is to ensure that the investor base has an understanding of a publicly traded company's risk posture, then the and the CERCIA regime's goal is to understand the universe of incidents that are occurring and be able to find the trends and search for it and so forth, then the necessarily the, the data fields that you would be providing for each of those are, are different. And so in some ways, harmonization means making sure that they're not working at cross purposes. You could envision a scenario whereby there's almost a central portal of some kind that would, you know, you provide all relevant 
data fields and the ones that are appropriate for the SEC would go here and the ones that are appropriate for Circea would go here and so forth. And I think that when we think about harmonization, it's much more relieving the burden on the incident responders or the lawyers or the entity that's that's doing the reporting, understanding that they do have very different goals and that those goals are are, are very different. So that's a great visualization. Megan, you have other thoughts. I know your your work on what harmonization ought to look like. Can you describe it? Well, it, it, largely, I think along the lines that Coleman suggested, I think you know, making it easy uh, because the goal here is call it thoughts and prayers, but the goal here is information sharing. Um, so, uh, and I would say that reporting is, you know, um, it is a form of information sharing. It's just gotten a different name. And I think people still sort of hate it, uh, even though it's a, a new name with a similar similar objective. But um, it's important too to recognize that uh, not only would we seek and recommend that there be harmonization within the domestic context, but as, as our companies, US companies and other, uh, companies are subjected to incident reporting requirements globally that, that we are able to support a common uh, framework for that process and that at the lexicon, hopefully, uh, you know, we can, we, uh, U.S. companies can lead that that discourse throughout the globe so that we um, not only, you know, incentivize inform information sharing and incident reporting by making it easy, but also uh, not make it overly burdensome on all of you who are subject to it. So, uh, we'll continue to push for for harmonization uh, as most, as often as we can. And can we talk about the global like the global incident reporting uh, uh, frameworks that are out there? Right, some of them are are very different than what we've proposed here in the United States. Right, um, uh, India's, for example, uh, Coleman. Oh, no, they're all very different. Um, India's is um, extraordinarily strict. Australia has new rules in place. The UK, EU, Canada is contemplating them at this time. Um, you know, I would note that there, through the the, um, the the statute that created CERCIA, there's a harmonization council led by DHS. But the the remit of that harmonization council is is federal government harmonization efforts and not internationally necessarily. So in some ways, this is a DHS plus State Department and diplomacy plus, you know, commerce and their trade and export rules plus companies that do business around the world, you know, working in lockstep to ensure that the uh, the myriad regimes across the world that are focused on incident reporting do have, you know, do work against cross purposes. So it needs to not just be a domestic effort, but also one that involves the uh, international engagement arms of the United States government as well. Um, I've got one last question, and we'll start with Ben before we open it up to uh, to the audience for questions. I'm not sure how much time we've got. Uh, you've got like four minutes. Four minutes. That's great. Um, and that is that is this. So it's on voluntary reporting. So we've been talking largely about requirements to report. Um, when you look at the sort of the background of the proposed SEC rule or CERCIA, you're see, sort of sensing some of the frustration from regulators that they feel as if though companies are not reporting uh, enough to them and hence the need for a requirement to report. Um, uh, ben and, 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 and panel, uh, are, do you have a sense of how to get companies to report voluntarily more often? Um building relationships so uh, the the uh, opening keynote uh, keynote uh, was great at pointing out the the start of the conversation happens with the report it doesn't end there you don't you don't get the end product by by the report itself it's the conversation that occurs uh and as value is shown there that's going to fuel more and more and more uh behind uh those uh involuntary or voluntary reporting so I, I think it's largely showing value in, in understanding the, the vision of where we're headed. Um, you know, in a slightly different context, President Biden's executive order from May of 2021, the, the software supply chain elements of that were, were really interesting for a number of reasons. But one was that you know, the requirement that if, if you want to sell to the U.S. government, you will have to ultimately implement the secure software development framework or the you know the various requirements in place. This is one of the the sort of first times that you're seeing the US government use its market power to drive behavior in the industry. So if the US government wants a particular outcome, then it has policy levers at its disposal to try and drive that outcome. And to the extent that it wants to do so in this context, then it should think about what those levers are as well. I think the other thing that would be helpful is for the government to clarify what it, the scope of certain voluntary, existing voluntary um, protective measures, so to speak, for incident, for 
the sharing of data. So I'm thinking about CISA 15. Uh, there, uh, obviously, that's a that's a voluntary uh, capability, and there are liability protections afforded. We in the ransomware task force report identified a couple of areas that that could stand to be uh, clarified, particularly around um, whether uh, payment information, wallet information from ransomware payments, is uh, within the scope of a, of a CTI. I wouldn't think it would be a, a protective measure, but um, defensive measure. So I think there, in addition to the relationships, are all built on trust, and I think that that will definitely incentivize the voluntary measures. There, there are additional measures that the government can take to clarify, uh, not necessarily offering new authority, though that may that may need to be um, considered. But clarifying also, I think you know, there's a, there are a number of questions under uh, under some of the the sanctions regimes and and the like that that uh, I know particularly in the crypto space there there are uh, wishes that OFAC could clarify some of the some of the the lanes uh, there so um and i think you know particularly with respect to CIS 15 as reauthorization comes down the pike there's an opportunity and i hope all of us can help uh, inform that effort all right thank you friends your questions please i think we got time for like one question so. <laughs> that question so, uh, first I, I, I think they're actually a pretty good, strong arc why the SEC requirements. Hello. I think there are pretty strong arguments about why the SEC requirements should be different, given that there's a different set of companies that are covered, different motivations, different timelines. Um, but uh, with regard to the uh, the motivations to report the the uh, I think a lot of us may feel like the, to err on the side of caution, you would report something that might be uh, unclear whether or not you've tripped the threshold. And, um, it, and then you talked about before about the potential need to update information as more uh, details come in. Have any of you given any thought to the idea about what should happen if a company reports something that they later on determine should not have triggered a reporting threshold in the first place? I doubt that the government is going to delete the information. So what would be the, the proper approach in your view um, in, the, in those circumstances? And that's a jump to the question. And it's Eric Wenger for those who are wondering. Sorry, Eric Wenger from Cisco, sorry. <laughs> online who it is. Um, you know, I think in some ways that becomes then a voluntary report. And it is under the statute afforded the protections that, that voluntary reports are afforded. So, um, but yes, I think that beyond that, uh, but remember, there is no, you know, there's the prohibition on regulatory enforcement. So, I, um, but it's a, it's a great question. I do think, though, that there, um, I would hope that companies wouldn't be overly concerned about that uh, because that they are still protected through, as I said, kind of a voluntary measure. Um, I presume part of the answer is that you would file a follow-up report correcting your earlier over-eager report. Um, but, but the point that you raise about erring on the side of caution and over-reporting, I think, is a, is potentially a real one. I know we're running out of time as well, but uh, in context of history, like 20 years ago, we didn't talk about incidents at all. Like, look how far we've come. <laughs> over to you, Michael. Yeah. Well, let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you, Harley, Jim, Megan, Coleman. So we will now transition to the last panel of the day uh, to talk about uh, the uh, war in Ukraine and its effect on the cyber landscape. So I'll go ahead and ask that panel to come on up to the stage. There's still one or two over there for you, Chris. So for this panel, um, I think it's a really important topic. Um, if, if you were just following the media um, on what was happening in cyberspace as a result of the war in Ukraine, uh, you would have whipsawed back and forth from thinking that cyber Armageddon was about to be unleashed across the entire planet uh, to thinking that absolutely nothing has happened. Um, and obviously neither of those two uh, extremes is true. 
Um, so that's one of the reasons why we thought this panel was so important to have to actually unpack what's been going on and explore the real implications from the war. So I'm going to turn it over to my longtime friend and colleague, Chris Painter, uh, to introduce himself and the rest of the panel. Uh, great. Uh, it's great to be here uh, for the final panel today, the wrap up panel. Uh, I'm wearing my full Ukrainian garb. I have a Ukrainian color tie. I have a Ukrainian flag. The, the only danger of this is a friend of mine is the um, head of the Norwegian National Security Agency. It's really like their cert. And I was wearing this ribbon and she said, uh, why are you wearing Sweden's colors? So uh, there, there is a little confusion. Um, I have a uh, august a group of panelists today. No one ever comes and says I have a pedestrian group of panelists, but we have an august group of panelists, and and uh, I'll have them introduce themselves, uh, and maybe just go down. Uh, maybe it's easy just to go down the things because my, my experience is moderators introducing it never really works, so they can talk about themselves better than I can. So please, thanks, Chris. I, I like to think of myself as pedestrian, so no worries there. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, Ron Bushar. I'm the uh, CTO for Government Solutions at Mandia, now part of Google Cloud look after our service delivery and support to government mission partners around the world. And I've been uh, closely involved with uh, our support to Ukraine and defensive mission there since really prior to start of the conflict in February. Uh, my name's Matt Only. I'm the Senior Director of Threat Intelligence at Cisco Systems. And my team has been operating in Ukraine and with the Ukrainian government uh, since 2015, and we have a pro bono arrangement with government and critical infrastructure organizations in Ukraine, protecting 40 different organizations and uh, providing defenses there. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Maggie McAlpine. I'm the cyber engagement lead at uh, MITRE Ingenuity Center for Threat Informed Defense. Uh, my involvement with Ukraine is actually at my previous uh, company. I was giving the Ukraine briefing, so I had to get up to date for this one, but uh, uh, but it's still something I'm very Nothing's passionate happened about. really recently in Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael, when do we have, what's our stop time? I want to make sure that for this panel, we actually get some audience interaction. So I want to leave some time. 50 minutes. Okay. So um, 430. All right. Great. Uh, well, as Michael said, you know, there's, there's this uh, you know, portrayal in the press that was sort of a whipsaw. And I think in part that was due to kind of unrealistic expectations that you had. Oh, and I'm Chris Painter. I'm the uh, president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. I uh, I'm an advisory board with Palo Alto Networks. I have a podcast on CSIS with Jim Lewis, and I'm the former uh, former U.S. government for that 32 years, including as a prosecutor at the White House and then finally at the State Department. So I've been doing this for a while, too. I know all these guys. Uh, so I know many of you. Uh, so, you know, you got kind of got whips on the pre press, partly because I think there was this expectation from this U.S. government narrative, which I always hated, of there's going to be a cyber 9-11, a cyber Pearl Harbor, a cyber Armageddon. And when you didn't necessarily see that, people were like, well, I, you know, what's going on here? So I think that partly conditioned it. But I'd like to hear from each of you guys that, you know, did cyber play the role that you expected it to play? And what role do you think it really played? So, you know, to try to cut through a lot of the noise and, and fluff that was out there. I'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, so I think if you look at it from the perspective of global, you know, Pearl Harbor or 9-11 type of model, obviously it didn't come to fruition for probably a, a multitude of reasons that we'll, we'll talk about later. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that from the perspective of military kinetic operations and supporting cyber operations inside of Ukraine, especially at the beginning of the conflict on kind of day zero of the war, it was, you know, well-coordinated well action, fairly impactful from our observables effort to de deny, degrade, disrupt, and otherwise uh, cause chaos or, or at least cause the Ukrainians a lot of headaches in trying to respond to, you know, a very large military invasion, right? Um, and in putting pressure not just on military command and control, but on civilian command and control and how the country was going to organize emergency response, aid, all those sorts of things were all targeted by the Russians and fairly successfully, at least for a short period of time, which again, I think if you look doctrinally, right, the the goal clearly was to capture Kiev in the first, you know, couple of days or maybe weeks of the war and, and end it quickly. And so, you know, if you look at it from a purely strategic or tactical military objective perspective, um, this was a, a cyber coordinated effort or a coordinated cyber effort with a, with a kinetic operation. And it was, I don't want to dismiss the fact that it, you know, it was fairly well done right now. The, the, the larger question is why did they not then escalate beyond 
uh, Ukraine borders, and also why you know why are they having challenges now in sustainment, just like they are on the military side? I think those are questions we're going to get into later. Yeah, and so clearly one of the primary pieces there you're talking about is the Viasat uh, hatch, just to, to be clear, uh, which happened in coincidence with the initial invasion piece. Um, yeah, I think we've we've certainly to to Chris's point, who who has a lot of background on this as, as well is have been painted a picture of, of all the lights out in Ukraine and, and no communications and no internet. And so there's a, a couple of pieces there. Um, one, the Russians have set themselves a very high bar in terms of what a successful cyber campaign looks like in, in Ukraine because of not Petya, um, which was a radically successful way to some instance uh, or some understandings more successful than the Russians ever imagined it possibly could be. Um, and so that's, you're, you're some, you're looking for somewhere unrealistic is the, the cyber Pearl Harbor, uh, certainly realistic because it's happened is not Petya and they've fallen way short of not Petya in terms of impact, even that initial impact was certainly disruptive because of the criticality of the communications that were happening. But like Kiev was still up, all the cameras were still up, the communications were mostly still going. There were certainly things that were definitely not working. Um, we just paint, I think we've been painted a vision of, of cyber activity cohesive to military operations. It's not realistic. I don't think it's realistic to expect especially, and we'll get to this over the long term, as you start to deplete your munitions and, and run out of access, to con cohesively work with military units to deliver tactical objectives um, during a conflict over time. So, so not as good as not petty yet, but better than OPCW. <laughs> Roughly. He's doing cops, right. Well, I, I will say I'm a, I'm a little of two minds just on sort of the way it's framed as in like there hasn't there hasn't been one, therefore will never be, and therefore we knew this from the beginning that this was never going to happen. I mean, the community in cybersecurity was absolutely split about whether or not there would be one. And so to kind of look back and go, well, we always knew it was never going to be bad. Well, first of all, the conflict's not over yet. But second of all, um, that's absolutely not true, that people knew in advance what was going to happen, and, and arguably we still don't. They're still sitting on a pretty sizable um, zero-day library that they're, for some reason, not deploying. Uh, a lot of people are afraid going into this winter that things could start getting very serious. They're going to be going after infrastructure. They've been hampered by other things too. For example, that was the very infrastructure that they hoped to use themselves when they came in. So, uh, and when they did start taking out things like the 3G towers, their own uh, sophisticated radios, I believe, stopped working because they were reliant on those 3G towers. And that actually allowed the triangulation that got quite a lot of officers killed because they had to go to unencrypted methods that allowed them to get, you know, blown to pieces. Um, so it's just, there's a lot of complicated things. I, I, I don't have a conclusion on this and I don't want to say that cyber, like there's going to be, you know, the lights are going to go out while we're having this panel here. Uh, or even if they did, that they would be out for very long, because that's the other thing, too, is like these attacks are happening, but they're not necessarily sticking. Um, they're, they're being fixed quite quickly. And I think that should also be factored into like discussions around this is the Ukrainians are incredibly resilient and great at getting everything back online when these attacks do happen, which is quite frequently. So you'd all agree, though, that the press narrative was not exactly uh, a model of clarity in terms of what you actually saw. I mean, you did see cyber operations there. I guess one of the fears I had is that, you know, when cyber is finally getting the priority it deserves because of ransomware and other things over the last year and a half, two years, that some people would look at this and wrongly conclude, well, cyber is not a factor and therefore we don't need to care about this anymore. But and that was my worry about the reporting. Uh, that was out there. But none of you, you all of you have seen this in real tactical, impactful ways in Ukraine. Is that fair to say? Well, I mean, if, excuse me, I mean, just if if any of what had happened in Ukraine had happened in the United States, it'd be a cosmic shitstorm here, right? Like we we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. Um, I think we have to, to we're, we're we have, have a incident public response plans. We can <laughs> just file the report <laughs> with, that you're required to file. Um, we have to understand that the public is looking at at Kherson and they're looking at Bucha and, and you're trying to convince them that, hey, there's a cyber element too. And you've got, you know, civilians with bullets in the back of their heads with the hands tied by their head. And they don't, it just doesn't measure. It doesn't, we, we try to paint the cyber war thing and it's not war, right? And I think that's that we're trying to say the wrong thing. Colonial pipeline still happened. Like there is, it's very clear that via, via cyber means you can cause enormous problems. 
But I think the way that we've presented it has been incorrect, or the way it has been perceived widely has been incorrect. I mean, is it fair to say part of it, and you know, several people have said this in the past, that you don't want to use your sophisticated cyber tools and it takes a long time if you you know if you're like 50 yards away and you could just launch a, an rpg over there and knock out the target is that a fair assessment from you guys i mean you know from from the perspective of and it's hard to assess this accurately but i think there is a a model of thinking that would say um you know uh, if there's a critical target or strategy strategic target why not try all means and methods right to ensure like so if the missiles don't work like with the, everybody remembers that famous footage i think of that one large radio tower getting hit and it didn't fall over right it's still operational so like okay shoot, if it's important to you militarily throw everything you have at it that's one model of thinking the other model might be to uh, to my panelist point over here is well if it's something you hope to capture and reuse let's not use kinetic means against it let's let's disrupt it long enough to you know till we can capture it so it's it's you know it's going to vary depending i think on military objectives but um you know there i i don't know that you can say it's an either or necessarily anyone else on that i think just uh, two points one is to is that we have to be very clear that that ukraine's been very good in its containment of information so we don't have all the information that what's going on and so i think i think what you'll find is each of the three panelists has a different set of information and, and our views will kind of be be kind of like polluted by that but the other thing is um and, and the audience would appreciate you spilling all of that yeah, I'm sure they would. <laughs> as americans we have to be very careful about projecting our thought processes on on particularly this adversary who thinks differently and so i think you'll find that if you're trying to think as an american military would they have invested many years in this hearts and minds sort of approach and maybe they want to be able to use use that water plant Whereas this particular adversary has shown it has no regard for international norms and is perfectly happy to put missiles in any and everything that's in Ukraine. So to Matt's point as well, I mean, I would highlight that, you know, as much as there have been just you know, destructive attacks, they're, they're not, they're never as obvious in cyber unless they're affecting critical or, or OT infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And we have not seen as much of that here. And I do believe a lot of that is due to resilience that the Ukrainians put in place, especially on power distribution, power grid operations, those sorts of things, you know, since 2014. But I would also highlight to your point, I, I do think that cyber in particular is still a battle space that's intelligence focused as well. And so there's a lot of stuff that doesn't come out, right, purposely about what's being targeted from a data exfil or data collection perspective, um, you know, across multiple agencies and, and other sorts of high value assets inside the country. And by the way, that 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 includes the, the larger sphere of, um, you know, European Union, United States, elder allied nations. Those are certainly being targeted from an espionage perspective to understand potential response, you know, retorsions, those sorts of things, right? Clearly, they're tied in, but it's not the overt, you know, I, I think you said it well, Matt, it's like, it's not warfare, as you reported in the news, it's not planes flying overhead, it's not helicopters being shot down. Maggie, you had a comment? I just, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to sort of get to the heart of the actual, like, question itself, which is, um, is, is, is cyber warfare just, like, not what we were expecting? It's just not as, like, you know, flashy as we were expecting. Uh, and I would say, like, as you guys said, you know, it's it's about espionage as well. It's about, you know, denying of resources to them as well. But they, it has been used in cases in a hybrid manner. For example, to, you know, you shut, you denial of service attack the uh, uh, ticketing site for the train station. So people have to go there in person and then they would bomb the train station. So, like, this actually has been happening. I think it's more like, is it making it into the United States of awareness and news is also a question. Also, all the ransomware attacks, a lot of them are actually tied in and we are feeling it in that respect. So like, not all of them, obviously, but, you know, there's a, a chunk of them that are, you know, in response to the war in Ukraine by Russian or Russian aligned operators. So, you know, not, it, of course, if you can bomb a power station, that's more effective. It keeps it offline longer than uh, just hacking it. But I, I would say it is, it is happening around the edges. And I would also say that I wouldn't let this conflict necessarily define what it could be in the future, because I think Russia also has limitations on their side, both strategic and, and resource-wise, that should be taken into account. So you, some of you have touched on this already. Why do you think Ukraine, seemingly at least, has been so good at fending off these attacks to the extent they have? And maybe that's a false narrative as well. But, you know, Ukrainians have said to me that, you know, you guys have CyberStorm, you have a big exercise every year. 
we've been actually doing an exercise in real life ever since the first invasion. Every time the Russia wants to try its tradecraft, they use us as the, the, the test bed, and we've been, we've been working on that. But, but is it more complicated than that? Is there a lot more going on there? I think that's true. I think they're obviously, you know, if you're under pressure, you get better much more quickly. And and I certainly think we've observed that, as I mentioned, with some of the critical infrastructure. But I think this is another unique dimension of cyber that you don't see in the other um, domains of military operations, which is you can quickly bring to bear um, not just, you know, weapons, let's call it right, uh, weapon systems that have to be employed by people on the ground, but you can essentially bring a coalition of of the willing, right, countries, private sector to the defense of the country very, very rapidly and remotely without really putting anybody in physical harm. So that's a totally different, um, you know, math, right, when it comes to defensive cyber operations. So now you, Russia's not just fighting Ukraine in cyber, they're fighting, I don't know, 20 some countries and however many dozens of private companies that are the best in the world at doing this. So it makes it significantly harder. Now, what I would say is you put that on the timeline, not a lot of that was in place on the 24th of February. A lot of it got put in place by the 24th of you know, April, let's say, or, or even sooner. So the rapidity of the response and the, the, the capacity that you can bring to bear, I think it alludes to what Matt was saying as well, which is that you, you only have a short window of time for effective cyber operations in a conflict like this, because especially if you have a situation like we do here, where there's essentially a global, almost global response to the aggression. Oh yeah, just gonna I, just add to that. You know, that might be also one reason we for the caution. I think that got brought up earlier, which is like, do they really want to open up that can of worms of having you know, everybody coming back after them? Because I would actually love to raise the question of almost to the room, almost to the world, like, what are their defense capabilities in Russia right now? Um, they lost five percent of their IT talent in March, I believe, or with people fleeing the country. That was just a rough back of the envelope I did based on the numbers that were leaving. And, and many did come back, but they might have also left again. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of a lot of questions I have also just in general around, do they want to open themselves up to attack right now any more than they already have? I think the, the thing that I would want this room to know about my experience working with, with the Ukrainians in, in, in from, from 2015 to now, it's what they figured out that the U.S. has not figured out is the private-public sector partnership. Like I, I think, I think that the the speed at which I am currently observing the appropriate government organizations working with the appropriate private sector organizations when there's a problem is very, very fast, and it, and it's very tightly coupled. I, I I'll, I'll tell a quick story about uh, I was doing some election security work in a U.S. state. And I had brought one of my Ukrainian employees with me, and I and I and, and we were explaining that that he'd done all this stuff. And so they asked him, "Well, how are you defending so well against the Russians?" And he says, "Well, we moved most of the stuff over to to Linux, and we're not using Windows, and that actually helps." And and he's like, "Well, how did you convince everybody to switch to Linux?" And he says, "It's a war. We just told them you're going to use Linux, and they did." And so we should like the main the two main findings that, that Cisco has for this conflict so far is one, nothing we've told you about how to defend yourself has changed. Everything that we've seen there is 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 in line with what what we, we have seen, all our recommendations about how to prepare and address for these things are still valid. Um, the second thing is is that you do things during crises of this type that you would not think of doing during regular time. And it is worth without getting like crazy and weird, thinking about what would a crisis look like in the United States and how would we respond to it? Because I don't think that we honestly approach those questions sometimes. And, and not, I don't want to be negative at all. I mean, everything that, um, that we've talked about is absolutely true. I think one lesson we definitely saw, and again, this is unique to obviously military operations, but um, Ukraine, one thing they did not have, right? They had, they had a lot of practice and, and um, expertise and so, you know somewhat level of resiliency, but they did not have really a mindset, especially in the government of kind of cloud operations outside of the country, especially for anything they deemed as critical um, data. And they now to their credit, they changed that rule like day one of the conflict, overrode the law and said, right, let's get our critical workloads, applications, data out of the country as quickly as possible. It's worth considering now it's obviously a kind of a fairly unique edge case, maybe, but you think about other hot zones around the world where you you might have a lot of infrastructure concentrated inside of a fairly small geographic area, let's say, it's it's certainly a risk, right? And it does not lend itself to resiliency 
uh, whether that's a man-made disaster or, or a natural disaster. So it's worth thinking about from a, a you know, backup and continuity of operations perspective. So if you like pick a country, I don't know, Taiwan, <laughs> maybe. I didn't say, but it's an easy uh, narrative to, to pick up for sure. I mean, to, to Matt's point about whether the U.S. government has, to, you know, has, is is trying to learn from this conflict and has a kind of response plan. It was interesting in 2007 when Estonia had the denial of service attack. Then the, you know, I co-chaired something called the National Cyber Response Coordination Group, which falls trippingly off your tongue uh, as what the coordination mechanism was there. And we did that. We actually took the Estonian thing and said, "What that if that happened to us? What you know? What would be the implications? What would we do?" And I imagine the White House has done that in this case, although I don't know. So, well, we can ask them next time we see them. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of a combination question. It's, it's more what the private sector, you each have alluded to the private sector having played more of a role in this conflict than I think in prior ones, uh, and particularly because of cyber nature. So how has that played out, A, and then B, to the point, the question you presaged a little e or earlier, which is, you know, we keep talking about the potential blowback, and the blowback could be against countries, but also could be against the private sector and even the co the companies who are helping the Ukraine. We really haven't seen that yet. You know, certainly DHS has had the shields up approach, and the shields are still up, but we haven't seen that expected kind of them going after us. And, and what explains that? So, so it's kind of, both of those questions kind of together. But you can I'll, I'll go first. Any part of that. So, okay, um, I think. Look, there's a, and, and you, I think you mentioned it, I think you're headed this way. Um, there is in any organization a limited capacity for executing on mission, right? And so there are only so many cyber bad guys in, in Russia. There's a lot of them, like I think we're pretty sure. But, um, you know, there's only so much capability that they can bring to bear. And so one of the things that people ask is, well, why didn't we see all these crazy things in Ukraine? Well, one reason is I would expect their best would have been engaged in espionage operations because the thing that would hurt Russia actually is outside of Ukraine. It's the West's response and the world's response to this. And so part of why we haven't seen blowback is the other side of that has been engaged in, in kind of Ukraine. So I think they are, they're probably, you know, and this is, this is pure speculation, but relatively tapped out in terms of what they do and what they can handle if they engage in certain operations, because they will also have to worry about what the blowback is. And has that, uh, and others can answer this too. Has, that doesn't seem to have paused or tempered the private sector getting involved in this. In other words, there doesn't seem to be the worry about Russia coming after them as much as I would have thought that that would happen. I, I think, we, I mean, speaking for myself, um, but I, I think everybody up here and maybe a lot of folks in the room, we've all been targeted by Russia anyway already, right? <laughs> for many, many years. So it's like, how much worse could it be or how much are we going to worry about it, especially in a situation where it's so clearly you know, uh, whatever your rubric you want to use in terms of legality or just morality, it's just so clearly black and white. It's not, it's not gray at all. Um, and again, I think it's simplified in this domain, um, by the fact that you don't have to put people in the country, you don't have to put them in harm's way physically to support, um, these efforts. And it, it, it makes it a, a fairly straightforward decision. One thing I'll also mention, I think I've heard, you know, we've, I've heard discussions around, um, you know, are, is there a concern on Russia's part if they escalate outside the borders? You know, do they trigger something with, especially NATO, right? Article five, et cetera. I think that's you tends to be an overblown type of uh, rubric because I it's the threshold for a cyber attack that would lead to a consideration of an armed attack, as you know, as defined in Talon, let's say. It's so high. You'd have to literally cause a meltdown or a destruction of a dam that would loss of life in the thousands before you'd trigger something like that. So I think that's not going to be a deterrent from them, you know, from a response perspective necessarily. I think it's a simple calculation of intent and motivation and capacity, as Matt said. So the focus is in Ukraine. They don't see the the return on investment and attack, and maybe they just don't have the access that they would like to have in order to have enough of an impact that it would be worth you know, the additional expenditure of, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, capabilities as well as, um, you know, uh, intent to do it. Right. And it's not worth the It's not worth the, the additional repercussions that come. Yeah. Yeah. I was just uh, laughing because uh, most of my focus on the Ukraine briefings I was doing was kind of around ransomware specifically. So my you know, deep, not broad. Um, but one of the things that was very funny was right uh, right before the conflict started, uh, one of the ransomware gangs, uh, I think it was uh, Revil or one of was uh, arrested like very 
publicly. And it was sort of part of a, a one-two punch of Putin sort of implying that, you know, if you guys play ball with us, if you co cooperate with us, we'll go after more of these guys. And, uh, and if you don't, obviously we won't. It was just, you know, typical shakedown sort of tactic. Uh, and, and I remember thinking, well, how is that any different than what you do now? If you, you know, you, you already don't go after these people. They're already, you know, one of the lead ransomware gangs married a, you know, leaders married a Senator equivalent's daughter recently. Like you guys are tight. This isn't going to change anything. So um, sort of along those lines. Also, we don't know if they just got conscripted after this video ended. So how can we take you at your word? How can we take you at your word when you just blow through all these treaties when we don't know if anything we do is going to change your mind uh, So uh, or, or change your operation? So I think absolutely there's a side of it, which is just, why should we, um, you know, wh why, what would change if we did what Russia asked and what assurance would we have that they would continue to say, not attack us with ransomware as just an example. It's and, an audio denial of service attack. Yeah, I guess. I mean, so. you know, just because they don't like seem to abide by those rules in the first place. I think it plays into a, a larger um, strategic effort around information operations and, and misinformation. And that, that was early days, especially like remember with the buildup, there was a lot of denial and, and oh, we're, look, we're doing things to address these issues. And when in fact, it's all just show. Yeah. And you'll probably talk a little bit more about that, that kind of domain at some point. So I don't want to jump right into that. But I do feel like that piece of it in particular was just ham-fisted theater, essentially, that just did, that, that didn't land well with maybe audiences outside of domestic in that case. I mean, it really, it really just came across as confirmation of what many people thought that, that ransomware is almost a policy play at this point out of Russia. Yeah, and a final note just on the ransomware thing, there's, there'd be two reasons to do it, right? And, and this was a question I was asking myself and others at the beginning of the conflict, which is, um, they're using ransomware basically to shut down operations. To you know, in in Ukraine, it's not they're not asking for ransom necessarily, but outside they are asking for um, money. They are asking for ransom, and it's two sided. One of it's punishment. We're going to go after all of our enemies, and there's a lot of patriotic Russian hackers, Russian aligned hackers who are going after everybody else because they're you know allowable heart targets. Uh, but it's also money, and I do wonder how much, as the sanctions tighten, as as money is an issue, how much of those sorts of attacks will be about not just money for the people who are the criminals and things like that, but actually like money because they need money as part of the, you know, the overall machine. Um, so, I mean, I do think there's still some possibility of a fear of escalation and not, not article five escalation, but there's more that the West can certainly do that they haven't yet done to Russia. So if they do something that was, you know, in those countries more directly, you know, I think they, they there might be some fear. It's hard to, no one's in Putin's head except for Putin. So who knows, but, um, well, let me ask this, you know, there's several other questions I want to ask, but I do want to get the audience involved. So let me let me just ask this kind of catch-all question. Um, what are the implications from this conflict for cybersecurity more generally or even more specifically? And it can be everything from what you started to talk about in terms of can we actually deter or change Russia's behavior to uh, why cybersecurity either needs to be a mainstream priority or not. Any 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 way you want to take that is is fine. Maggie, we'll start I, I don't think we necessarily know yet, and I know that's a bit of a um, an easy answer to these things, but I, I was sort of wondering at the beginning of this, are we seeing, are we as far into what cyber warfare will look like as what we think it is? Like, we think we're in like maybe strategic bombing World War II, but we could be at the hot air balloon stage for all we know, for, for how far we are from how, sci how cyber warfare will be used someday. Um, and I, so I think the implication, the reason that there was that fervor at the beginning, which I think was justified, was this was the largest hot conflict we had seen where cyber warfare was an aspect. So we're still actually, I would argue, learning. And actually, I think we're going to learn a great deal this winter, too, because if they start what you, what you talked about, about thousands of people dying because uh, of an attack, that becomes a lot more possible when it's freezing out and you shut down you know the power and maybe we will we'll start to see those things in Ukraine. I, and again, I'm not saying I think we will or we won't just it's not over yet, I think. And we are seeing where we are on the escalation of what cyber warfare will be one day. I think we could be quite early. We could be quite a bit earlier than we even know yet. You want to go? Uh, well, I mean, look look out the windows here. Like, if I have a plane and a bomb, I can blow up any building that you can see here. If I have an O-Day, I cannot hack any company that you can see from here. Like the thing about cybersecurity that 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 I don't think is well understood sometimes is that it is where opportunity meets capability, and and that opportunity is is not easily defined by the attacker. 
And so, yeah, Russia may have a pile of O'Day, but maybe the S-bomb for the organization they want to go after doesn't line up with that, <laughs> right? And so that, that's, that's the key piece that, that I think uh, you need to understand, policymakers need to understand about, about cyber. It, it'll look really good in a flash. Like at the beginning of the war, we saw, we saw VSAT. And we're like, oh, that's, that's, a real, that's a real cyber attack that led to military objectives. That lines up. That's cyber war right there. Um, but then you, you didn't see it go on. The one, one of the instances that we can talk about um, is Ukraine Telecom, um, which essentially had all of its routers flattened. And so there was almost no network traffic over that. But 24 hours later, they were all back up and running, right? And so it, it is, I think we need to temper, we have to respect that everything that we were scared of from ransomware right, is still things to be concerned about. Like, like, but I think we need to temper our expectations for, for what cyber can do, especially tactically. Um, it is a fantastic espionage tool. Um, it may not be a great war fighting tool. And I think that's, that's a responsible thing to say out loud. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's two things that are definitely true um, that will carry forward. And I, I take your point. We're going to see adaption and change, right? This is still a very young domain of doctrine generally and capabilities. But I think two things are certainly going to be true for any future kinetic uh, conflict. It will be live if it's in any sort of developed country or region at all. It will be live streamed, right, and put on social media uh, for the world to see. And the narratives and the the information sphere around what's happening is absolutely going to be a contested domain to think about. And number two, I think it's clear the lesson that anyone would take from this is to, Matt's not wrong. It's got limitations, but any any coordinated kinetic attack, uh, you know, against infrastructure, a country with relatively robust digital infrastructure, will have a component of destructive cyber attack attached to it. It's just going to become standard doctrine, I think, for any any sort of future military operation, and especially in the beginning of a conflict, as you all said, because then you have the capability, you have the access. As things drag on access becomes more dear and you may not want to burn that access and i, I you know michael could attest this too you know if the president asks what's my cyber uh what's my cyber response tools you say well we can get you something in six months which is not exactly something that's satisfactory to you know commanders in chief around the world and we, so. and we should be clear like there have been dozens of of successful cyber incidents events whatever we're calling it, i don't remember which way it goes uh in ukraine that have resulted in destructive malware deployed and used what we haven't necessarily seen and is and, and again there's fog of war and really good information control is were those definitive in terms of denying ukraine their ability to govern or operate tactically and that's very unclear absolutely we'll it's look forward to all the early. academic articles after this but go ahead yeah. i was gonna say absolutely it's definitely also too early to take what we know publicly about this and say one way or the other if things worked or not i think it was we know there were 1600 attacks that the U that uh in the war at least as of this summer um which was an escalation of about five times from before the war began but we're still relying on them to tell us <laughs> you know so there's a lot of interest involved in, and we just maybe can't even draw a complete picture yet. So not, not a complete story yet. So I'm going to open the audience. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So please go ahead. Yep. I'd, I'd be a little cautious about that um, for a couple of reasons. GRU is the natural organization to be connected to closely with, you know, mili tactical military operations is what they do, right? Um, it's uh, it, it, so, you know, FSB, SVR would be, you know, not you wouldn't necessarily expect to see them, and especially in things like destructive attacks generally, right? Um, now, what I would what I would emphasize, we do have good evidence, forensic evidence from the work we've done in the country that there was 
placement and access going back months, if not years in some organizations. Now, how that access was put there, whether that was strategic and then handed over, probably, right? But I think it's it's a little bit, you can't necessarily draw a quick conclusion. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious from just from the eye test that yes, the expectation was lightning attack, topple the government, install a new regime, war is over. Um, so I think the and, and by the way, I think it's pretty clear as well that, you know, a lot of even senior leadership inside of Russian military command and control really didn't know a lot about what the plans were. And I think that has to apply to the cyber forces as well. So they were probably handed a mission objective a few days prior, handed a, a bunch of access, right? And said, come up with a plan and execute. Don't worry about having to, you know, um, long term, get it done in, in a couple of weeks, couple of days. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, obviously, but I think the observables line up to that storyline. So I, I just want to caution that uh, there, there was clearly some level in my mind strate of strategic pre-planning um, on the digital side of this, whether that's, you know, purely espionage or pre-placement and access for destructive attacks in coordination or both. I think that's, they're both plausible. Um, so I don't know that there was zero forethought put into this, but I also don't think it was as well executed. Uh, and, and as maybe as a lot of us assumed Russian, I mean, we're, we're seeing the same thing on the military side, right? We thought combined arms, you know, by Russian military would be second best in the world, third best in the world, maybe outside of us and NATO, right? It's, it's clearly not. Um, for maybe a variety of reasons. And maybe part of that is just the lack of planning and preparation for this. Hard to say. I mean, to your question, and I'll, I'll just be real blunt. Dude, it's been 10 months and, and this is a war. Like things move quickly. What What is your story that you're going to tell about how the Russians sh should have been here? Like, like they have not shown the capability that we've expected. It may be that they've done it in places we can't see it. Um, but, but I don't think I'm going to tell some story about how they had short-term access and they had long-term access. Like, things happen in war and either you can keep up with it or you can't. And strong indication right now is they can't. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it, and it looks like right now, actually, a lot of their attacks are, um, uh, scrambling a little bit. They're not trying to hide anymore. They're just kind of like hitting everything they can as quickly as they can. They And they're also doing a lot of conscription work, not just military, you know, ground forces, but also um, basically going up to their, you know, criminal, criminal underbelly and saying, hey, you work for us three days a week now and uh, or else uh, you go to prison. And by the way, the prison population of Russia has been depleted 25%, I believe, in, as far as conscription goes. So like not a good place to be. Um, so, all, you know, all things being said, like, that's great. You're adding bodies, but are they motivated? Are they skilled? Are they good at what they're doing? It seems like they're just throwing everything they can right now, which speaks more to desperation than necessarily to like really considered strategy. And I, I don't think we can underestimate that maybe they're not as good at this as we thought they were. Not as bad either as the, the worst projections, but like, uh, I think there was a good quote that was like, we found out that the Russians aren't eight feet tall, but we should, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, two feet tall. They're, they might be, you know, four or five. Now, I, I, think, I, you know, I do think there's this tendency, as you said, to think of Russia and China both as these monolithic regimes when there's lots of dissension with them. There's not great communication sometimes within them. So, you know, that I think that we should take something from that too. Uh, any other questions? Come on, they gave you time now. Ask questions. At the end of the day, it's your last chance. We're keeping them from, from cocktails. How does the panel end or how the war ends? <laughs> make it, make it stop. That's a good make question. it stop. <laughs> now, uh, how, how do you think this is going to wrap up? We're, we're, you know, not that long into this, or maybe we're long into this. Where, where, do, where do you think you see this? Where do you see this ending, maybe? We're way where will it be, or where will it be a year from now? Where, where do you think? Just prognosticate. And so I, one of the things you'd said that made me think about, uh, and, and I thought about it earlier, and I haven't, I haven't thought about this before, is what we're seeing. Some, so what we're seeing, and in, in, in my, my view is going to be a little different than Mandiant's because I'm doing defense on perimeter, so I tend not to see after execution unless it goes real bad, um, and we've been fairly successful in defense, is everything thrown at the ukrainians like every kind of stupid exploit like old stuff new stuff stuff from here stuff from there and it and it may be that just much like you're seeing on on the front uh now in in the east of ukraine just an attritive sort of approach where you're like i'm just gonna wear you out and you're gonna be up 24 hours a day responding to events until you just can't anymore and that may be that may just be the way they're they're doing. They don't know anything else than just to keep trying, and that's as as much of a strategy as they have going on. I mean, proverbially, throwing bodies at the problem is kind of 
the Russian strategy. And, and I'm a big history buff. So I, I think the sh most shocking thing from that perspective to me in this conflict was I thought they had modernized. I thought they were different than back then. But like that mindset is still apparently very much there. And the amount to which they haven't changed in that mindset, like since World War II, just throw bodies at the problem until it goes away, uh, actually was kind of shocking to me. I mean, like it's clear, cyber is not going to determine the outcome of the war, right? Um, and so it comes down to, I think it, it comes down to one person, it's Putin and, and his calculations on, is there an exit strategy that allows him to at least plausibly claim victory to, you know, the, the, what matters to him, which is staying in power in his own regime. Right. I think that's, that's gotta be the core calculation in all of this. And so, um, how long that goes on for is, is it's, it's depressing to think about, but it, it, to me, it's almost purely dependent on, on that calculation. So you're all, since you're also shy, you can ask some questions during the reception that's coming up. But what I'll do is just do one quick run through. Any final thoughts? Anything you want this audience to take away from this uh, from your your discussion today uh, that you haven't already said, or even that you already said you want to emphasize? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, as as um, practitioners and and you know, as speaking for myself, as somebody who's done this for you know 25 years now, you know we um we do tend to think about cyber conflict and cyber even cyber war or just being in the battle so to speak and, and major incidents and we've all lived through those i think it's you know what i've taken away that's most close to home for me in in all of this is all that is true for the ukrainians uh on a daily basis and they're also getting missiles fired at them every day you know so you think about that and what they're up against and what they've been able to accomplish it's just extraordinary um, you know, and it's, it's worth, it's worth keeping in mind as we, as we think about this as, as kind of, you know, um, practitioners in this space, but not under these conditions. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes I've made during this conflict was I was, uh, I had a meeting with the Ukraine cyber police and some of the SSS CIP folks, uh, and I showed up, uh, with a button up shirt and uh, that was not the play. They were all, they looked like, uh, I can't say that, but they look very, they rough, uh, and in t-shirts. I'm like, no, I mean, this, this is not how you go to this meeting. Um, they look like their president looks. Yeah, <laughs> they, they sure did. Um, uh, Here's here's what I'd say. Uh, Cisco is very proud of the work they've done in Ukraine, um, both during the conflict and in in the six years or so prior. Um, I've been there numerous times. I, I've grown very fond of it. Um, cyber is the smallest of stories in Ukraine, and and I just want to recognize that. I, I would just say that. Um, if I could impart one impression, it would be uh, don't underestimate Ukraine in any of this. I, if I had to give the over under on longer or shorter of this conflict, I would I would put the money personally on shorter at risk of just being you know catastrophically wrong. Uh, but just because it does seem to be the less talked about possibility uh, that they might win and win sooner, a lot of the things that Ukraine has said that they will pull off, they've pulled off. Um, contrary to what the Russian propaganda would say, and contrary to what like a lot of sort of common opinion is, they've they've been kicking ass, and I think that you know deserves to be recognized. Um, and I would also say that, uh, but now just to pivot to cyber, we also have to be prepared for the fact that I think even after the hot conflict were to end, I'm sure Russia will continue and you know to say, yeah, Ukraine no holds barred, harass them forever. And this is, and I'm speaking from a assumption that Ukraine will win spectacularly. Uh, and very soon, but like even then, Russia would come back and be like, well, "We're just going to pester you forever because we hate you now." So this is probably not going to go away on the cyber side anytime soon, even if the war ends. So I, I think we all agree on the extraordinary, really extraordinary job the Ukrainian people have done in, in pushing back against Putin and his regime, and and the bravery that they've shown. And I think on the cyber realm you know hopefully this will keep th this transition from it finally becoming a you know a mainstream policy issue will continue and not as many of us seen it, the sinusoidal curve where it's a, a priority and then 10 minutes later it's not so hopefully that this among other things ransomware will change that so with that uh please thank our panelists our august panelists uh please please feel free to ask some questions uh during the reception and uh thank you any any you, you were going to say something i, I said pedestrian our pedestrian, our pedestrian, <laughs> uh, who will now walk off the stage. Uh, so, so thank you all. Yep. Another round of applause for the panel, please. All right. So I get the uh, honor, the privilege of being the final speaker of the day. So I'm standing between you and drinks and the bar, and that's never a good place to be. Um,
But I did want to reflect on a few of the things that we've seen um, out of the discussions for today. If you go back over, starting all the way, and the questions that I think you know this actually leaves you with to go and think about. Um, if you think about what um, Eric Goldstein was talking about this morning, there's some profound questions about how do we actually know that the security products that we are buying and that we are using actually work? Um, how do we actually measure efficacy of security products? And there's a strong argument out there that there is in fact a market for lemons um, in security products. Um, and so really thinking through that question of efficacy is an important one. From the luminaries panel, not only did we get to hear the F-bomb and the word caboodle um, used in the, you know, in the same panel, um, there was actually a, you know, a, a fundamental question about like how much is the ransomware being driven by the crypto markets? And will the implosion of things like FTX and other things uh, and other associated exchanges affect that market? Um, the you know, on the diversity panel, I think one of the things that you could take away from that is the question of how do you actually be uncomfortable in this space? I am a 50 something white guy, and this conversation makes me profoundly uncomfortable much of the time. And that is a place that I have decided that I just have to be. And I think more of us need to be willing to engage in those kinds of uncomfortable conversations. And another question that comes out of that. We are, we are headed towards a situation where it is likely, based on all of the over-under, um, that the Supreme Court will rule that universities cannot use race as a factor in admissions. That seems the most likely outcome from those cases. How will that be extended into other areas? And what will, that, uh, what will the implications of such a ruling be in other parts of our diversity, equity, and inclusion work? We also had a, you know, an interesting discussion about um, how vulnerabilities are exploited. Why do they hang around so long? And why is it that when you plug in a vulnerability from 2010, that it still comes up as having a 95% likelihood of being exploited over the next 30 days? Um, that's a really weird place to be when you actually think about it, especially given the fact that much of the news coverage is really about like, oh my God, this vulnerability came out yesterday and bad guys are already using it. Um, and that doesn't appear to be the reality of what's happening. We had a great fireside chat with um, Kimba Walden, uh, the Deputy National Cyber Director. And there the question is, when will the strategy actually come out? Um, you know, inquiring minds want to know. Um, but how do we actually really make diversity into our superpower, um, which she talked about? Um, on the SBOM panel itself, um, how do we actually ensure uh, that things like the bills of material are useful. Um, and if we actually had those useful bills of material, how would that actually change your behavior? Uh, we had a great presentation on the number of times that we've actually recommended uh, different things. Probably I'm waiting on Jay's uh, work to actually produce the number of recommendations that uh, have been made on cybersecurity, but I'm sure the number is a lot. Um, but why are there, the question that you should take from that discussion is why are there so many recommendations that are made over and over again and that have not actually been implemented? And what are the policy implications from that? Um, we had the incident reporting panel and it's what will the, and the, some of the implications there is what will the reporting show us? Um, and what are, what are some of the things that we can do uh, with that increased reporting? And of course, that always leads to one of my uh, rules that I learned when I was in the White House, which is the first report about a cyber incident is wrong. Um, it's just wrong. So you're, we're going to have to also live with and uh, uh, from this conflict and not the wrong ones. I think in my view, one of the key things that comes out of today's discussions though, is that we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Over and over again in the panels that, you, uh, that we had, the presentations that we had, where we have made progress, it is because we have just decided to start doing something and correct as we go along. Um, and if we try to actually produce the perfect policy, the perfect report, the perfect bill of material, the perfect this or anything else, um, it generally ends up not working um, and we get bogged down. Where we have made progress, and, and all of us want that revolutionary change to suddenly go from the cyber insecurity that we have to a state of being much more secure, but it's not going to work that way. 
It's going to be done much more incrementally um, over time. So with that, I want to actually thank all of you who uh, attended both uh, here in person and also online uh, today. It's been a great uh, turnout. I want to say thank you to our speakers and panelists and pr presenters. That's been great. Uh, thank you to the Cybersecurity Coalition for uh, sponsoring this, uh, this conference along with us. Um, and to uh, the Venable team, particularly Bree and Ivy and Tanive and the other folks who have worked so hard to uh, pull this all off. They it wouldn't have actually happened without them. And with that, I will ask for what are the what are the instruct what are our instructions, Bree, for the reception? The chicken be <laughs> All right. So the uh, there's a the uh, uh, thank you. Yes, that's yes. Thank you for the Red Hat folks for sponsoring it. And with that, we can close it out and enjoy the uh, reception.